Chapter 10, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Injuries to Real Property, and First, of Dispossession, or Ouster, of the Freehold. Part 2. 2. Thus far of remedies, where the tenant or occupier of the land hath gained only a mere possession, and no apparent shadow of right. Next follow another class, which are in use where the title of the tenant or occupier is advanced one step nearer to perfection, so that he hath in him not only a bare possession, which may be destroyed by entry, but also an apparent right of possession, which cannot be removed but by course of law, in the process of which must be shown that though he hath at present possession, and therefore hath the presumptive right, yet there is a right of possession superior to his residing in him who brings the action. These remedies are either by a writ of entry or a seize, which are actions merely possessory, serving only to regain that possession whereof the demandant, that is, he who sues for the land, or his ancestors have been unjustly deprived by the tenant or possessor of the freehold, or those under whom he claims. They meddle not with the right of property, only restoring the demandant to that state or situation in which he was, or by law ought to have been, before the dispossession committed but this without any prejudice to the right of ownership, for if the dispossessor has any legal claim, he may afterwards exert it, notwithstanding a recovery had against him in these possessory actions. Only the law will not suffer him to be his own judge, and either take or maintain possession of the lands until he hath recovered them by legal means, rather presuming the right to have accompanied the ancient season than to reside in one who had no such evidence in his favor. 1. The first of these possessory remedies is by writ of entry, which is that which disproves the title of the tenant or possessor by showing the unlawful means by which he entered or continues possession. The writ is directed to the sheriff, requiring him to command the tenant of the land that he render, in Latin, praesepi quod de redat, to the demandant the premises in question, which he claims to be his right and inheritance, and into which, as he saith, the said tenant hath not entry but by a deceason, intrusion, or the like, made to the said demandant within the time limited by law, or that upon refusal he do appear in court on such a day to show wherefore he hath not done it. This is the original process, the praesepi, upon which all the rest of the suit is grounded, and from hence it appears that what is required of the tenant is in the alternative, either deliver the season of the lands, or show cause why he will not, which cause may be either a denial of the fact of having entered by such means as are suggested, or a justification of his entry by reason of title in himself, or those under whom he makes claim, and hereupon the possession of the land is awarded to him who produces the clearest right to possess it. In our ancient books we find frequent mention of the degrees within which writs of entry are brought. If they be brought against the party himself who did the wrong, then they only charge the tenant himself with the injury. Non abuit ingressum nisi per intrusionem quam ipsi fecit. But if the intruder, the Caesar, or the like, has made any alienation of the land to a third person, or it has descended to his heir, that circumstance must be alleged in the writ, for the action must always be brought against the tenant of the land, and the defect of his possessory title whether arising from his own wrong or that of those under whom he claims, must be set forth. One such alienation or dissent makes the first degree, 
which is called the per, because then the form of a writ of entry is this, that the tenant had no right of entry, but by the original wrongdoer who alienated the land, or from whom it descended to him. Non abuit ingressum, nisi per Guillermum, qui se in illud intrusit, it illud tenente dismissit. A second alienation or descent makes another degree called the per and qui, because the form of a writ of entry in that case is that the tenant had no title to enter but by or under a prior alienee to whom the intruder demised it. Non abuit ingressum, nisi per ricardum, qui Guillermus elud demisit, qui se in elud intrusit. These degrees thus state the original wrong and the title of the tenant who claims under such wrong. If more than two degrees, that is, two alienations or descents were passed, there lay no writ of entry at the common law. For as it was provided for the quietness of men's inheritances, that no one, even though he had the true right of possession, should enter upon him who had the apparent right by descent or otherwise, but was driven to his writ of entry to gain possession. So, after more than two descents or two conveyances were passed, the demandant, even though he had the right both of possession and property, was not allowed this possessory action, but was driven to his writ of right, a long and final remedy, to punish his neglect in not sooner putting in his claim while the degree subsisted, and for the ending of suits and quieting of all controversies. But by the statute of Malbridge, 52 Henry III, C. 30, it was provided that when the number of alienations or descents exceeded the usual degrees, a new writ should be allowed without any mention of degrees at all. And accordingly, a new writ has been framed, called a writ of entry in the post, which only alleges the injury of the wrongdoer without deducing all the intermediate title from him to the tenant, stating it in this manner, that the tenant had no legal entry unless after or subsequent to the ouster or injury done by the original dispossessor. Non abuet ingressum nisi post intrusionem quam Guillermus in elud fecit, and rightly concluding that if the original title was wrongful, all claims derived from thence must participate of the same wrong. Upon the latter of these writs it is, the writ of entry sir the season in the post, that the form of our common recoveries of landed estates is usually grounded, which we may remember were observed in the preceding volume to be fictitious actions brought against the tenant of the freehold, usually called the tenant to the preesepi, or writ of entry, in which, by collusion, the demandant recovers the land. This remedial instrument of writ of entry is applicable to all the cases of ouster before mentioned, except that of discontinuance by tenant and tail and some particular species of deforcements, such as that of deforcement of dower by not assigning any dower to the widow within the time limited by law, for which she has her remedy by a writ of dower unde nihil abet. But if she be deforced of part only of her dower, she cannot then say that nihil abet, and therefore she may have recourse to another action by writ of right of dower, which is a more general remedy extending either to part or the whole, and is, with regard to her claim, of the same nature as the grand writ of right, whereof we shall presently speak with regard to claims in fee simple. But in general, the writ of entry is the universal remedy to recover possession when wrongfully withheld from the owner. It were therefore endless to recount all the several divisions of writs of entry which the different circumstances of the respective demandants may require and which are furnished by the laws of England, being plainly and clearly chalked out in that most ancient and highly venerable collection of legal forms the Registrum Omnium Brevium, 
or register of writs as are usable out of the king's courts, upon which Fitzherbert's natura brevium is a comment, in which every man who is injured will be sure to find the method of relief, exactly adapted to his own case, described in the compass of a few lines, and yet without the omission of any material circumstance so that the wise and equitable provision of the statute Westminster II, 13 Edward I, C. 24, for framing new writs when wanted, is almost rendered useless by the very great perfection of the ancient forms. And indeed, I know not whether it is a greater credit to our laws to have such a provision contained in them, or not to have occasion, or at the very least rarely, to use it. In the times of our Saxon ancestors, the right of possession seems only to have been recoverable by writ of entry, which was then usually brought in the county court. And it is to be observed that the proceedings in these actions were not then so tedious when the courts were held and process issued every three weeks as after the conquest when all causes were drawn into the king's courts and process issued from term to term which was found exceedingly dilatory being at least four times as slow as the other and hence a new remedy was invented in many cases to do justice to the people and determine the possession in the proper counties and yet by the king's judges this was the remedy by a seize of which we are next to speak two the writ of a seize is said to have been invented by glanville chief justice to henry the second and if so it seems to owe its introduction to the parliament held at northampton in the twenty-second year of that prince's reign when justices in ire were appointed to go round the kingdom in order to take these assizes and the assizes themselves particularly those of morte de enchester and novel de season were clearly pointed out and described as a writ of entry is a real action which disproves the title of the tenant by showing the unlawful commencement of his possession so an assize is a real action which proves the title of the demandant merely by showing his or his ancestor's possession and these two remedies are in all other respects so totally alike that a judgment or recovery in one is a bar against the other so that when a man's possession is once established by either of these possessory actions it can never be disturbed by the same antagonist in any other of them the word assize is derived by sir edward coke from the latin asideo to sit together and it signifies originally the jury who tried the cause and sit together for that purpose by a figure it is now made to signify the court or jurisdiction which summons this jury together by a commission of assizes or ad assizas capiendas and hence the judicial assemblies held by the king's commission in every county as well to take these writs of assize as to try causes at nisi prius are termed in common speech the assizes by another somewhat similar figure the name of assize is also applied to this action for recovering possession of lands for the reason saith littleton why such writs at the beginning were called assizes was for that in these writs the sheriff is ordered to summon a jury or a seize, which is not expressed in any other original writ. This remedy, by writ of a seize, is only applicable to two species of injury by ouster, viz. abatement and a recent or novel decision. If the abatement happened upon the death of the demandant's father or mother, brother or sister, uncle or aunt, nephew or niece the remedy is by an assize of morte de anchester or the death of one's ancestor and the general purport of this writ is to direct the sheriff to summon a jury or assize to view the land in question and to recognize whether such ancestor were seized thereof on the day of his death and whether the demandant be the next heir and in a short time after 
The judges usually come down by the king's commission to take the recognition of a seize, when, if these points are found in the affirmative, the law immediately transfers the possession from the tenant to the demandant. If the abatement happened on the death of one's grandfather or grandmother, then an assize of morte and chester no longer applies, but a writ of ale or de avo. If on the death of the great-grandfather or great-grandmother, then a writ of bisel or de pro avo. But if it mounts one degree higher to the tresel or grandfather's grandfather, or the abatement happened upon the death of any collateral relation other than those before mentioned, the writ is called a writ of cosinage or de consanguineo, and the same point shall be inquired in all of these actions ancestral, as in an assize of morte de ancestor, they being of the very same nature, though they differ in this point of form, that these ancestral writs, like all other writs of praesepi, expressly assert the demandant's title, viz., the season of the ancestor at his death and his own right of inheritance, the assize asserts nothing directly, but only prays an inquiry whether those points be so. There is also another ancestral writ, denominated a nuper obit, to establish an equal division of the land in question, where on the death of an ancestor who has several heirs, one enters and holds the others out of possession. But a man is not allowed to have any of these possessory actions for an abatement consequent on the death of any collateral relation beyond the fourth degree, though in lineal assent he may proceed ad infinitum. For the law will not pay any regard to the possession of a collateral relation so very distant as hardly to be any at all. It was always held to be law that where lands were divisible in a man's last will by the custom of the place, there an assize of morte de ancestor did not lie. For where lands were so divisible, the right of possession could never be determined by a process which inquired only to these two points, the season of the ancestor and the heirship of the demandant. And hence it might be reasonable to conclude that when the statute of wills, 32 Henry VIII C1, made all sockage lands divisible, an assize of morte and chester no longer could be brought of lands held in sockage, and that now, since the statute, 12 Charles II C24, which converts all tenures, a few only accepted, into free and common sockage, it should follow that no assize of morte and chester can be brought of any lands in the kingdom, but in case of abatements, recourse must be properly had to the more ancient writs of entry. An assize of novel or recent deceasing is an action of the same nature with the assize of morte and chester before mentioned, in that herein the demandant's possession must be shown but it differs considerably in other points, particularly in that it recites a complaint by the demandant of the decision committed in terms of direct averment, whereupon the sheriff is commanded to re-seize the land and all the chattels thereon and keep the same in his custody till the arrival of the justices of a seize, which since the introduction of giving damages as well as the possession is now omitted and in the meantime, to summon a jury to view the premises and make recognition of the assize before the justices. And, if upon the trial, the demandant can prove, first, a title, next, his actual season in consequence thereof, and lastly, his decision by the present tenant, he shall have judgment to recover his season and damages for the injury sustained. The process of assizes in general is called by statute Westminster II, 13 Edward I, C. 24, Vestinum Remedium, in comparison with that of a writ of entry, it not admitting many dilatory pleas and proceedings to which other real actions are subject. 
costs and damages were annexed to these possessory actions by the statute of Gloucester, 6, Edward I, C1, before which the tenant in possession was allowed to retain the intermediate profits of the land to enable him to perform the feudal burthens incident thereunto. And to prevent frequent and vexatious diseases, it is enacted by the statute of Merton, 20, Henry III, C3, that if a person deceased recover season of the land again by a seize of novel deceasing, and be again deceased of the same tenements by the same deceasor, he shall have a writ of re-deceasing, and if he recover therein, the re-deceasor shall be imprisoned, and by the statute of Marlbridge, 52, Henry III, C8, shall also pay a fine to the king, to which the statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C26, hath superadded double damages to the party aggrieved. In like manner, by the same statute of Merton, when any lands or tenements are recovered by a seize of morte ancestor, or other jury, or any judgment of the court, if the party be afterwards deceased by the same person against whom judgment was obtained, he shall have a writ of post decision against him, which subjects the post decisor to the same penalties as a re decisor. The reason of all of which, as given by Sir Edward Coke, is because such proceeding is a contempt of the king's courts and in despite of the laws, or, as Bracton more fully expresses it, talis qui ita convictas fuerit, duplicita delinquit contra regim quia facit disesinum et roberium contra pacem suam, et etiam ausu temerario erita facita ea, quae in curia domine regis rite acta sunt, et propter duplex delecta merito sustenere debet poenum duplicatum. In all these possessory actions, there is a time of limitation settled, beyond which, no man shall avail himself of the possession of himself or his ancestors, or take advantage of the wrongful possession of his adversary. For if he be negligent for a long and unreasonable time, the law refuses afterwards to lend him any assistance to recover the possession merely, both to punish his neglect, nam legis vigilantibus, non dormientibus, subveniunt, and also because it is presumed that the supposed wrongdoer has in such a length of time procured a legal title, otherwise he would sooner have been sued. This time of limitation by the Statute of Merton, 20 Henry III, C8, and Westminster I, 3 Edward I, C39, was successively dated from particular eras, viz., from the return of King John from Ireland, and from the coronation, etc., of King Henry the Third, But this state of limitation continued so long unaltered that it became indeed no limitation at all, it being above three hundred years from Henry the Third's coronation to the year 1540, when the present statute of limitations was made. This, instead of limiting actions from the date of a particular event, as before, which in process of years grew absurd, took another and more direct course, which might endure forever, by limiting a certain period, as fifty years for lands, and the like period for customary or prescriptive rents, suits, and services, for there is no time of limitation upon rents reserved by deed, and enacting that no person should bring any possessory action, to recover possession thereof merely upon the season or dispossession of his ancestors beyond such certain period. And all writs grounded upon the possession of the demandant himself are directed to be sued out within thirty years after the decision complained of. For if it be an older date, it can with no propriety be called a fresh, recent, or novel decision which name Sir Edward Coke informs us was originally given to this proceeding because the decision must have been since the last ire or circuit of the justices which happened once in seven years, otherwise the action was gone.
and we may observe that the limitation prescribed by Henry II at the first institution of the assize of novel decision was from his own return into England after the peace made between him and the young king his son, which was but a year before. What has been here observed may throw some light on the doctrine of remitter, which we spoke of in the second chapter of this book, and which we may remember was, where one hath a right to lands, but is out of possession, hath afterwards the freehold cast upon him by some subsequent defective title, and enters by virtue of that title. In this case the law remits him to his ancient and more certain right, and by an equitable fiction supposes him to have gained possession in consequence, and by virtue thereof, and this, because he cannot possibly obtain judgment at law, to be restored to his prior right, since he is himself the tenant of the land, and therefore hath nobody against whom to bring his action. This determination of the law might seem superfluous to any hasty observer, who perhaps would imagine that since the tenant hath now both the right and also the possession, it little signifies by what means such possession shall be said to be gained. But the wisdom of our ancient law determined nothing in vain. As the tenant's possession was gained by a defective title, it was liable to be overturned by showing the defect in a writ of entry, and then he must have been driven to his writ of right, to recover his just inheritance, which would have been doubly hard, because during the time he was himself tenant, he could not establish his prior title by any possessory action. The law, therefore, remits him to his prior title, or puts him in the same condition as if he had recovered the land by writ of entry. Without the remitter, he would have had jus et saisinum separate, a good right, but a bad possession. Now, by the remitter, he hath the most perfect of all titles, juris et saisine conjectionem. End of chapter 10, part 2. Chapter 10, Part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Injuries to Real Property, and First of Dispossession or Ouster, of the freehold. Part 3. 3. By these several possessory remedies, the right of possession may be restored to him that is unjustly deprived thereof. But the right of possession, though it carries with it a strong presumption, is not always conclusive evidence of the right of property, which may still subsist in another man. For as one man may have the possession, and another the right of possession, which is recovered by these possessory actions, so one man may have the right of possession, and cannot therefore be evicted by any possessory action, and another may have the right of property, which cannot be otherwise asserted than by the great and final remedy of a writ of right, or such correspondent writs as are in the nature of a writ of right. This happens principally in four cases. 1. Upon discontinuance by the alienation of tenant and tail, whereby he, who had the right of possession, hath transferred it to the alienee, and therefore his issue, or those in remainder or reversion, shall not be allowed to recover by virtue of that possession which the tenant hath so voluntarily transferred. 2. In case of judgment given against either party by his own default, or, 3. Upon trial of the merits, in any possessory action, for such judgment, if obtained by him who hath not the true ownership, is held to be a species of deforcement, which, however, binds the right of possession, and suffers it not to be ever again disputed, unless the right of property be also proved. 4. In case the demandant, who claims the right, 
is barred from these possessory actions by length of time and the statute of limitations before mentioned, for an undisturbed possession for fifty years ought not to be divested by anything but a very clear proof of the absolute right of propriety. In these four cases, the law applies the remedial instrument of either the writ of right itself or such other writs as are said to be of the same nature. 1. And first, upon an alienation by tenant and tail, whereby the estate tail is discontinued and the remainder or reversion is by failure of the particular estate displaced and turned into a mere right, the remedy is by action of formidon, secundum formam doni, which is in the nature of a writ of right and is the highest action that tenant and tail can have. For he cannot have an absolute writ of right, which is confined only to such as claims in fee simple, and for that reason this writ of formidon was granted him by the statute de donis, or Westminster II, 13 Edward I, C1, which is therefore emphatically called his writ of right. This writ is distinguished into three species, a formidon in the defender, in the remainder, and in the reverter. A writ of formidon in the defender lieth where a gift in tail is made, and the tenant in tail aliens the land entailed, or is deceased of them, and dies. In this case, the heir in tail shall have this writ of formidon in the defender to recover these lands so given in tail against him who is then the actual tenant of the freehold. In which action, the demandant is bound to state the manner and form of the gift in tail and to prove himself heir secundum formam doni. A formidon in the remainder lieth where a man giveth lands to another for life or in tail, with remainder to a third person in tail or in fee. And he who hath the particular estate dieth, without issue inheritable, and a stranger intrudes upon him in remainder, and keeps him out of the possession. In this case the remainder man shall have his writ of formidon in the remainder, wherein the whole form of the gift is stated, and the happening of the event upon which the remainder depended. This writ is not given in express words by the statute de donis, but is founded upon the equity of the statute and upon this maxim in law, that if any one hath a right to the land, he ought also to have an action to recover it. A formidon in the reverter lieth, where there is a gift in tail, and afterwards, by the death of the donee, or his heirs without issue of his body, the reversion falls upon the donor, his heirs, or assigns. In such case, the reversioner shall have this writ to recover the lands wherein he shall suggest the gift, his own title to the reversion minutely derived from the donor, and the failure of issue upon which his reversion takes place. This lay at common law before the statute de donis. If the donee aliened before he had performed the condition of the gift by having issue and afterwards died without any. The time of limitation in a formidon by statute 21 James I C16 is 20 years. Within which space of time after his title accrues the demandant must bring his action or else is forever barred. 2. In the second case, if the owners of a particular estate, as for life, in dower, by the courtesy, or in fee tail, are barred of the right of possession by a recovery had against them through their default or non-appearance in a possessory action, they were absolutely without any remedy at the common law as a writ of right does not lie for any but such as claim to be tenants of the fee simple. Therefore, the statute Westminster II, 13 Edward I, C4, gives a new writ for such persons after their lands have been so recovered against them by default, called a quod ea de fortiat, which, though not strictly a writ of right, 
so far partakes of the nature of one as that it will restore the right to him who has been thus unwarily deforced by his own default. But in case the recovery were not had by his own default, but upon defense in the inferior possessory action, this still remains final with regard to these particular estates as at the common law, and hence it is that a common recovery on a writ of entry in the post had, not by default of the tenant himself, but, after his defense made and voucher of a third person to warranty, by default of such vouchee, is now the usual bar to cut off an estate tail. 3. 4. Thirdly, in case the right of possession be barred by a recovery upon the merits in a possessory action, or, lastly, by the statute of limitations, a claimant in fee simple may have a mere writ of right, which is in its nature the highest writ in the law, and lieth only of an estate in fee simple, and not for him who hath a less estate. This writ lies concurrently with all other real actions in which an estate of fee simple may be recovered, and it also lies after them, being as it were, an appeal to the mere right, when judgment hath been had as to the possession in an inferior possessory action. But though a writ of right may be brought, where the demandant is entitled to the possession, yet it rarely is advisable to be brought in such cases as a more expeditious and easy remedy is had without meddling with the property by proving the demandant's own or his ancestor's possession and their legal ouster in one of the possessory actions. But in case the right of possession be lost by length of time or by judgment against the true owner in one of these inferior suits, there is no other choice. This is then the only remedy that can be had and it is of so forcible a nature that it overcomes all obstacles and clears all objections that may have arisen to cloud and obscure the title. And after issue once joined in a writ of right, the judgment is absolutely final, so that a recovery had in this action may be pleaded in bar of any other claim or demand. The pure, proper, or mere writ of right lies only we have said, to recover lands in fee simple, unjustly withheld from the true proprietor. But there are also some other writs which are said to be in the nature of a writ of right, because their process and proceedings do mostly, though not entirely, agree with the writ of right. But in some of them the fee simple is not demanded, and in others not land, but some incorporeal hereditament. Some of these have already been mentioned as the writ of right of dower, of formidon, etc., and the others will hereafter be taken notice of under their proper divisions. Nor is the mere writ of right alone, or always, applicable to every case of a claim of lands in fee simple. For if the Lord's tenant in fee simple dies without heir, whereby an eschet accrues, the Lord shall have a writ of eschet which is in the nature of a writ of right. And if one of two or more co-parsoners deforces the other by usurping the sole possession, the party aggrieved shall have a writ of right de rationable parte, which may be grounded on the season of the ancestor at any time during his life, whereas in a nuper obit, which is a possessory remedy, he must be seized at the time of his death. But waiving these and other minute distinctions, let us now return to the general writ of right. This writ ought to be first brought in the court baron of the lord of whom the lands are holden, and then it is open or patent. But if he holds no court, or hath waived his right, remisit curium suum, it may be brought in the king's court by a writ of praechipi originally, and then it is a writ of right close, being directed to the sheriff and not the lord. Also, when one of the king's immediate tenants in capite is deforced, his writ of right is called a writ of praechipi in capite, 
the improper use of which, as well as of the former preecipi quid dominus remisit curium, so as to oust the Lord of his jurisdiction, is restrained by Magna Carta, and being directed to the sheriff and originally returnable in the king's court, is also a writ of right close. There is likewise a little writ of right close, secundum consuetudinum manari, which lies for the king's tenants in ancient demean, and others of a similar nature, to try the right of their lands and tenements in the court of the lord exclusively. But the writ of right patent itself may also at any time be removed into the county court by writ of tolt, and from thence into the king's courts by writ of pone, or recordari facius, at the suggestion of either party that there is a delay or defect of justice. In the progress of this action, the demandant must allege some season of the lands and tenements in himself, or else in some other person under whom he claims, and then derive the right from the person so seized to himself, to which the tenant may answer by denying the demandant's right, and averring that he has more right to hold the lands than the demandant has to demand them, which puts the demandant upon the proof of his title, in which, if he fails, or if the tenant can show a better, the demandant and his heirs are perpetually barred of their claim. But if he can make it appear that his right is superior to the tenant's, he shall recover the land against the tenant and his heirs for ever. But even this writ of right, however superior to any other, cannot be sued out at any distance of time. For by the ancient law, no season could be alleged by the demandant, but from the time of Henry I, by the statute of Merton, 20 Henry III, C8, from the time of Henry II, by the statute of Westminster, 1, 3 Edward I, C39, from the time of Richard I, and now, by statute 32, Henry VIII, C2, season in a writ of right shall be within sixty years, so that the possession of lands in fee simple uninterruptedly for threescore years is at present a sufficient title against all the world, and cannot be impeached by any dormant claim whatsoever. I have now gone through the several species of injury by ouster or dispossession of the freehold with the remedies applicable to each, in considering which I have been unavoidably led to touch upon much obsolete and abstruse learning as it lies intermixed with and alone can explain the reason of those parts of the law which are now more generally in use. For without contemplating the whole fabric together, it is impossible to form any clear idea of the meaning and connection of those disjointed parts which still form a considerable branch of the modern law, such as the doctrine of entries and remitter, the levying of fines, and the suffering of common recoveries. Neither indeed is any considerable part of that which I have selected in this chapter from among the venerable monuments of our ancestors, so absolutely antiquated as to be out of force, though they are certainly out of use. There being, it must be owned, but a very few instances for more than a century past of prosecuting any real action for land by writ of entry, assize, formidin, writ of right, or otherwise. The forms are indeed preserved in the practice of common recoveries, but they are forms and nothing else, for which the very clerks that pass them are seldom capable to assign the reason. But the title of lands is now usually tried upon actions of ejectment or trespass. End of chapter 10, part 3. Chapter 11 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by 
Roy Haynes, of Dispossession or Ouster of Chattel's Reel. Having in the preceding chapter considered with some attention the several species of injury by dispossession or ouster of the freehold, together with the regular and well-connected scheme of remedies by actions real, which are given to the subject by common law, either to recover the possession only, or else to recover at once the possession and also to establish the right of property, the method which I there marked out leads me next to consider injuries by ouster or dispossession of chattels real, that is to say, by a moving the possession of the tenant either from an estate by statute merchant, statute staple, or elegit from an estate for years. 1. Ouster or a motion of possession from estates held by either statute or elegit is only liable to happen by a species of decision or turning out of the legal proprietor before his estate is determined by raising the sum for which it is given him in pledge. And for such ouster, though the estate be merely a chattel interest, the owner shall have the same remedy as for an injury to a freehold, viz. by a seize of novel decision. But this depends upon the several statutes which create these respective interests and which expressly provide and allow this remedy in case of dispossession. Upon which account it is that Sir Edward Coke observes that these tenants are said to hold their estates ut liberum tenementum until their debts be paid, because by the statutes they shall have an assize as tenant of the freehold shall have and in that respect they have the similitude of a freehold. 2. As for ouster or a motion of possession from an estate for years, this happens only by a like kind of decision, ejection, or turning out of the tenant from the occupation of the land during the continuance of his term. For this injury, the law has provided him with two remedies, according to the circumstances and situation of the wrongdoer. The writ of ejectione firme, which lies against any one, the lessor, reversioner, remainder man, or any stranger, who is himself the wrongdoer and has committed the injury complained of, and the writ of quare ejectit infra terminum, which lies not against the wrongdoer or ejector himself, but his fee fee or other person claiming under him. These are mixed actions, somewhat between real and personal, for therein are two things recovered, as well restitution of the term of years as damages for the ouster or wrong. 1. A writ, then, of ejectione ferme, or action of trespass in ejectment, lieth where lands or tenements are let for a term of years, and afterwards the lessor, reversioner, remainder man, or any stranger, doth inject or oust the lessee of his term. In this case he shall have this writ of ejection, to call the defendant to answer for entering on the land so demised to the plaintiff for a term that is not yet expired, and ejecting him. And by this writ the plaintiff shall recover back his term, or the remainder of it, with damages. Since the disuse of real actions, this mixed proceeding is become the common method of trying the title to lands and tenements. It may not, therefore, be improper to delineate, with some degree of minuteness, its history, the manner of its process, and the principles whereon it is grounded. We have before seen that the writ of covenant, for breach of the contract contained in the lease for years, was anciently the only specific remedy for recovering against the lessor a term from which he had ejected his lessee together with damages for the ouster. But if the lessee was ejected by a stranger, claiming under a title superior to that of the lessor, or by a grantee of the reversion, who might at any time by a common recovery have destroyed the term, though the lessee might still maintain an action of covenant against the lessor for non-performance of his contract or lease, yet he could not by any means recover the term itself. 
if the ouster was committed by a mere stranger without any title to the land, the lessor might indeed by a real action recover possession of the freehold, but the lessee had no other remedy against the ejector but in damages by a writ of ejectione firme for the trespass committed in ejecting him from his farm. But afterwards, when the courts of equity began to oblige the ejector to make a specific restitution of the land to the party immediately injured, the courts of law also adopted the same method of doing complete justice, and, in the prosecution of a writ of ejectment, introduced a species of remedy not warranted by the original writ, nor prayed by the declaration, which go only for damages merely, and are silent as to any restitution, viz. a judgment to recover the term and a writ of possession thereupon. This method seems to have been settled as early as the reign of Edward the Fourth, though it hath been said to have first begun under Henry the Seventh, because it probably was then first applied to its present principal use, that of trying the title to the land. The better to apprehend the contrivance whereby this end is effected, we must recollect that the remedy by ejectment is in its original an action brought by one who hath a lease for years to repair the injury done him by dispossession. In order, therefore, to convert it into a method of trying titles to the freehold, it is first necessary that the claimant do take possession of the lands to empower him to constitute a lessee for years that may be capable of receiving this injury of dispossession. For it would be an offense, called in our law maintenance, of which, in the next book, to convey a title to another when the grantor is not in possession of the land and indeed it was doubted at first whether this occasional possession, taken merely for the purpose of conveying the title, excused the lessor from the legal guilt of maintenance. When therefore a person, who hath right of entry into lands, determines to acquire that possession, which is wrongfully withheld by the present tenant, he makes, as by law he may, a formal entry on the premises, and being so in possession of the soil, he there, upon the land, seals and delivers a lease for years to some third person or lessee, and having thus given him entry, leaves him in possession of the premises. This lessee is to stay upon the land till the prior tenant, or he who had the previous possession, enters thereon afresh and ousts him, or till some other person, either by accident or by agreement beforehand, comes upon the land and turns him out or ejects him. For this injury, the lessee is entitled to his action of ejectment against the tenant or this casual ejector, whichever it was that ousted him, to recover back his term and damages. But where this action is brought against such a casual ejector, as is before mentioned, and not against the very tenant in possession, the court will not suffer the tenant to lose his possession without any opportunity to defend it. Wherefore, it is a standing rule that no plaintiff shall proceed in ejectment to recover lands against a casual ejector without notice given to the tenant in possession, if any there be, and making him a defendant if he pleases. And in order to maintain the action, the plaintiff must, in case of any defense, make out four points before the court, viz. title, lease, entry, and ouster. First he must show a good title in his lessor, which brings the matter of right entirely before the court. Then, that the lessor, being seized by virtue of such title, did make him the lease for the present term. Thirdly, that he, the lessee or plaintiff did enter or take possession in consequence of such lease. And then, lastly, that the defendant ousted or ejected him, whereupon he shall have judgment to recover his term and damages, and shall, in consequence, have a writ of possession, which the sheriff is to execute by delivering him the undisturbed and peaceable possession of his term. 
This is the regular method of bringing an action of ejectment in which the title of the lessor comes collaterally and incidentally before the court in order to show the injury done to the lessee by this ouster. This method must be still continued in due form and strictness, save only as to the notice to the tenant whenever the possession is vacant or there is no actual occupant of the premises, and also in some other cases. But, as much trouble and formality were found to attend the actual making of the lease, entry, and ouster, a new and more easy method of trying titles by writ of ejectment, where there is any actual tenant or occupier of the premises in dispute, was invented somewhat more than a century ago by the Lord Chief Justice Roll, who then sat in the Court of Upper Bench, so called during the exile of King Charles II. This new method entirely depends upon a string of legal fictions. No actual lease is made, no actual entry by the plaintiff, no actual ouster by the defendant, but all are merely ideal for the sole purpose of trying the title. To this end, in the proceedings, a lease for term of years is stated to have been made by him who claims the title to the plaintiff who brings the action, as by John Rogers to Richard Smith, which plaintiff ought to be some real person, and not merely an ideal fictitious one who has no existence, as is frequently, though unwarrantably, practiced. It is also stated that Smith, the lessee, entered, and that the defendant, William Stiles, who is called the casual ejector, ousted him, for which ouster he brings this action. As soon as this action is brought, and the complaint fully stated in the declaration, Stiles, the casual objector or defendant, sends a written notice to the tenant in possession of the lands as George Saunders, informing him of the action brought by Richard Smith and transmitting him a copy of the declaration, with all assuring him that he, Stiles the defendant, has no title at all to the premises and shall make no defense, and therefore advising the tenant to appear in court to defend his own title. Otherwise, the casual ejector will suffer judgment to be had against him, and thereby he, the actual tenant, Saunders, will inevitably be turned out of possession. On receipt of this friendly caution, if the tenant in possession does not within a limited time apply to the court to be admitted a defendant in the stead of styles, he is supposed to have no right at all, and, upon judgment being had against styles, the casual objector, Saunders, the real tenant, will be turned out of possession by the sheriff. But if the tenant in possession applies to be made a defendant, it is allowed upon him this condition that he enter into a rule of court to confess, at the trial of the cause, three of the four requisites for the maintenance of the plaintiff's action, viz. the lease of Rogers, the lessor, the entry of Smith, the plaintiff, and his ouster by Saunders himself, now made the defendant instead of Styles, which requisites, as they are wholly fictitious, should the defendant put the plaintiff to prove, he must, of course, be non-suited for want of evidence. But by such stipulated confession of lease, entry, and ouster, the trial will now stand upon the merits of the title only. This done, the declaration is altered by inserting the name of George Saunders instead of William Stiles, and the cause goes down to trial under the name of Smith, the plaintiff, on the demise of Rogers, the lessor, against Saunders, the new defendant. And therein the lessor of the plaintiff is bound to make out a clear title, otherwise his fictitious lessee cannot obtain judgment to have possession of the land for the term supposed to be granted. But if the lessor makes out his title in a satisfactory manner, then judgment and a writ of possession shall go for Richard Smith, the nominal plaintiff, who, by this trial, has proved the right of John Rogers, his supposed lessor. Yet, to prevent fraudulent recoveries of the possession, by collusion with the tenant of the land, all tenants are obliged by statute 11, George II, 
C-19 on paying a forfeiting three years rent to give notice to their landlords when served with any declaration in ejectment, and any landlord may, by leave of the court, be made a co-defendant to the action, which indeed he had a right to demand long before the provision of this statute, in a like manner as, previous to the statute of Westminster 2 C3, if in a real action the tenant of the freehold made default, the remainder man or reversioner had a right to come in and defend the possession, lest, if judgment were had against the tenant, the estate of those behind should be turned to a naked right. But if the new defendant fails to appear at the trial, and to confess, lease, entry, and ouster, the plaintiff Smith must indeed be there non-suited, for want of proving those requisites. But judgment will, in the end, be entered against the casual ejector styles, for the condition on which Saunders was admitted a defendant is broken, and therefore the plaintiff is put again in the same situation as if he never had appeared at all, the consequence of which, we have seen, would have been that judgment would have been entered for the plaintiff, and the sheriff, by virtue of a writ for that purpose, would have turned out Saunders and delivered possession to Smith. The same process, therefore, as would have been had, provided no conditional rule had ever been made, must now be pursued as soon as the condition is broken. But execution shall be stayed if any landlord, after the default of his tenant, applies to be made a defendant and enters into the usual rule to confess, lease, entry, and ouster. The damages recovered in these actions, though formally their only intent, are now usually, since the title has been considered as the principal question, very small and inadequate amounting commonly to one shilling or some other trivial sum. In order, therefore, to complete the remedy, when the possession has been long detained from him that has right, an action of trespass also lies, after a recovery in ejectment, to recover the mean profits which the tenant in possession has wrongfully received, which action may be brought in the name of either the nominal plaintiff in the ejectment or his lessor against the tenant in possession, whether he be made party to the ejectment or suffers judgment to go by default. Such is the modern way of obliquely bringing in question the title to lands and tenements in order to try it in this collateral manner, a method which is now universally adopted in almost every case. It is founded on the same principle as the ancient writs of assize, being calculated to try the mere possessory title to an estate, and hath succeeded to those real actions as being infinitely more convenient for attaining the end of justice, because the form of the proceeding, being entirely fictitious, is wholly in the power of the court to direct the application of that fiction so as to prevent fraud and chicane and eviscerate the very truth of the title. The writ of ejectment and its nominal parties, as was resolved by all the judges, are judicially to be considered as the fictitious form of an action, really brought by the lessor of the plaintiff against the tenant in possession, invented under the control and power of the court, for the advancement of justice in many respects, and to force the parties to go to trial on the merits without being entangled in the nicety of pleadings on either side. But a writ of ejectment is not an adequate means to try the title of all estates, for on such things whereon an entry cannot in fact be made, no entry shall be supposed by any fiction of the parties. Therefore, an ejectment will not lie of an advowson, a rent, a common, or other incorporeal hereditament, except for tithes in the hands of lay appropriators by the express purview of Statute 32 Henry VIII C7, which doctrine hath since been extended by analogy to tithes in the hands of the clergy. 
nor will it lie in such cases where the entry of him that hath right is taken away by dissent, discontinuance, twenty years' dispossession, or otherwise. This action of ejectment is, however, rendered a very easy and expeditious remedy to landlords whose tenants are in arrear, by Statute 4, George II, C. 28, which enacts that every landlord who hath by his lease a right of re-entry in case of non-payment of rent, when half a year's rent is due, and no sufficient distress is to be had, may serve a declaration in ejectment on his tenant, or fix the same upon some notorious part of the premises, which shall be valid without any formal re-entry or previous demand of rent. And a recovery in such ejectment shall be final and conclusive, both in law and equity, unless the rent and all costs be paid or tendered within six calendar months afterwards. 2. The writ of quare egesit infra terminem lieth by the ancient law, where the wrongdoer or ejector is not himself in possession of the lands, but another who claims under him as where a man leaseth lands to another for years, and after, the lessor or reversioner entereth and maketh a fiefment in fee, or for life, of the same lands to a stranger. Now the lessee cannot bring a writ of ejectione ferme, or ejectment against the fee-fee, because he did not eject him, but the reversioner. Neither can he have any such action to recover his term against the reversioner who did oust him because he is not now in possession. And upon that account this writ was devised, upon the equity of the statute Westminster 2 c. 24, as in a case where no adequate remedy was already provided. And the action is brought against the fee fee for deforcing or keeping out the original lessee during the continuance of his term, and herein, as in the ejectment, the plaintiff shall recover so much of the term as remains, and also damages for that portion of it whereof he has been unjustly deprived. But since the introduction of fictitious ousters, whereby the title may be tried against any tenant in possession, by what means soever he acquired it, this action has fallen into disuse. End of chapter 11Dot org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Trespass. In the two preceding chapters, we have considered such injuries to real property as consisted in an ouster or a motion of the possession. Those which remain to be discussed are such as may be offered to a man's real property without any emotion from it. The second species, therefore, of real injuries or wrongs that affect a man's lands, tenements, or hereditaments is by trespass. Trespass, in its largest and most extensive sense, signifies any transgression or offense against the law of nature, of society, or of the country in which we live, whether it relates to a man's person or his property. Therefore, Beating another is trespass, for which, as we have formerly seen, an action of trespass v et armis in assault and battery will lie. Taking or detaining a man's goods are respectively trespasses, for which an action of trespass v et armis or on the case in trover and conversion is given by the law. So also, Non-performance of promises or undertakings is a trespass upon which an action of trespass on the case in a sumset is grounded, and in general, 
any misfeasance or act of one man whereby another is injuriously treated or damnified is a transgression or trespass in its largest sense, for which we have already seen that whenever the act itself is directly and immediately injurious to the person or property of another, and therefore necessarily accompanied with some force, an action of trespass v et armis will lie. But if the injury is only consequential, a special action of trespass on the case may be brought. But in the limited and confined sense in which we are at present to consider it, it signifies no more than an entry on another man's ground without a lawful authority and doing some damage, however inconsiderable, to his real property. For the right of meum and tuum, or property, in lands being once established, it follows as a necessary consequence that this right must be exclusive. That is, that the owner may retain to himself the sole use and occupation of his soil. Every entry, therefore, thereon, without the owner's leave, and especially if contrary to his express order, is a trespass or transgression. The Roman laws seem to have made a direct prohibition necessary in order to constitute this injury. Qui alienum fundum ingriditor, potesta domino, si is previderit, prohiberi ne ingrediator. But the law of England, justly considering that much inconvenience may happen to the owner before he has an opportunity to forbid the entry, has carried the point much farther and has treated every entry upon another's lands, unless by the owner's leave or in some very particular cases, as an injury or wrong, for the satisfaction of which an action of trespass will lie, but determines the quantum of that satisfaction by considering how far the offense was willful or inadvertent and by estimating the value of the actual damage sustained. Every unwarrantable entry on another's soil, the law entitles a trespass by breaking his close. The words of the writ of trespass commanding the defendant to show cause quare clausum quarentis fregit. For every man's land is in the eye of the law, enclosed and set apart from his neighbors, and that either by a visible and material fence, as one field is divided from another by a hedge, or by an ideal invisible boundary existing only in the contemplation of law, as when one man's land adjoins to another's in the same field. And every such entry or breach of a man's close carries necessarily along with it some damage or other. For if no other special loss can be assigned, yet still the words of the writ itself specify one general damage, viz., the treading down and bruising his herbage. One must have a property, either absolute or temporary, in the soil and actual possession by entry to be able to maintain an action of trespass, or at least it is requisite that the party have a lease and possession of the vesture and herbage of the land. Thus, if a meadow be divided annually among the parishioners by lot, then, after each person's several portion is allotted, they may be respectively capable of maintaining an action for the breach of their several closes, for they have an exclusive interest and freehold therein for the time. But before entry and actual possession, one cannot maintain an action of trespass, though he hath the freehold in law. And therefore, an heir before entry cannot have this action against an abator, though a deceasee might have it against a deceasor, for the injury done by the deceasing itself, at which time the plaintiff was seized of the land. But he cannot have it for any act done after the deceasing until he hath gained possession by re-entry, and then he may well maintain it for the intermediate damage done. For after his re-entry, the law, by a kind of jus post limini, supposes the freehold to have all along continued in him. Neither by the common law 
in case of an intrusion or deforcement, could the party kept out of possession sue the wrongdoer by a mode of redress which was calculated merely for injuries committed against the land while in the possession of the owner. But by the statute 6 and C-18, if a guardian or trustee for any infant, a husband seized jure uxoris, or a person having any estate or interest determinable upon a life or lives, shall, after the determination of their respective interests, hold over and continue in possession of the lands or tenements, they are now adjudged to be trespassers, and the reversioner or remainder man may once in every year, by motion to the court of chancery, procure the chestway cavie to be produced by the tenant of the land, or may enter thereon in case of his refusal or willful neglect. And by the statutes of 4 George the second C twenty eight and eleven George the second C nineteen, in case after the determination of any term of life, lives, or years, any person shall willfully hold over the same, the lessor is entitled to recover by action of debt either a rent of double the annual value of the premises, in case he himself hath demanded and given notice in writing to deliver the possession or else double the usual rent in case the notice of quitting proceeds from any tenant having power to determine his lease and he afterwards neglects to carry it into due execution. A man is answerable for not only his own trespass, but that of his cattle also. For if, by his negligent keeping, they stray upon the land of another, and much more if he permits or drives them on, and they there tread down his neighbor's herbage and spoil his corn or trees. This is a trespass for which the owner must answer in damages. And the law gives the party injured a double remedy in this case, by permitting him to distrain the cattle thus damage feasant or doing damage, till the owner shall make him satisfaction, or else by leaving him to the common remedy in foro contencioso by action and the action that lies in either of these cases of trespass committed upon another's land either by a man himself or his cattle is the action of trespass v et armis whereby a man is called upon to answer quare v et armis clausum ipsus a apud bifregit et blada ipsus a ad valentum centum solidorum ebitem nuper crescentia cum quibustam averis de pasto sut, cunculavit et consumsit, etc. For the law always couples the idea of force with that of intrusion upon the property of another. And herein, if any unwarrantable act of the defendant or his beasts in coming upon the land be proved, it is an act of trespass for which the plaintiff must recover some damages, such, however, as the jury shall think proper to assess. In trespasses of a permanent nature, where the injury is continually renewed, as by spoiling or consuming the herbage with the defendant's cattle, the declaration may allege the injury to have been committed by continuation from one given day to another, which is called laying the action with a continuando, and the plaintiff shall not be compelled to bring separate actions for every day's separate offense. But where the trespass is by one or several acts, each of which terminates in itself, and being once done cannot be done again, it cannot be laid with a continuando. Yet, if there be repeated acts of trespass committed, as cutting down a certain number of trees, they may be said to be done not continually, but at diverse days and times within a given period. In some cases, trespass is justifiable, or rather, entry on another's land or house shall not in those cases be accounted trespass, as if a man comes there to demand or pay money, they are payable or to execute in a legal manner the process of the law. Also, a man may justify entering into an inn or public house without the leave of the owner first specially asked, 
because when a man professes the keeping of such inn or public house, he thereby gives a general license to any person to enter his doors. So a landlord may justify entering to distrain for rent, a commoner to attend his cattle commoning on another's land, and a reversioner to see if any waste be committed on the estate for the apparent necessity of the thing. Also, it hath been said that by the common law and custom of England, the poor are allowed to enter and glean upon another's ground after the harvest without being guilty of trespass, which humane provision seems borrowed from the Mosaical law. In like manner, the common law warrants the hunting of ravenous beasts of prey, as badgers and foxes in another man's land, because the destroying such creatures is profitable to the public. But in cases where a man misdemeans himself, or makes ill use of the authority with which the law entrusts him, he shall be accounted a trespasser ab initio, as if one comes into a tavern and will not go out in a reasonable time, but tarries there all night contrary to the inclinations of the owner. This wrongful act shall affect and have relation back even to his first entry, and make the whole a trespass. But a bare non-feasance, as not paying for the wine he calls for, will not make him a trespasser, for this is only a breach of contract for which the taverner shall have an action of debt or a sumsit against him. So if a landlord distrained for rent and willfully killed the distress, this by the common law made him a trespasser ab initio, and so indeed would any other irregularity have done till the statute 11 George II C. 19, which enacts that no subsequent irregularity of the landlord shall make his first entry a trespass, but the party injured shall have a special action on the case for the real specific injury sustained, unless tender of amends hath been made. But still, if a reversioner, who enters on pretense of seeing waste, breaks the house, or stays there all night, or if the commoner who comes to tend his cattle cuts down a tree, in these and similar cases the law judges that he entered for this unlawful purpose, and therefore, as the act which demonstrates such his purpose is a trespass, he shall be esteemed a trespasser ab initio. So also, in the case of hunting the fox or the badger, a man cannot justify breaking the soil and digging him out of his earth. For though the law warrants the hunting of such noxious animals for the public good, yet it is held that such things must be done in an ordinary and usual manner, therefore, that being an ordinary course to kill them, viz., by hunting, the court held that the digging for them was unlawful. A man may also justify an action of trespass on account of the freehold and right of entry being in himself, and this defense brings the title of the estate into question. This is therefore one of the ways devised since the disuse of real actions to try the property of estates, though it is not so usual as that by ejectment, because that, being now a mixed action, not only gives damages for the ejection, but also possession of the land, whereas in trespass, which is merely a personal suit, the right can only be ascertained, but no possession delivered, nothing being recovered but damages for the wrong committed. In order to prevent trifling and vexatious actions of trespass, as well as other personal actions, it is, inter alia, enacted by statutes 43 Elizabeth C. 6 and 22 and 23 Charles II C. 9 S. 136, that where the jury who try an action of trespass give less damages than 40 shillings, the plaintiff shall be allowed no more costs than damages, unless the judge shall certify under his hand that the freehold or title of the land came chiefly into question. But this rule now admits of two exceptions more, which have been made by subsequent statutes. One is by statute 8 and 9 William III C. 11, 
which enacts that in all actions of trespass, wherein it shall appear that the trespass was willful and malicious, and it be so certified by the judge, the plaintiff shall recover full costs. Every trespass is willful, where the defendant has notice and is especially forewarned not to come on the land. As every trespass is malicious, though the damage may not amount to forty shillings, where the intent of the defendant plainly appears to be to harass and distress the plaintiff. The other exception is by Statute 4 and 5, William and Mary, C. 23, which gives full costs against any inferior tradesman, apprentice, or other dissolute person who is convicted of a trespass in hawking, hunting, fishing, or fowling upon another's land. Upon this statute it has been adjudged that if a person be an inferior tradesman, as a clothier, for instance, it matters not what qualification he may have in point of estate. But if he be guilty of such trespass, he shall be liable to pay full costs. End of chapter 12「a third species of real injuries to a man's lands and tenements is by nuisance. Nuisance, nocumentum, or annoyance, signifies anything that worketh hurt, inconvenience, or damage. And nuisances are of two kinds. Public or common nuisances, which affect the public, are an annoyance to all the king's subjects, for which reason we must refer them to the class of public wrongs or crimes and misdemeanors and private nuisances, which are the objects of our present consideration, and may be defined anything done to the hurt or annoyance of the lands, tenements, or hereditaments of another. We will therefore first mark out the several kinds of nuisances, and then their respective remedies. 1. In discussing the several kinds of nuisances, we will consider first such nuisances as may affect a man's corporeal hereditaments, and then those that may damage such as are incorporeal. 1. First, as to corporeal inheritances. If a man builds a house so close to mine that his roof overhangs my roof, and throws water off his roof upon mine, this is a nuisance for which an action will lie. Likewise, to erect a house or other building so near to mine that it stops up my ancient lights and windows is a nuisance of a similar nature. But in this latter case, it is necessary that the windows be ancient, that is, have subsisted there a time out of mind. Otherwise, there is no injury done. For he hath as much right to build a new edifice upon his ground as I have upon mine since every man may do what he pleases upon the upright or perpendicular of his own soil, and it was my folly to build so near another's ground. Also, if a person keeps his hogs or other noisome animals so near the house of another that the stench of them incommodes him and makes the air unwholesome, this is an injurious nuisance as it tends to deprive him of the use and benefit of his house. A like injury is, if one's neighbor sets up and exercises any offensive trade, as a tanner's, a tallow chandler's, or the like. For though these are lawful and necessary trades, yet they should be exercised in remote places. For the rule is, Sic uture tuo, ut alienum non laedas. This, therefore, is an actionable nuisance so that the nuisances which affect a man's dwelling may be reduced to these three. 1. Overhanging it, which is also a species of trespass, for cujus est solum, ejus est usque ad coelum. 2. Stopping ancient lights, and 3. Corrupting the air with noisome smells, for light and air are two indispensable requisites to every dwelling. 
but depriving one of a mere matter of pleasure, as of a fine prospect by building a wall or the like. This, as it abridges nothing really convenient or necessary, is no injury to the sufferer, and is therefore not an actionable nuisance. As to nuisances to one's lands, if one erects a smelting house for lead so near the land of another, that the vapor and smoke kills his corn and grass, and damages his cattle therein, this is held to be a nuisance, and by consequence it follows, that if one does any other act, in itself lawful, which yet being done in that place necessarily tends to the damage of another's property, it is a nuisance, for it is incumbent on him to find some other place to do that act where it will be less offensive. So also, if my neighbor ought to scour a ditch and does not, whereby my land is overflowed, this is an actionable nuisance. With regard to other corporeal hereditaments, it is a nuisance to stop or divert water that uses to run to another's meadow or mill, to corrupt or poison a watercourse by erecting a dye house or a lime pit for the use of trade in the upper part of the stream, or, in short, to do any act therein that in its consequences must necessarily tend to the prejudice of one's neighbor. So closely does the law of England enforce that excellent rule of gospel morality of doing unto others as we would they should do unto ourselves. 2. As to incorporeal hereditaments, the law carries itself with the same equity. If I have a way annexed to my estate, across another's land, and he obstructs me in the use of it, either by totally stopping it, or putting logs across it, or plowing over it, it is a nuisance. For in the first case I cannot enjoy my right at all, and in the latter I cannot enjoy it so commodiously as I ought. Also, if I am entitled to hold a fair or market, and another person sets up a fair or market so near mine that it does me a prejudice, it is a nuisance to the freehold which I have in my market or fair. But in order to make this out to be a nuisance, it is necessary, one, that my market or fair be the elder, otherwise the nuisance lies at my own door, two, that the market be erected within the third part of twenty miles from mine. For Sir Matthew Hale construes the dieta, or a reasonable day's journey mentioned by Bracton, to be twenty miles, as indeed it is usually understood not only in our own law, but also in the civil, from which we probably borrowed it. So that if the new market be not within seven miles of the old one, it is no nuisance, for it is held reasonable that every man should have a market within one-third of a day's journey from his own home, that, the day being divided into three parts, he may spend one part in going, another in returning, and the third in transacting his necessary business there. If such market or fair be on the same day with mine, it is prima facie a nuisance to mine, and there needs no proof of it, but the law will intend it to be so. But if it be on another day, it may be a nuisance, though whether it is so or not cannot be intended or presumed, but I must make proof of it to the jury. If a ferry is erected on a river, so near another ancient ferry as to draw away its custom, it is a nuisance to the owner of the old one. For where there is a ferry by prescription, the owner is bound to keep it always in repair and readiness, for the ease of all the king's subjects, otherwise he may be grievously immersed. It would be, therefore, extremely hard if a new ferry were suffered to share his profits, which does not also share his burthen. But, where the reason ceases, the law also ceases with it. Therefore, it is no nuisance to erect a mill so near mine as to draw away the custom, unless the miller also intercepts the water. Neither is it a nuisance to set up any trade or a school in the neighborhood or rivalship with another, for by such emulation the public are like to be gainers, and, if the new mill or school occasion a damage to the old one, it is a damnum obsque injuria. 
2. Let us next attend to the remedies which the law has given for this injury of nuisance. And here I must premise that the law gives no private remedy for anything but a private wrong. Therefore, no action lies for a public or common nuisance, but an indictment only, because the damage being common to all the king's subjects, no one can assign his particular proportion of it. Or, if he could, it would be extremely hard if every subject in the kingdom were allowed to harass the offender with separate actions. For this reason, no person, natural or corporate, can have an action for a public nuisance or punish it, but only the king in his public capacity of supreme governor and pater familias of the kingdom. Yet this rule admits of one exception where a private person suffers some extraordinary damage beyond the rest of the king's subjects by a public nuisance, in which case he shall have a private satisfaction by action. As if, by means of a ditch dug across a public way, which is a common nuisance, a man or his horse suffer any injury by falling therein. There, for this particular damage, which is not common to others, the party shall have his action. Also, if a man hath abated or removed a nuisance which offended him, as we remember, it was stated in the first chapter of this book that the party injured hath a right to do, in this case he is entitled to no action, for he had choice of two remedies, either without suit, by abating it himself, by his own mere act and authority, or by suit, in which he may both recover damages and remove it by the aid of the law. But having made his election of one remedy, he is totally precluded from the other. The remedies by suit are, 1. By action on the case for damages, in which the party injured shall only recover a satisfaction for the injury sustained, but cannot thereby remove the nuisance. Indeed, every continuance of a nuisance is held to be a fresh one, and therefore a fresh action will lie, and very exemplary damages will probably be given if, after one verdict against him, the defendant has the hardiness to continue it. Yet the founders of the law of England did not rely upon probabilities merely in order to give relief to the injured. They have therefore provided two other actions the assize of nuisance, and the writ of quoda permitat postaneri, which not only give the plaintiff satisfaction for his injury past, but also strike at the root and remove the cause itself, the nuisance that occasioned the injury. These two actions, however, can only be brought by the tenant of the freehold, so that a lessee for years is confined to his action upon the case. 2. An assize of nuisance is a writ, wherein it is stated that the party injured complains of some particular fact done ad nocumentum liberi tenementi sui, and therefore commanding the sheriff to summon an assize, that is, a jury, and view the premises and have them at the next commission of assizes that justice may be done therein. And, if the assize is found for the plaintiff, he shall have judgment of two things, one, to have the nuisance abated, and two, to recover damages. Formerly, an assize of nuisance only lay against the very wrongdoer himself who levied or did the nuisance, and did not lie against any person to whom he had aliened the tenements whereon the nuisance was situated. This was the immediate reason for making that equitable provision in Statute Westminster 2, 13, Edward I, c. 24, for granting a similar writ in Casu Consimili, where no former precedent was to be found. The statute enacts that de catero non recedent quarentas ad curia domini regis pro eo quod tenementum transfertur de uno in alium, and then gives the form of a new writ in this case, which only differs from the old one in this, that where the assize is brought against the very person who only levied the nuisance, it is said, quod a, the wrongdoer, injuste letave tale nacumentum, 
but where the lands are alien to another person, the complaint is against both. Quod a, the wrongdoer, et b, the alieni, leva verunt. For every continuation, as was before said, is a fresh nuisance, and therefore the complaint is as well grounded against the alieni who continues it as against the alien or who first levied it. 3. Before this statute, the party injured upon any alienation of the land wherein the nuisance was set up was driven to his quod pernistat prosteneri, which was in the nature of a writ of right, and therefore subject to greater delays. This is a writ commanding the defendant to permit the plaintiff to abate quod permitat prosteneri, the nuisance complained of, and unless he so permits, to summon him to appear in court to show cause why he will not. And this writ lies as well for the alieni of the party first injured as against the alieni of the party first injuring, as hath been determined by all judges. And the plaintiff shall have judgment herein to abate the nuisance and to recover damages against the defendant. Both these actions of a seize of nuisance and quod permitat prosteneri are now out of use and have given way to the action on the case, in which, as it was before observed, no judgment can be had to abate the nuisance, but only to recover damages. Yet, as therein it is not necessary that the freehold should be in the plaintiff and the defendant respectively, as it must be in these real actions, but it is maintainable by one that hath possession only against another that hath like possession. The process is therefore easier, and the effect will be much the same unless a man has a very obstinate as well as an ill-natured neighbor who had rather continue to pay damages than to remove his nuisance. For in such case, recourse must at last be had to the old and sure remedies which will effectually conquer the defendant's perverseness by sending the sheriff with his posse comitatus or power of the county to level it. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England Book 3 by William Blackstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Waste The fourth species of injury that may be offered to one's real property is by waste or destruction in lands and tenements. What shall be called waste was considered at large in a former volume as it was a means of forfeiture, and thereby of transferring the property of real estates. I shall therefore here only beg leave to remind the student that waste is a spoil and destruction of the estate, either in houses, woods, or lands, by demolishing not the temporary profits only, but the very substance of the thing, thereby rendering it wild and desolate, which the common law expresses very significantly by the word vastum, and that this vastum, or waste, is either voluntary or permissive, the one by actual and designed demolition of the lands, woods, and houses, the other arising from mere negligence and want of sufficient care in reparations, fences, and the like, so that my only business is at present to show to whom this waste is an injury, and, of course, who is entitled to any, and what, remedy by action. 1. The persons who may be injured by waste are such as have some interest in the estate wasted. For if a man be the absolute tenant in fee simple, without any encumbrance or charge on the premises, he may commit whatever waste his own indiscretion may prompt him to, without being impeachable or accountable for it to any one. And, though his heir is sure to be the sufferer, yet nemo est aares viventis, no man is certain of succeeding him, as well on account of the uncertainty which shall die first, 
as also because he has it in his own power to constitute what air he pleases, according to the civil law notion of an aeris noctis, an aeris factus, or, in more accurate phraseology of our English law, he may alien or devise his estate to whomever he thinks proper, and by such alienation or devise may disinherit his heir at law. Into whose hands soever, therefore, the estate wasted comes, after a tenant in fee simple, though the waste is undoubtedly damnum, it is damnum obsque injuria. One species of interest which is injured by waste is that of a person who has a right of common in the place wasted, especially if it be common of a stover's, or a right of cutting and carrying away wood for houseboat, ploughboat, etc. Here, if the owner of the wood demolishes the whole wood and thereby destroys all possibility of taking a stover's, this is an injury to the commoner amounting to no less than a decision of his common of a stover's if he chooses so to consider it, for which he has his remedy to recover possession and damages by a seize if entitled to a freehold in such common. But if he has only a chattel interest, then he can only recover damages by an action on the case for this waste and destruction of the woods out of which his estovers were to issue. But the most usual and important interest that is hurt by this common of waste is that of him who hath the remainder or reversion of the inheritance after a particular state for life or years in being. Here, if the particular tenant, be it tenant in dower or by courtesy, who was answerable for waste at the common law, or the lessee for life or years, who was first made liable by the statutes of Marlbridge and of Gloucester, if the particular tenant, I say, commits or suffers any waste, it is a manifest injury to him that has the inheritance, as it tends to mangle and dismember it of its most desirable incidents and ornaments, among which timber and houses may justly be reckoned the principal. To him, therefore, in remainder or reversion, the law hath given a remedy, that is, to him to whom the inheritance appertains in expectancy. For he, who hath the remainder for life only, is not entitled to sue for waste, since his interest may never perhaps come into possession, and then he hath suffered no injury. Yet a parson, vicar, archdeacon, prebendary, or the like, who are seized in right of their churches of any remainder or reversion, may have an action of waste, for they, in many cases, have for the benefit of the church and of the successor a fee simple qualified, and yet, as they are not seized in their own right, the writ of waste shall not say, ad ex era decinum ipsus, as for other tenants in the fee simple, but ad ex era decinum ecclesiae, in whose right the fee simple is holden. 2. The redress for this injury of waste is of two kinds, preventative and corrective, the former of which is by rid of estrepment, the latter by that of waste. 1. Estrepment is an old French word signifying the same as waste or extirpation, and the writ of estrepment lay at the common law after judgment obtained in any action real and before possession was delivered by the sheriff to stop any waste which the vanquished party might be tempted to commit in lands which were determined to be no longer his but as in some cases the demandant may be justly apprehensive that the tenant may make waste or estrepment pending the suit well knowing the weakness of his title therefore the statute of Gloucester gave another writ of estrepment pendente placito, commanding the sheriff firmly to inhibit the tenant ne faciet bastum bel estrapamentum pendente placito dicto indiscuso. And by virtue of either of these writs, the sheriff may resist them that do, or offer to do, waste. And if otherwise he cannot prevent them, he may lawfully imprison the wasters, or make a warrant to others to imprison them, or, if necessity require, 
he may take the posse comitatus to his assistance. So odious in the sight of the law is waste and destruction. In suing out these two writs, this difference was formally observed, that in actions merely possessory, where no damages are recovered, a writ of estrepment might be had at any time pendente lite, nay, even at the time of suing out the original writ or first process. But in an action where damages were recovered, the demandant could only have a writ of estrepment if he was apprehensive of waste after verdict had, for, with regard to waste done before the verdict was given, it was presumed the jury would consider that in assessing the quantum of damages. But now it seems to be held by an equitable construction of the statute of Gloucester and in advancement of the remedy that a writ of estrepment to prevent waste may be had in every stage as well of such actions wherein damages are recovered as those wherein only possession is had of the lands. For per adventure, faith the law, the tenant may not be of the ability to satisfy the demandant his full damages. And therefore now, in an action of waste itself, to recover the place wasted and also damages, a writ of estrepment will lie as well before as after judgment. For the plaintiff cannot recover damages for more waste than is contained in his original complaint. Neither is he at liberty to assign or give in evidence any waste made after the suing out of the writ. It is therefore reasonable that he should have this writ of preventative justice, since he is in his present suit debarred of any farther remedial. If a writ of estrepment forbidding waste be directed and delivered to the tenant, as it may be, and he afterwards proceeds to commit waste, an action may be carried on upon the foundation of this writ, wherein the only plea of the tenant can be non fecit bastum contra prohibitionem, and, if upon verdict it be found that he did, the plaintiff may recover costs and damages, or the party may proceed to punish the defendant for the contempt. For if, after the writ directed and delivered to the tenant or his servants, they proceed to commit waste, the court will imprison them for this contempt of the writ. But not so if it be directed to the sheriff for then it is incumbent upon him to prevent the estrepment absolutely, even by raising the posse comitatus, if it can be done no other way. Besides this preventative redress at common law, the courts of equity upon bill exhibited therein, complaining of waste and destruction, will grant an injunction or order to stay waste until the defendant shall have put in his answer and the court shall thereupon make farther order, which is now become the most usual way of preventing waste. 2. A writ of waste is also an action, partly founded upon the common law and partly upon the statute of Gloucester, and may be brought by him who hath the immediate estate of inheritance in reversion or remainder against the tenant for life, tenant in dower, tenant by the courtesy, or tenant for years. This action is also maintainable in pursuance of Statute Westminster II by one tenant in common of the inheritance against another who makes waste in the estate holden in common. The equity of which statute extends to joint tenants but not to co-parsoners, because by the old law co-parsoners might make partition whenever either of them thought proper and thereby prevent future waste, but tenants in common and joint tenants could not, and therefore the statute gave them this remedy, compelling the defendant either to make partition and take the place wasted to his own share, or to give security not to commit any farther waste. But these tenants in common and joint tenants are not liable to the penalties of the statute of Gloucester, which extends only to such as have life estates and do waste to the prejudice of the inheritance. The waste, however, must be something considerable, for if it amount to only twelve pence or some such petty sum, the plaintiff shall not recover in an action of waste. Nam de minimis non curat lex. 
This action of waste is a mixed action, partly real, so far as it recovers land, and partly personal, so far as it recovers damages. For it is brought for both those purposes, and, if waste be proved, the plaintiff shall recover the thing or place wasted, and also treble damages by the statute of Gloucester. The writ of waste calls upon the tenant to appear and show cause why he hath committed waste and destruction in the place named, ad ex era decinum, to the disinherison of the plaintiff. And if the defendant makes default, or does not appear at the day assigned him, then the sheriff is to take with him a jury of twelve men, and go in person to the place alleged to be wasted, and there inquire of the waste done and the damages, and make a return or report of the same to the court, upon which report the judgment is founded. For the law will not suffer so heavy a judgment as the forfeiture and treble damages to be passed upon a mere default without full assurance that the fact is according as it is stated in the writ. But if the defendant appears to the writ, and afterwards suffers judgment to go against him by default, or upon a nihil dicit, when he makes no answer, puts in no plea in defense, this amounts to a confession of the waste, since having once appeared, he cannot now pretend ignorance of the charge. Now therefore the sheriff shall not go to the place to inquire of the fact whether any waste has or has not been committed, for this is already ascertained by the silent confession of the defendant, but he shall only as in defaults upon other actions, make inquiry of the quantum of damages. The defendant on the trial may give in evidence anything that proves there was no waste committed, as that the destruction happened by lightning, tempest, the king's enemies, or other inevitable accident. But it is no defense to say that a stranger did the waste, for against him the plaintiff has no remedy though the defendant is entitled to sue such stranger in an action of trespass v et armis, and shall recover the damages he has suffered in consequence of such unlawful act. When the waste and damages are thus ascertained, either by confession, verdict, or inquiry of the sheriff, judgment is given, in pursuance of the statute of Gloucester, c. 5, that the plaintiff shall recover the place wasted, for which he has immediately a writ of season, provided the particular estate be still subsisting. For if it be expired, there can be no forfeiture of the land. And also, that the plaintiff shall recover treble the damages assessed by the jury, which he must obtain in the same manner as all other damages in actions personal and mixed are obtained, whether the particular estate be expired or still in being. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of subtraction subtraction which is the fifth species of injuries affecting a man's real property happens when any person who owes any suit duty custom or service to another withdraws or neglects to perform it it differs from a decision in that this is committed without any denial of the right consisting merely in non-performance that strikes at the very title of the party injured and amounts to an ouster or actual dispossession. Subtraction, however, being clearly an injury, is remediable by due course of law, but the remedy differs according to the nature of the services, whether they be due by virtue of any tenure or by custom only. 1. Fealty, suit of court and rent, are duties and services usually issuing and arising ratione teniori, being the conditions upon which the ancient lords granted out their lands to their feudatories, 
whereby it was stipulated that they and their heirs should take the oath of fealty or fidelity to their lord, which was the feudal bond or commune viniculum between lord and tenant, that they should do suit or duly attend and follow the lord's courts and there from time to time give their assistance by serving on juries either to decide the property of their neighbors in the court baron or correct their misdemeanors in the court leap. And lastly, that they should yield to the Lord certain annual stated returns in military attendance, in provisions, in arms, in matters of ornament or pleasure, in rustic employments or pradial labors, or, which is instar omnium, in money, which will provide all the rest, all which are comprised under the one general name of reditus, return, or rent and the subtraction or non-observance of any of these conditions by neglecting to swear fealty, to do suit of court, or to render the rent or service reserved is an injury to the freehold of the Lord by diminishing and deprecating the value of his seigneury. The general remedy for all these is by distress, and it is the only remedy at the common law for the two first of them. The nature of distresses, their incidents and consequences, we have before more than once explained. It may here suffice to remember that they are a taking of beasts or other personal property by way of pledge to enforce the performance of something due from the party distrained upon. And for the most part, it is provided that distresses be reasonable and moderate. But, in the case of distress for fealty or suit of court, no distress can be unreasonable, immoderate, or too large. For this is the only remedy to which the party aggrieved is entitled, and therefore it ought to be such as is sufficiently compulsory. And, be it of what value it will, there is no harm done, especially as it cannot be sold or made away with, but must be restored immediately on satisfaction made. A distress of this nature that has no bounds with regard to its quantity and may be repeated from time to time until the stubbornness of the party is conquered is called a distress infinite, which is also used for some other purposes as in summoning jurors and the like. Other remedies for subtraction of rents or services are 1 by action of debt, for the breach of this express contract, of which enough has been formally said. This is the most usual remedy when recourse is had to any action at all for the recovery of pecuniary rents, to which species of render almost all free services are now reduced since the abolition of the military tenures. But for a freehold rent, reserved on a lease for life, etc., no action of debt lay by the common law during the continuance of the freehold out of which it issued, for the law would not suffer a real injury to be remedied by an action that was merely personal. However, by the statutes 8 and C-14 and 5 George III C-17, Actions of debt may now be brought at any time to recover such freehold rents. 2. An assize of morte and chester, or novel decision, will lie of rents as well as of lands if the Lord, for the sake of trying the possessory right, will elect to suppose himself ousted or deceased thereof. This is now seldom heard of, and all other real actions being in their nature of writs of right and therefore more dilatory in their progress are entirely disused, though not formally abolished by law. Of this species, however, is 3. The writ de consuetudinibus et servitius, which lies for the Lord against his tenant, who withholds from him the rents and services due by custom or tenure for his land. This compels a specific payment or performance of the rent or service, but there are also others whereby the Lord shall recover the land itself in lieu of the duty withheld. As 4. 
the writ of Chesavit, which lies by the statutes of Gloucester, 6, Edward I, C4, and of Westminster, 2, 13, Edward I, C21 and 41, when a man who holds lands of a lord by rent or other services neglects or ceases to perform his services for two years together, or where a religious house hath lands given it on condition of performing some certain spiritual service as reading prayers or giving alms and neglects it. In either of which cases, if the cessor or neglect have continued for two years, the lord or donor and his heirs shall have a writ of chesavit to recover the land itself, eo quod tenens in facienda servitis per vienum jam chesavit. And in like manner, by the civil law, if a tenant, who held lands upon payment of rent or services, or as they call it, jure ambitutico, neglected to pay or perform them per totum trienimum, he might be ejected from such emphitutic lands. But by the statute of Gloucester, the Chesabit does not lie for lands let upon fee-farm rents unless they have lain fresh and uncultivated for two years, and there be not sufficient distress upon the premises, or unless the tenant hath so enclosed the land that the Lord cannot come upon it to distrain. For the law prefers the simple and ordinary remedies, by distress or by the actions just now mentioned, to this extraordinary one of forfeiture for a chesavit. And therefore, the same statute of Gloucester has provided father that upon tender of arrears and damages before judgment, and giving security for the future performance of the services, the process shall be at an end, and the tenant shall retain his land. And to this the statute of Westminster too conforms, so far as may stand with convenience and reason of law. It is easy to observe that the statute for George II, C. 28, which was mentioned in a former chapter, and which permits landlords who have right of re-entry for non-payment of rent, to serve an ejectment on their tenants when half a year's rent is due, and there is no distress on the premises, it is easy, I say, to observe that this provision is in some measure copied from the ancient writ of Chesavit, especially as it may be satisfied and put an end to in a similar manner by tender of rent and costs within six months after. 5. There is also another very effectual remedy which takes place when the tenant upon a writ of assize for rent or on a replevin disowns or disclaims his tenure, whereby the Lord loses his verdict, in which case the Lord may have a writ of right, sir disclaimer, grounded on this denial of tenure, and shall, upon proof the tenure, recover back the land itself so holden as a punishment to the tenant for such his false disclaimer. This piece of retaliating justice, whereby the tenant, who endeavors to defraud his lord, is himself deprived of the estate, as it evidently proceeds upon feudal principles, so it is expressly to be met within the feudal constitutions. Vassalis qui abegnavet veiudum ejusve conditionum, ex poliabitor. And, as on the one hand, the ancient law provided these several remedies to obviate the knavery and punish the ingratitude of the tenant, so, on the other hand, it was equally careful to redress the oppression of the Lord by furnishing, one, the writ of ne injuste vexis, which is an ancient writ founded on that chapter of Magna Carta which prohibits distresses for greater services than are really due the Lord, being itself of the prohibitory kind and yet in the nature of a writ of right. It lies where the tenant in fee simple and his ancestors have held of the Lord by certain services, and the Lord hath obtained season of more or greater services by the inadvertent payment or performance of them by the tenant himself. Here the tenant cannot, in an avowry, avoid the Lord's possessory right because of the season given by his own hands, 
but is driven to this writ to divest the Lord's possession and establish the mere right of property by ascertaining the services and reducing them to their proper standard. But this writ does not lie for tenant and tail, for he may avoid such season of the Lord obtained from the payment of his ancestors by a plea to an avowry in replevin. 2. The writ of mean de medio, which is also in the nature of a writ of right, and lies when upon a sub-infudation the mean or middle lord suffers his under-tenant or tenant paravail to be distrained upon by the lord paramount for the rent due him from the mean lord. And in such case the tenant shall have judgment to be acquitted or indemnified by the mean lord, and if he makes default therein or does not appear originally to the tenant's writ, he shall be forejudged of his meanalty, and the tenant shall hold immediately of the Lord Paramount himself. 2. Thus far of the remedies for subtraction of rents or other services due by tenure. There are also other services due by ancient custom and prescription only, such as that of doing suit to another's mill, where the persons resident in a particular place by usage time out of mind, have been accustomed to grind their corn at a certain mill, and afterwards any of them go to another mill and withdraw their suit, their secta a secundo, from the ancient mill. This is not only a damage, but an injury to the owner, because this prescription might have a very reasonable foundation, viz., upon the erection of such mill by the ancestors of the owner for the convenience of the inhabitants on the condition that when erected they should all grind their corn there only. And for this injury the owner shall have a writ defecta ad molendinum, commanding the defendant to do his suit at that mill quam ad alud facere debet et solet, or show good cause to the contrary, in which action the validity of the prescription may be tried, and if it be found for the owner, he shall recover damages against the defendant. In like manner, and for like reasons, the register will inform us that a man may have a writ of secta ad fornium, secta ad torali, et ad dominia ale ujismani, for suit to his furnum, his public oven or bakehouse, or to his torali, his kiln or malt house, when a person's ancestors have erected a convenience of that sort for the benefit of the neighborhood, and upon agreement proved by immemorial custom that all the inhabitants should use and resort to it when erected. But besides these special remedies for subtractions, to compel the specific performance of the service due by custom, an action on the case will also lie for all of them to repair the party injured in damages, and thus much for the injury of subtraction. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Disturbance, Part 1. The sixth and last species of real injuries is that of disturbance, which is usually a wrong done to some incorporeal hereditament by hindering or disquieting the owners in their regular and lawful enjoyment of it. I shall consider five sorts of this injury, viz. 1. Disturbance of franchises. 2. Disturbance of common. 3. Disturbance of ways. 4. Disturbance of tenure. 5. Disturbance of patronage. 1. Disturbance of franchises happens when a man has the franchise of holding a court leet, of keeping a fair or market, of free warren, of taking toll, of seizing waifs or estrays, or, in short, 
any other species of franchise whatsoever, and he is disturbed or incommoded in the lawful exercise thereof. As if another, by distress, menaces, or persuasions, prevails upon the suitors not to appear at my court, or obstructs the passage to my fair or market, or hunts in my free warren, or refuses to pay me the accustomed toll, or hinders me from seizing the waif or astray whereby it escapes or is carried out of my liberty, in every case of this kind which it is impossible here to recite or suggest, there is an injury done to the legal owner, his property is damnified, and the profits arising from such his franchise are diminished. To remedy which, as the law has given no other writ, he is therefore entitled to sue for damages by a special action on the case, or, in case of toll, may take a distress if he pleases. 2. The disturbance of common comes next to be considered, where any act is done by which the right of another to his common is incommoded or diminished. This may happen, in the first place, where one who hath no right of common puts his cattle into the land, and thereby robs the cattle of the commoners of their respective shares of the pasture. Or if one, who hath a right of common, puts in cattle which are not commonable, as hogs and goats, which amounts to the same inconvenience. But the lord of the soil may, by custom or prescription, but not without, put a stranger's cattle into the common, and also, by a like prescription for a common appurtenant, cattle that are not commonable may be put into the common. The lord also of the soil may justify making burrows therein, and putting in rabbits, so as they do not increase to so large a number as to totally destroy the common. But in general, in case the beasts of a stranger, or the uncommonable cattle of a commoner, be found upon the land, the lord or any of the commoners may distrain them damage feasant, or the commoner may bring an action on the case to recover damages, provided the injury done be anything considerable so that he may lay his action with a per quad, or allege that thereby he was deprived of his common. But for a trivial trespass the commoner has no action, but the lord of the soil only, for the entry and trespass committed. Another disturbance of common is by surcharging it, or putting more cattle therein than the pasture and herbage will sustain, or the party hath a right to do. In this case, he that surcharges does an injury to the rest of the owners by depriving them of their respective portions, or at least contracting them into a smaller compass. This injury by surcharging can properly speaking only happen where the common is a pendant or a pertinent, and of course limitable by law, or where, when in gross, it is expressly limited and certain. For where a man hath common in gross, sans nombre, or without stint, he cannot be a surcharger. However, even where a man is said to have common without stint, still there must be left sufficient for the Lord's own beasts, for the law will not suppose that, at the original grant of the common, the Lord meant to exclude himself. The usual remedies for surcharging the common are either by distraining so many of the beasts as are above the number allowed, or else by an action of trespass, both of which may be had by the Lord, or, lastly, by a special action on the case for damages, in which any commoner may be plaintiff. But the ancient and most effectual method of proceeding is by writ of admeasurement of pasture. This lies either where a common appurtenant or in gross is certain as to number, or where a man has common appendant or appurtenant to his land, the quantity of which common has never yet been ascertained. In either of these cases, as well the Lord as any of the commoners is entitled to this writ of ad measurement, which is one of those writs that is called viscontil, being directed to the sheriff, Vice comite, 
and not to be returned to any superior court till finally executed by him. It recites a complaint that the defendant hath surcharged super honoravit the common, and therefore commands the sheriff to add measure and apportion it, that the defendant may not have more than belongs to him, and that the plaintiff may have his rightful share. And upon this suit all the commoners shall be ad measured, as well those who have not, as those who have, surcharged the common, as well the plaintiff as the defendant. The execution of this writ must be by a jury of twelve men who are upon their oaths to ascertain, under the superintendence of the sheriff, what and how many cattle each commoner is entitled to feed. And the rule for this admeasurement is generally understood to be that the commoner shall not turn more cattle upon the common than are sufficient to manure and stock the land to which his right of common is annexed, or, as our ancient law expressed it, such cattle only as are levant and cochant upon his tenement, which, being a thing uncertain before admeasurement, has frequently, though erroneously, occasioned this unmeasured right of common to be called a common without stint, or sans nombre, a thing which, though possible in law, does in fact very rarely exist. If after the admeasurement has thus ascertained the right, the same defendant surcharges the common again, the plaintiff may have a writ of second surcharge, de secunda superonerationi, which is given by the statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C. 8, and thereby the sheriff is directed to inquire by a jury whether the defendant has in fact again surcharged the common, contrary to the tenor of the last admeasurement, and if he has, he shall then forfeit to the king the supernumerary cattle put in, and also shall pay damages to the plaintiff. This process seems highly equitable, for the first offense is held to be committed through mere inadvertence, and therefore there are no damages or forfeiture on the first writ, which was only to ascertain the right which was disputed. But the second offense is a willful contempt and injustice, and therefore punished very properly with not only damages but also forfeiture. And herein the right, being once settled, is never again disputed, but only the fact is tried whether there be any second surcharge or no, which gives this neglected proceeding a great advantage over the modern method by action on the case, wherein the quantum of common belonging to the defendant must be proved upon every fresh trial for every repeated offense. There is yet another disturbance of common, when the owner of the land or other person so encloses or otherwise obstructs it, that the commoner is precluded from enjoying the benefit to which he is by law entitled. This may be done either by erecting fences or by driving the cattle off the land or by plowing up the soil of the common, or it may be done by erecting a warren therein and stocking it with rabbits in such quantities that they devour the whole herbage and thereby destroy the common. For in such case, though the commoner may not destroy the rabbits, yet the law looks upon this as an injurious disturbance of his right, and has given him his remedy by action against the owner. This kind of disturbance does indeed amount to a decision, and if the commoner chooses to consider it in that light, the law has given him an assize of novel decision against the Lord to recover the possession of his common, or it has given a writ of quod permitat against any strangers as well as the owner of the land in case of such a disturbance to the plaintiff as amounts to a total deprivation of his common, whereby the defendant shall be compelled to permit the plaintiff to enjoy his common as he ought. But if the commoner does not choose to bring a real action to recover season, or to try the right, he may, which is the easier and more usual way, bring an action on the case for his damages instead of an assize or a quod permitat.
There are cases indeed in which the Lord may enclose and abridge the common, for which, as they are no injury to any one, so no one is entitled to any remedy. For it is provided by the statute of Merton, 20 Henry the Third, C. 4, that the Lord may approve, that is, enclose and convert to the uses of husbandry, which is amelioration or improvement, any waste grounds, woods, or pastures in which his tenants have common appendant to their estates, provided he leaves sufficient common to his tenants according to the proportion of their land. And this is extremely reasonable, for it would be very hard if the Lord, whose ancestors granted out these estates to which the commons are appendant, should be precluded from making what advantage he can of the rest of his manor, provided such advantage and improvement be no way derogatory from the former grants. The statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C. 46, extends this liberty of approving in like manner against all others that have common appurtenant or engross, as well as against the tenants of the Lord who have their common appendant, and farther enacts that no assize of novel decision for common shall lie against the Lord for erecting on the common any windmill, sheep house, or other necessary buildings therein specified, which Sir Edward Coke says are only put as examples, and that any other necessary improvements may be made by the Lord, though in reality they abridge the common and make it less sufficient for the commoners. And lastly, by statutes 29 George II C36 and 31 George II C41, it is particularly enacted that any lords of wastes and commons, with the consent of the major part in number and value of the commoners, may enclose any part thereof for the growth of timber and underwood. 3. The third species of disturbance, that of ways, is very similar in its nature to the last, it principally happening when a person who hath a right of way over another's grounds, by grant or prescription, is obstructed by enclosures or other obstacles or by ploughing across it, by which means he cannot enjoy his right of way, or at least not in so commodious a manner as he might have done. If this be a way annexed to his estate, and the obstruction is made by the tenant of the land, this brings it to another species of injury, for it is then a nuisance for which an assize will lie, as mentioned in a former chapter. But if the right of way, thus obstructed by the tenant, be only in gross, that is, annexed to a man's person, and unconnected with any lands or tenements, or if the obstruction of a way belonging to a house or land is made by a stranger, it is then, in either case, merely a disturbance, for the obstruction of a way in gross is no detriment to any lands or tenements, and therefore does not fall under the legal notion of a nuisance which must be laid ad nocumentum liberi tenementi, and the obstruction of it by a stranger can never tend to put the right of way in dispute. The remedy, therefore, for these disturbances is not by a seize or any real action, but by the universal remedy of action on the case to recover damages. 4. The fourth species of disturbance is that of disturbance of tenure, or breaking that connection which subsists between the Lord and his tenant, and to which the law pays so high a regard that it will not suffer it to be wantonly dissolved by the act of a third person. The having an estate well tenanted is an advantage that every landlord must be very sensible of, and therefore the driving away a tenant from off his estate is an injury of no small consequence. If, therefore, there be a tenant at will of any lands or tenements, and a stranger, either by menaces and threats, or by unlawful distresses, or by fraud and circumvention, or other means, contrives to drive him away or inveigle him to leave his tenancy, this the law very justly construes to be a wrong and injury to the Lord, and gives him a reparation in damages against the offender 
by a special action on the case. 5. The fifth and last species of disturbance, but by far the most considerable, is that of disturbance of patronage, which is an hindrance or obstruction of a patron to present his clerk to a benefice. This injury was distinguished at common law from another species of injury called usurpation, which is an absolute ouster or dispossession of the patron, and happens when a stranger that hath no right presenteth a clerk, and thereupon he is admitted and instituted. In which case of usurpation, the patron lost by the common law not only his turn of presenting pro hoc vice, but also the absolute and perpetual inheritance of the advowson, so that he could not present again upon the next avoidance, unless, in the meantime, he recovered his right by a real action, viz., a writ of right of advowson. The reason given for his losing the present turn, and not ejecting the usurper's clerk was, that the final intent of the law in creating this species of property being to have a fit person to celebrate divine service, it preferred the peace of the church, provided a clerk were once admitted and instituted, to the right of any patron whatever. And the patron also lost the inheritance of his advowson, unless he recovered it in a writ of right, because by such usurpation he was put out of possession of his advowson, as much as when by actual entry and ouster he is deceased of lands or houses, since the only possession of which an advowson is capable is by actual presentation and admission of one's clerk. And therefore, when the clerk was once instituted, except in the case of the king where he must also be inducted, the church was absolutely full, and the usurper became seized of the advowson which season or possession it was impossible for the true patron to remove by any possessory action or other means during the plenity or fullness of the church. And when it became void afresh, he could not present, since another had the right of possession. The only remedy, therefore, which the patron had left, was to try the mere right in a writ of right of advowson, which is a peculiar writ of right, framed for this special purpose, but in every other respect corresponding with other writs of right. And, if a man recovered therein, he regained his advowson and was entitled to present at the next avoidance. But in order to such recovery, he must allege a presentation in himself or some of his ancestors, which proves him or them to have been once in possession. For as a grant of the advowson during the fullness of the church conveys no manner of possession for the present, therefore a purchaser, until he hath presented, hath no actual season whereon to ground of writ of right. Thus stood the common law. But bishops in ancient times, either by carelessness or collusion, frequently instituting clerks upon the presentation of usurpers, and thereby defrauding the real patrons of their right of possession, it was in substance enacted by statute Westminster 2, 13, Edward I, C5, S2, that if a possessory action be brought within six months after the avoidance, the patron shall, notwithstanding such usurpation and institution, recover that very presentation, which gives back to him the season of the advowson. Yet still, if the true patron omitted to bring his action within six months, the season was gained by the usurper, and the patron to recover it was driven to the long and hazardous process of a writ of right, to remedy which it was farther enacted by Statute 7 and C-18 that no usurpation shall displace the estate or interest of the patron or turn it into a mere right but that the true patron may present upon the next avoidance as if no such usurpation had happened. So that the title of usurpation is now much narrowed, and the law stands upon this reasonable foundation, that if a stranger usurps my presentation, and I do not pursue my right within six months, 
I shall lose that turn without remedy for the peace of the church and as a punishment for my own negligence, but that turn is the only one I shall lose thereby. Usurpation now gains no right to the usurper with regard to any future avoidance, but only to the present vacancy. It cannot indeed be remedied after six months are past, but during those six months it is only a species of disturbance. Disturbers of a right of advowson may therefore be these three persons. The pseudo-patron, his clerk, and the ordinary. The pretended patron, by presenting to a church to which he has no right, and thereby making it litigious or disputable. The clerk, by demanding or obtaining institution, which tends to and promotes the same inconvenience. And the ordinary, by refusing to admit the real patron's clerk, or admitting the clerk of the pretender. These disturbances are vexatious and injurious to him who hath the right, and therefore, if he be not wanting to himself, the law, besides the writ of right of advowson, which is a final and conclusive remedy, hath given him two inferior possessory actions for his relief, and a seize of darien presentment, and a writ of quare impedit, in which the patron is always the plaintiff and not the clerk. For the law supposes the injury to be offered to him only by obstructing or refusing the admission of his nominee, and not to the clerk, who hath no right in him till institution, and of course can suffer no injury. 1. An assize of darain presentment, or last presentation, lies when a man or his ancestors under whom he claims have presented a clerk to a benefice who is instituted and afterwards upon the next avoidance a stranger presents a clerk and thereby disturbs him that is the real patron in which case the patron shall have this writ directed to the sheriff to summon an assize or jury to inquire who was the last patron that presented to the church now vacant of which the plaintiff complains that he is deforced by the defendant, and, according as the assize determines that question, a writ shall issue to the bishop to institute the clerk of that patron in whose favor the determination is made, and also to give damages in pursuance of statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C5. This question, it is to be observed, was, before the statute 7 n before mentioned, entirely conclusive as between the patron or his heirs and a stranger. For till then, the full possession of the advowson was in him who presented last and his heirs, unless, since that presentation, the clerk had been evicted within six months or the rightful patron had recovered the advowson in a writ of right, which is a title superior to all others. But that statute having given a right to any person to bring a quare impedit and to recover if his title be good, notwithstanding the last presentation by whomsoever made, a seizes of darain presentment, now not being in any wise conclusive, have been totally disused as indeed they began to be before. And a quare impedit being a more general and therefore a more usual action. For the assize of darain presentment lies only where a man has an advowson by descent from his ancestors, but the writ of quare impedit is equally remedial whether a man claims title by descent or by purchase. End of chapter 16, part 1. Chapter 16, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Disturbance, Part 2. 2. I proceed, therefore, secondly, to inquire into the nature of a writ of quare impedit, 
now the only action used in case of the disturbance of patronage, and shall first premise the usual proceedings previous to the bringing of the writ. Upon the vacancy of a living, the patron, we know, is bound to present within six calendar months, otherwise it will lapse to the bishop. But, if the presentation be made within that time, the bishop is bound to admit and institute the clerk, if found sufficient, unless the church be full, or there be notice of any litigation. For if any opposition be intended, it is usual for each party to enter a caveat with the bishop to prevent his institution of his antagonist's clerk. An institution after a caveat entered is void by the ecclesiastical law, but this the temporal courts pay no regard to and look upon a caveat as a mere nullity. But if two presentations be offered to the bishop upon the same avoidance, the church is then said to become litigious, and if nothing further done, the bishop may suspend the admission of either and suffer a lapse to incur. Yet if the patron or clerk on either side request him to award a jus patronatus, he is bound to do it. A jus patronatus is a commission from the bishop, directed usually to his chancellor and others of competent learning, who are to summon a jury of six clergymen and six laymen to inquire into and examine who is the rightful patron, and if, upon such inquiry made and certificate thereof returned by the commissioners, he admits and institutes the clerk of that patron whom they return as the true one, the bishop secures himself, at all events from being a disturber, whatever proceedings may be had afterwards in the temporal courts. The clerk refused by the bishop may also have a remedy against him in the spiritual court, denominated a duplex querela, which is a complaint in the nature of an appeal from the ordinary to his next immediate superior, as from a bishop to the archbishop, or from an archbishop to the delegates, and if the superior court adjudges the cause of refusal to be insufficient, it will grant institution to the appellant. Thus far, matters may go on in the mere ecclesiastical course, but in contested presentations they seldom go so far, for upon the first delay or refusal of the bishop to admit his clerk, the patron usually brings his writ of quare impedit against the bishop for the temporal injury done to his property in disturbing him in his presentation. And if the delay arises from the bishop alone, as upon pretense of incapacity or the like, then he only is named in the writ. But if there be another presentation set up, then the presented patron and his clerk are also joined in the action, or it may be brought against the patron and clerk leaving out the bishop, or against the patron only. But it is most advisable to bring it against all three, for if the bishop be left out and the suit be not determined till six months are past, the bishop is entitled to present by lapse for he is not party to the suit. But if he be named, no lapse can possibly accrue till the right is determined. If the patron be left out, and the writ be brought only against the bishop and the clerk, the suit is of no effect, and the writ shall abate, for the right of the patron is the principal question in the cause. If the clerk be left out, and has received institution before the action brought, as is sometimes the case, the patron by this suit may recover his right of patronage, but not the present turn, for he cannot have judgment to remove a clerk unless he be made a defendant and is party to the suit to hear what he can allege against it, for which reasons it is the safer way always to insert them, all three, in the writ. The writ of quare impedit commands the disturbers, the bishop, the pseudo-patron and his clerk to permit the plaintiff to present a proper person, without specifying the particular clerk, to such a vacant church which pertains to his patronage, and which the defendants, as he alleges, do obstruct, and unless they so do, 
then that they appear in court to show the reason why they hinder him. Immediately on the suing out of the quare impedit, if the plaintiff suspects that the bishop will admit the defendants or any other clerk pending the suit, he may have a prohibitory writ called a ni admitas, which recites the contention begun in the king's courts and forbids the bishop to admit any clerk whatsoever till such contention be determined. And if the bishop doth, after the receipt of this writ, admit any person, even though the patron's right may have been found in a jure patronatus, then the plaintiff, after he has obtained judgment in the quare impedit, may remove the incumbent if the clerk of a stranger by a writ of shire facius, and shall have a special action against the bishop, called a quare incumbravit, to recover the presentation, and also satisfaction in damages for the injury done him by encumbering the church with a clerk pending the suit, and after the ne admitas received. But if the bishop has encumbered the church by instituting the clerk before the ne admitas issued, no quare incumbravit lies, for the bishop hath no legal notice till the writ of ne admitas is served upon him. The patron is therefore left to his quare impedit merely, which, as was before observed, now lies, since the statute of Westminster II, as well upon a recent usurpation within six months past, as upon a disturbance without any usurpation had. In the proceedings upon a quare impedit, the plaintiff must set out his title at length and prove at least one presentation in himself, his ancestors, or those under whom he claims, for he must recover by the strength of his own right and not by the weakness of the defendants, and he must also show a disturbance before the action brought. Upon this the bishop and the clerk usually disclaim all title, save only the one as ordinary to admit an institute, and the other as presentee of the patron who is left to defend his own right. And upon failure of the plaintiff in making out his own title, the defendant is put upon the proof of his, in order to obtain judgment for himself, if needful. But if the right be found for the plaintiff on the trial, three farther points are also to be inquired. 1. If the church be full, and if full, then of whose presentation? For if it be of the defendant's presentation, then the clerk is removable by writ brought in due time. Two of what value the living is, and this in order to assess the damages which are directed to be given by the statute of Westminster II, and three, in case of a plenity upon a usurpation, whether six calendar months have passed between the avoidance and the time of bringing the action. For then it would not be within the statute which permits an usurpation to be divested by a quare impedit brought infra tempus semestri, so that plenity is still a sufficient bar in action of quare impedit brought above six months after the vacancy happens, as it was universally by the common law, however early the action was commenced. If it be found that the plaintiff hath the right, and hath commenced his action in due time, then he shall have judgment to recover the presentation, and, if the church be full by institution of any clerk to remove him, unless it were filled pendente lite by lapse to the ordinary, he not being a party to the suit, in which case the plaintiff loses his presentation pro hoc vice, but shall recover two years full value of the church from the defendant, the pretended patron, as a satisfaction for the turn lost by his disturbance, or, in case of his insolvency, he shall be imprisoned for two years. But if the church remains still void at the end of the suit, then whichever party the presentation is found to belong to, whether plaintiff or defendant, shall have a writ directed to the bishop ad admittendum clericum, citing the judgment of the court and ordering him to admit and institute the clerk of the prevailing party, and, 
If upon this order he does not admit him, the patron may sue the bishop in a writ of quare non admisit, and recover ample satisfaction in damages. Besides these possessory actions, there may also be had, as hath before been incidentally mentioned, a writ of right of advowson, which resembles other writs of right, the only distinguishing advantage now attending it being that it is more conclusive than a quare impedit, since to an action of quare impedit a recovery had in a writ of right may be pleaded in bar. There is no limitation with regard to time within which any actions touching advowsons are to be brought, at least none later than the times of Richard I and Henry III, for by Statute 1, Marlborough, ST2, C5, the Statute of Limitations, 32, Henry VIII, C2, is declared not to extend to any writ of right of an advowson, quare impedit, or a seize of darian presentment, or jus patronatus. And this upon very good reason, because it may very easily happen that the title to an advowson may not come in question, nor the right have opportunity to be tried within sixty years, which is the longest period of limitation assigned by the statute of Henry the Eighth. For Sir Edward Coke tells us that there was a parson of one of his churches that had been incumbent there above fifty years, nor are instances wanting wherein two successive incumbents have continued for upwards of a hundred years. Had therefore the last of these incumbents been the clerk of a usurper, or had been presented by lapse, it would have been necessary and unavoidable for the patron, in case of a dispute, to have recurred back above a century in order to have shown a clear title and season by presentation and admission of the prior incumbent. But though, for these reasons, a limitation is highly improper with respect only to the length of time, yet, as the title of advowsons is, for want of some limitation, rendered more precarious than that of any other hereditament, it might not perhaps be amiss if a limitation were established with respect to the number of avoidances, or rather, if a limitation were compounded of the length of time and the number of avoidances together. For instance, if no season were admitted to be alleged in any of these writs of patronage, after sixty years and four avoidances were passed. In a writ of quare impedit, which is almost the only real action that remains in common use, and also in the assize of Darian presentment, and the writ of right, the patron only, and not the clerk, is allowed to sue the disturber. But by virtue of several acts of Parliament, there is one species of presentations in which a remedy to be sued in the temporal courts is put into the hands of the clerks presented, as well as of the owners of the advowson. I mean the presentation to such benefices as belong to Roman Catholic patrons, which, according to their several counties, are vested in and secured to the two universities of this kingdom, and particularly by the statute of 12 and st 2 c 14 s 4 a new method of proceeding is provided, viz., that besides the writs of quare impedit, which the universities as patrons are entitled to bring, they or their clerks, may be at liberty to file a bill in equity against any person presenting to such livings and disturbing their right of patronage or his chestwe que trust, or any other person whom they have cause to suspect in order to compel a discovery of any secret trusts for the benefit of papists in evasion of those laws whereby this right of advowson is vested in those learned bodies, and also by the statute 11, George II, to compel a discovery whether any grant or conveyance said to be made of such advowson were made bona fide to a Protestant purchaser for the benefit of Protestants and for a full consideration, without which requisites every such grant or conveyance of an advowson or avoidance is absolutely null and void. This is a particular law 
and calculated for a particular purpose. But in no instance but this does the common law permit the clerk himself to interfere in recovering a presentation of which he is afterwards to have the advantage. For besides that he has, as was before observed, no temporal right in him till after institution and induction, and, as he therefore can suffer no wrong, is consequently entitled to no remedy, this exclusion of the clerk from being plaintiff seems also to arise from the very great honor and regard which the law pays to his sacred function. For it looks upon the cure of souls as too arduous and important a task to be eagerly sought for by any serious clergyman, and therefore will not permit him to contend openly at law for a charge and trust which it presumes he undertakes with diffidence. But when the clerk is in full possession of the benefice, the law gives him the same possessory remedies to recover his glebe, his rents, his tithes, or other ecclesiastical dues by writ of entry, a seize, ejectment, debt, or trespass, as the case may happen, which it furnishes to the owners of lay property. Yet he shall not have a writ of right, nor such other familiar writs as are grounded upon the mere right, because he hath not in him the entire fee and right. But he is entitled to a special remedy called a writ of juris utrum, which is sometimes styled the parson's writ of right, being the highest writ which he can have. This lies for a parson or a prebendary at common law, and for a vicar by statute 14 Edward III c. 17, and is in the nature of an assize, to inquire whether the tenements in question are frankel mowing belonging to the church of the demandant, or else the lay fee of the tenant. And thereby the demandant may recover lands and tenements belonging to the church, which were aliened by the predecessor, or of which he was deceased, or which were recovered against him by verdict, confession, or default, without praying in aid of the patron and ordinary, or on any person who has intruded since the predecessor's death. But since the restraining statute of 13 Elizabeth c. 10, whereby the alienation of the predecessor or a recovery suffered by him of the lands of the church is declared to be absolutely void, this remedy is of very little use unless where the parson himself has been divorced for more than twenty years. For the successor, at any competent time after his accession to the benefice, may enter or bring an ejectment. End of chapter 16, part 2《Chapter Seventeen, Part One of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book Three, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Injuries Proceeding from or Affecting the Crown. Part 1. Having in the nine preceding chapters considered the injuries or private wrongs that may be offered by one subject to another, all of which are redressed by the command and authority of the king, signified by his original writs returnable in his several courts of justice, which thence derive a jurisdiction of examining and determining the complaint, I now proceed to inquire of the mode of redressing those injuries to which the crown itself is a party, which injuries are either where the crown is the aggressor, and which therefore cannot without a solecism admit of the same kind of remedy, or else is the sufferer, and which then are usually remedied by peculiar forms of process appropriated to the royal prerogative. In treating, therefore, of these, we will consider first the manner of redressing those wrongs or injuries which a subject may suffer from the crown, and then of redressing those which the crown may receive from a subject. 1. 
that the king can do no wrong is a necessary and fundamental principle of the English Constitution, meaning only, as has formerly been observed, that in the first place, whatever may be amiss in the conduct of public affairs is not chargeable personally on the king, nor is he but his ministers accountable for it to the people, and secondly, that the prerogative of the crown extends not to do any injury, for, being created for the benefit of the people, it cannot be exerted to their prejudice. Whenever, therefore, it happens that by misinformation or inadvertence the crown hath been induced to invade the private rights of any of its subjects, though no action will lie against the sovereign, for who shall command the king, yet the law hath furnished the subject with a decent and respectful mode of removing that invasion by informing the king of the true state of the matter in dispute, and, as it presumes that to know of an injury and to redress it are inseparable in the royal breast, it then issues, as of course, in the king's own name, his orders to his judges to do justice to the party aggrieved. The distance between the sovereign and his subjects is such that it rarely can happen that any personal injury can immediately and directly proceed from the prince to any private man, and, as it can so seldom happen, the law in decency supposes that it never will or can happen at all, because it feels itself incapable of furnishing any adequate remedy without infringing the dignity and destroying the sovereignty of the royal person by setting up some superior power with authority to call him to account. The inconveniency, therefore, of a mischief that is barely possible is, as Mr. Locke has observed, well recompensed by the peace of the public and security of the government, in the person of the chief magistrate being set out of the reach of coercion. But injuries to the rights of property can scarcely be committed by the crown without the intervention of its officers, for whom the law in matters of right entertains no respect or delicacy, but furnishes various methods of detecting the errors or misconduct of those agents by whom the king has been deceived and induced to do a temporary injustice. The common law methods of obtaining possession or restitution from the crown of either real or personal property are, one, by petition de droit, or petition of right, which is said to owe its original to King Edward I, two, by monstrans de droit, manifestation or plea of right, both of which may be preferred or prosecuted either in the chancery or exchequer. The former is of use where the king is in full possession of the hereditaments or chattels, and the party suggests such a right as controverts the title of the crown grounded on the facts disclosed in the petition itself, in which case he must be careful to state truly the whole title of the crown, otherwise the petition shall abate. And then, upon this answer being endorsed or underwritten by the king, soi droit fait el parti, let right be done to the party, a commission shall issue to inquire of the truth of the suggestion, after the return of which, the king's attorney is at liberty to plead and bar, and the merits shall be determined upon issue or demurrer, as in suits between subject and subject. Thus, if a deceaser of lands which are holden of the crown dies seized without any heir, whereby the king is prima facie entitled to the lands, and the possession is cast upon him either by inquest of office or by act of law without any office found. Now the deceased shall have a remedy by petition of right, suggesting the title of the crown and his own superior right before the decision made. But where the right of property, as well as the right of the crown, appears upon record, there the party shall have monstrans de droit, which is putting in a claim of right grounded on facts already acknowledged and established, and praying the judgment of the court whether upon those facts the king or the subject hath the right. As if, in the case before supposed, 
the whole special matter is found by an inquest of office, as well the deceasing as the dying without any heir, the party grieved shall have monstrans de droit at the common law. But as this seldom happens, and the remedy by petition was extremely tedious and expensive, that by monstrans was much enlarged and rendered almost universal by several statutes, particularly 36 Edward III, C13, and 2 and 3 Edward VI, C8, which also allow inquisitions of office to be traversed or denied wherever the right of a subject is concerned, except in very few cases. These proceedings are had in the petty bag office in the Court of Chancery, and, if upon either of them the right be determined against the crown, the judgment is quod manus domini regis amuviantor et possessio restituator potenti, salvo jure domine regis, which last clause is always added to judgments against the king to whom no latches is ever imputed and whose right is never defeated by any limitation or length of time and by such judgment the crown is instantly out of possession, so that there needs not the incident interposition of his own officers to transfer the season from the king to the party aggrieved. 2. The methods of redressing such injuries as the crown may receive from a subject are 1. By such usual common law actions as are consistent with the royal prerogative and dignity. As therefore the king, by reason of his legal ubiquity, cannot be deceased or dispossessed of any real property which is once vested in him, he can maintain no action which supposes a dispossession of the plaintiff, such as an assize or an ejectment, but he may bring a quare impedit, which always supposes the complainant to be seized or possessed of the advowson, and he may prosecute this writ as well as every other as well in the king's bench as the common pleas, or in whatever court he pleases, so too he may bring an action of trespass for taking away his goods, but not for breaking his close or any other injury done upon his soil or possession. It would be equally tedious and difficult to run through every minute distinction that might be gleaned from our ancient books with regard to this matter nor is it in any degree necessary, as much easier and more effectual remedies are usually obtained by such prerogative modes of process as are peculiarly confined to the crown. 2. Such is that of inquisition or inquest of office, which is an inquiry made by the king's officer, his sheriff, coroner, or a shedder, virtute officii, or by writ to them sent for that purpose, or by commissioners specially appointed concerning any matter that entitles the king to the possession of lands or tenements, goods or chattels. This is done by a jury of no determinate number, being either twelve or less or more, as to inquire whether the king's tenant for life died seized, whereby the reversion accrues to the king, whether a who held immediately of the crown, died without heirs, in which case the lands belong to the king by a shet, whether B be attainted of treason, whereby his estate is forfeited to the crown, whether C, who has purchased lands, be an alien, which is another cause of forfeiture, whether D be an idiot, a navitate, and therefore, together with his lands, appertains to the custody of the king and other questions of like import concerning both the circumstances of the tenant and the value or identity of the lands. These inquests of office were more frequently in practice than at present during the continuance of the military tenures amongst us, when, upon the death of every one of the king's tenants, an inquest of office was held, called an inquisito post-mortem, to inquire of what lands he died seized, who was his heir, and of what age, in order to entitle the king to his marriage, wardship, relief, premier season, or other advantages, as the circumstances of the case might turn out. 
To superintend and regulate these inquiries, the Court of Wards and Liveries was instituted by Statute 32 Henry VIII C46, which was abolished at the restoration of King Charles II together with the oppressive tenures upon which it was founded. With regard to other matters, the inquests of office still remain in force and are taken upon proper occasions, being extended not only to lands, but also to goods and chattels personal, as in the case of wreck, treasure trove, and the like, and especially as to forfeitures for offenses. For every jury which tries a man for treason or felony, every coroner's inquest that sits upon a fellow de se, or one killed by chance medley, is, not only with regard to chattels, but also as to real interests in all respects an inquest of office, and if they find the treason or felony, or even the flight of the party accused, though innocent, the king is thereupon, by virtue of his office found, entitled to have his forfeitures, and also, in the case of chance medley, he or his grantees are entitled to such things by way of deodand as have moved to the death of the party. These inquests of office were devised by law as an authentic means to give the king his right by solemn matter of record, without which he in general can neither take nor part from anything. For it is a part of the liberties of England, and greatly for the safety of the subject, that the king may not enter upon or seize any man's possessions upon bare surmises without the intervention of a jury. It is, however, particularly enacted by the statute 33 Henry VIII C. 20, that in case of attainder for high treason, the king shall have the forfeiture instantly without any inquisition of office. And... As the king hath no title at all to any property of this sort before office found, therefore by the statute 18 Henry the Sixth C6 it was enacted that all letters patent or grants of lands and tenements before office found or returned into the exchequer shall be void. And by the Bill of Rights at the Revolution, 1 William and Mary, ST2 C2, it is declared that all grants and promises of fines and forfeitures of particular persons before conviction, which is here the inquest of office, are illegal and void, which indeed was the law of the land in the reign of Edward III. With regard to real property, if an office be found for the king, it puts him in immediate possession, without the trouble of a formal entry, provided a subject in the like case would have had a right to enter and the king shall receive all the mean or intermediate profits from the time that his title accrued. As on the other hand, by the Articuli Super Cartus, if the king's a shedder or sheriff sees lands into the king's hand without cause, upon taking them out of the king's hand again, the party shall have the mean profits restored to him. In order to avoid the possession of the crown, acquired by the finding of such office, the subject may not only have his petition of right, which discloses new facts not found by the office, and his monstrans de droit, which relies on the facts as found, but also he may, for the most part, traverse or deny the matter of fact itself, and put it in a course of trial by the common law process of the court of chancery. Yet still, in some special cases, he hath no remedy left but a mere petition of right. These traverses, as well as the monstrans de droit, were greatly enlarged and regulated for the benefit of the subject by the statutes before mentioned and others. And in the traverses thus given by statute, which came in the place of the old petition of right, the party traversing is considered as the plaintiff and must therefore make out his own title as well as impeach that of the crown, and then shall have judgment, quod manus domini regis amoviantor, etc. 3. Where the crown hath unadvisedly granted anything by letters patent which ought not be granted, or where the patentee hath done an act that amounts to a forfeiture of the grant, 
The remedy to repeal this patent is by writ of Chire Facias in Chancery. This may be brought either on the part of the king in order to resume the thing granted, or, if the grant be injurious to a subject, the king is bound of right to permit him, upon his petition, the use of the royal name for repealing the patent in a Chire Facias. And so also, if upon office untruly found for the king, he grants the land over to another, he who is grieved thereby, and traverses the office itself, is entitled before issue joined to a shire facius against the patentee in order to avoid the grant. 4. An information on behalf of the crown, filed in the exchequer by the king's attorney general, is a method of suit for recovering money or other chattels, or for obtaining satisfaction and damages for any personal wrong committed in the lands or other possessions of the crown. It differs from an information filed in the Court of King's Bench, of which we shall treat in the next book, in that this is instituted to redress a private wrong, by which the property of the crown is affected, that is calculated to punish some public wrong or heinous misdemeanor in the defendant. It is grounded on no writ under seal, but merely on the intimation of the King's officer, the Attorney General, who gives the court to understand and be informed of the matter in question, upon which the party is put to answer and trial is had as in suits between subject and subject. The most usual informations are those of intrusion and debt, intrusion for any trespass committed on the lands of the crown, as by entering thereon without title, holding over after a lease is determined, taking the profits, cutting down timber, or the like, and debt upon any contract for monies due the king or for any forfeiture due to the crown upon the breach of a penal statute. This is most commonly used to recover forfeitures occasioned by transgressing those laws which are enacted for the establishment and support of the revenue. Others, which regard mere matters of police and public convenience, being usually left to be enforced by common informers in the qui tam informations or actions of which we have formerly spoken. But after the Attorney General has informed upon the breach of a penal law, no other information can be received. There is also an information in rem, when any goods are supposed to become the property of the crown, and no man appears to claim them, or to dispute the title of the king. As anciently, in the case of treasure trove, wrecks, waifs, and estrays, seized by the king's officer for his use. Upon such seizure, an information was usually filed in the king's exchequer, and thereupon a proclamation was made for the owner, if any, to come in and claim the effects, and at the same time there issued a commission of appraisement to value the goods in the officer's hands, and after the return of which a second proclamation had, if no claimant appeared, the goods were supposed derelict and condemned to the use of the crown. And when, in later times, forfeitures of the goods themselves, as well as personal penalties on the parties, were inflicted by Act of Parliament for transgressions against the laws of the customs and excise, the same process was adopted in order to secure such forfeited goods for the public use, though the offender himself had escaped the reach of justice. End of Chapter 17, Part 1《Chapter 17, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Injuries Proceeding From or Affecting the Crown, Part 2. 5. A writ of quo waranto is in the nature of a writ of right for the king, 
against him who claims or usurps any office, franchise, or liberty, to inquire by what authority he supports his claim in order to determine the right. It lies also in the case of non-user or long neglect of a franchise, or misuser or abuse of it, being a writ commanding the defendant to show by what warrant he exercises such a franchise, having never had any grant of it, or having forfeited it by neglect or abuse. This was originally returnable before the King's Justices at Westminster, but afterwards only before the justices in Eyre, by virtue of the statutes of Quo Waranto, 6 Edward I, C1, and 18 Edward I, St2. But since those justices have given place to the king's temporary commissioners of assize, the judges on the several circuits, this branch of the statutes hath lost its effect, and writs of Quo Waranto, if brought at all, must now be prosecuted and determined before the king's justices at Westminster. And in case of judgment for the defendant, he shall have an allowance of his franchise. But in case of judgment for the king, for that the party is entitled to no such franchise, or hath disused or abused it, the franchise is either seized into the king's hands to be granted out again to whomever he shall please, or if it be not such a franchise as may subsist in the hands of the crown, there is merely judgment of ouster to turn out the party who usurped it. The judgment on the writ of quo waranto, being in the nature of a writ of right, is final and conclusive even against the crown, which together with the length of its process probably occasioned that disuse into which it is now fallen, and introduced a more modern method of prosecution by information filed in the court of King's Bench by the Attorney General in the nature of a writ of quo waranto, wherein the process is speedier and the judgment not quite so decisive. This is properly a criminal method of prosecution, as well to punish the usurper by a fine for the usurpation of the franchise as to oust him, or seize it for the crown, but hath long been applied to the mere purposes of trying the civil right, seizing the franchise, or ousting the wrongful possessor, the fine being nominal only. During the violent proceedings that took place in the latter end of the reign of King Charles the Second, it was among other things thought expedient to new model most of the corporation towns in the kingdom, for which purpose Many of those bodies were persuaded to surrender their charters, and informations in the nature of quo waranto were brought against others upon supposed or frequently a real forfeiture of their franchises by neglect or abuse of them. And the consequence was that the liberties of most of them were seized into the hands of the king, who granted them fresh charters with such alterations as were thought expedient. And during their state of anarchy, the crown named all their magistrates. This exertion of power, though perhaps in sumo iure, it was for the most part strictly legal, gave a great and just alarm, the new modeling of all corporations being a very large stride towards establishing arbitrary power, and therefore, it was thought necessary at the revolution to bridle this branch of the prerogative, at least so far as regarded the metropolis, by statute 2, William and Mary, C. 8, which enacts that the franchises of the City of London shall never be forfeited again for any cause whatsoever. This proceeding is, however, now applied to the decision of corporate disputes between party and party without any intervention of the prerogative, by virtue of the statute 9 and C20, which permits an information in the nature of quo waranto to be brought with leave of the court at the relation of any person desiring to prosecute the same, who is then styled the relator, against any person usurping, intruding into, or unlawfully holding any franchise or office in any city borough or town corporate, provides for its speedy determination, 
and directs that, if the defendant be convicted, judgment of ouster as well as a fine may be given against him, and that the relator shall pay or receive costs according to the event of the suit. 6. The writ of mandamus is also made by the same statute 9 and C20, a most full and effectual remedy, in the first place for refusal of admission where a person is entitled to an office or place in any such corporation, and secondly, for wrongful removal when a person is legally possessed. These are injuries for which, though redress for the party interested may be had by a seize or other means, yet as the franchise concerns the public and may affect the administration of justice, this prerogative writ also issues from the Court of King's Bench, commanding, upon good cause shown to the Court, the party complaining to be admitted or restored to his office. And the statute requires that a return be immediately made to the first writ of mandamus, which return may be pleaded to or traversed by the prosecutor, and his antagonist may reply, take issue, or demur, and the same proceedings may be had as if an action on the case had been brought for making a false return, and after judgment obtained for the prosecutor, he shall have a peremptory writ of mandamus to compel his admission or restitution, which latter, in the case of an action, is effected by a writ of restitution, so that now the writ of mandamus, in cases within this statute, is in the nature of an action, and a writ of error may be had thereon. This writ of mandamus may also be issued in pursuance of the statute 11 George I C4, in case within the regular time no election shall be made of the mayor or other chief officer of any city, borough, or town corporate, or, being made, it shall afterwards become void, to require the electors to proceed to election, and proper courts to be held for admitting and swearing in the magistrates so respectively chosen. We have now gone through the whole circle of civil injuries and the redress which the laws of England have anxiously provided for each, in which the student cannot but observe that the main difficulty which attends their discussion arises from their great variety, which is apt at our first acquaintance to breed a confusion of ideas, a kind of distraction in the memory, a difficulty not a little increased by the very immethodical arrangement too justly complained of in our ancient writers, but which will insensibly wear away when they come to be reconsidered, and we are a little familiarized to those terms of art in which the language of our ancestors has obscured them. Terms of art there will unavoidably be in all sciences, the easy conception and thorough comprehension of which must depend upon frequent use, and the more subdivided any branch of science is, the more terms must be used to express the nature of these several subdivisions, and mark out with sufficient precision the ideas they are meant to convey. This difficulty, therefore, however great it may appear at first view, will shrink to nothing upon a nearer approach and be rather advantageous than of any difference, by imprinting a clear and distinct notion of the nature of these several remedies. And, such as it is, it arises principally from the excellence of our English laws, which adapt their redress exactly to the circumstances of the injury, and do not furnish one and the same action for different wrongs, which are impossible to be brought within one and the same description whereby every man knows what satisfaction he is entitled to expect from the courts of justice, and as little as possible is left in the breast of the judges, whom the law appoints to administer and not to prescribe the remedy. And I may venture to affirm that there is hardly a possible injury that can be offered either to the person or property of another for which the party injured may not find a remedial writ conceived in such terms as are properly adapted to his own particular grievance. In the several personal actions which we have cursorily explained as debt, 
trespass, detinue, action on the case, and the like, it is easy to observe how plain, perspicuous, and simple the remedy is as chalked out by the ancient common law. In real actions for the recovery of landed and other permanent property, as the right is more intricate, the feudal or rather Norman remedy by real actions is somewhat more complex and difficult and attended with some delays. And since, in order to obviate those difficulties and retrench those delays, we have permitted the rights of real property to be drawn into question in mixed or personal suits, we are, it must be owned, obliged to have recourse to such arbitrary fictions and expedients that unless we had developed their principles and traced out their progress in history, our present system of remedial jurisprudence in respect of landed property would appear the most intricate and unnatural that ever was adopted by a free and enlightened people. But this intricacy of our legal process will be found, when attentively considered, to be one of those troublesome but not dangerous evils which have their root in the frame of our Constitution, and which therefore can never be cured without hazarding everything that is dear to us. In absolute governments, when new arrangements of property and the gradual change of manners have destroyed the original ideas on which the laws were devised and established, the prince, by his edict, may promulge a new code more suited to the present emergencies. But when laws are to be framed by popular assemblies, even of the representative kind, it is too Herculean a task to begin the work of legislation afresh and extract a new system from the discordant opinions of more than 500 counselors. A single legislator, or an enterprising sovereign, a Solon or Lysurgis, a Justinian or a Frederick, may at any time form a concise and perhaps an uniform plan of justice, and evil betide that presumptuous subject who questions its wisdom or utility. But who that is acquainted with the difficulty of new modeling any branch of our statute laws, though relating but to roads or to parish settlements, will conceive it ever feasible to alter any fundamental point of the common law with all its appendages and consequence, and set up another rule in its stead. When, therefore, by the gradual influence of foreign trade and domestic tranquility, the spirit of our military tenures began to decay, and at length the whole structure was removed, the judges quickly perceived that the forms and delays of the old feudal actions, guarded with their several outworks of assoins, vouchers, aid prayers, and a hundred other formidable entrenchments, were ill-suited to that more simple and commercial mode of property which succeeded the former and required a more speedy decision of right to facilitate exchange and alienation. Yet they wisely avoided soliciting any great legislative revolution in the old established forms which might have been productive of consequences more numerous and extensive than the most penetrating genius could foresee, but left them as they were to languish in obscurity and oblivion, and endeavored by a series of minute contrivances to accommodate such personal actions as were then in use to all the most useful purposes of remedial justice, and where, through the dread of innovation, they hesitated at going so far as perhaps their good sense would have prompted them, they left an opening for the more liberal and enterprising judges who have sate in our courts of equity to show them their error by supplying the omissions of the courts of law. And since the new expedients have been refined by the practice of more than a century, and are sufficiently known and understood, they in general answer the purpose of doing speedy and substantial justice much better than could now be effected by any great fundamental alterations. The only difficulty that attends them arises from their fictions and circuities, but, when once we have discovered the proper clue, that labyrinth is easily pervaded. We inherit an old Gothic castle, erected in the days of chivalry, but fitted up for a modern inhabitant. 
The moated ramparts, the embattled towers, and the trophied halls are magnificent and venerable, but useless. The inferior apartments, now converted into rooms of convenience, are cheerful and commodious, though their approaches are winding and difficult. In this part of our disquisitions I, however, thought it my duty to unfold, as far as intelligibly I could, the nature of these real actions as well as of personal remedies. And this not only because they are still in force, still the law of England, though obsolete and disused, and may perhaps, in their turn, be hereafter with some necessary corrections called out again into common use, but also because, as a sensible writer has well observed, whoever considers how great a coherence there is between the several parts of the law, and how much the reason of one case opens and depends upon that of another, will, I presume, be far from thinking any of the old learning useless, which will so much conduce to the perfect understanding of the modern. And besides, I should have done great injustice to the founders of our legal constitution had I led the student to imagine that the remedial instruments of our law were originally contrived in so complicated a form as we now present them to his view. Had I, for instance, entirely passed over the direct and obvious remedies by assizes and writs of entry, and only laid before him the modern method of prosecuting a writ of ejectment. End of chapter 17, part 2「Eighteen of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book Three by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Pursuit of Remedies by Action, and First of the Original Writ. Having, under the head of redress by suit in courts, pointed out in the preceding pages, in the first place, the nature and several species of courts of justice, wherein remedies are administered for all sorts of private wrongs, and, in the second place, shown to which of these courts in particular application must be made for redress according to the distinction of the injuries, or, in other words, what wrongs are cognizable by one court and what by another. I proceeded, under the title of injuries cognizable by the courts of common law, to define and explain the special remedies by action provided for every possible degree of wrong or injury, as well as such remedies as are dormant and out of use as those which are in every day's practice, apprehending that the reason of the one could never be clearly comprehended without some acquaintance with the other. And I am now, in the last place, to examine the manner in which these several remedies are pursued and applied by action in the courts of common law to which I shall afterwards subjoin a brief account of the proceedings in courts of equity. In treating of remedies by action at common law, I shall confine myself to the modern method of practice in our courts of judicature. For though I thought it necessary to throw out a few observations on the nature of real actions, however at present disused, in order to demonstrate the coherence and uniformity of our legal constitution, and that there was no injury so obstinate and inveterate, but which might in the end be eradicated by some or other of those remedial writs, yet it would be too irksome a talk to perplex both my readers and myself with explaining all the rules of proceeding in these obsolete actions, which are frequently mere positive establishments, the forma et figura judici, and conduce very little to illustrate the reason and fundamental grounds of the law. Wherever I apprehend they may at all conduce to this end, I shall endeavor to hint at them incidentally. What, therefore, the student may expect in this and succeeding chapters is an account of the method of proceeding in and prosecuting a suit upon any of the personal writs we have before spoken of, 
in the Court of Common Pleas at Westminster, that being the court originally constituted for the prosecution of all civil actions. It is true that the courts of King's Bench and Exchequer, in order, without entrenching upon ancient forms, to extend their remedial influence to the necessities of modern times, have now obtained a concurrent jurisdiction and cognizance of civil suits. But as causes are therein conducted by much the same advocates and attorneys, and the several courts and their judges have an entire communication with each other, the methods and forms of proceeding are in all material respects the same in all of them. So that, in giving an abstract or history of the progress of a suit through the Court of Common Pleas, we shall at the same time give a general account of the proceedings of the other two courts, taking notice, however, of any considerable difference in the local practice of each. And the same abstract will, moreover, afford us some general idea of the conduct of a cause in the inferior courts of common law, those in cities and boroughs, or in the court baron, or hundred, or county court, all of which conform, as near as may be, to the example of the superior tribunals to which their causes may probably be, in some stage or another, removed. The most natural and perspicuous way of considering the subject before us will be, I apprehend, to pursue it in the order and method wherein the proceedings themselves follow each other, rather than to distract and subdivide it by any more logical analysis. In general, therefore, an orderly parts of a suit are these. 1. The original writ. 2. The process. 3. The pleadings. 4. The issue or demurrer. 5. The trial. 6. The judgment and its incidents. 7. The proceedings in nature of appeals. 8. The execution. First, then, of the original or original writ, which is the beginning or foundation of the suit. When a person hath received an injury, and thinks it worth his while to demand the satisfaction for it, he is to consider with himself, or take advice, what redress the law has given for that injury, and thereupon is to make an application or suit to the crown, the fountain of all justice, for that particular specific remedy which he is determined or advised to pursue. As for money due on bond, an action on debt. For goods detained without force, an action of detinue or trover. Or, if taken with force, an action of trespass v. et armis. Or, to try the title of lands, a writ of entry or action of trespass in ejectment. Or, for any consequential injury received, a special action on the case. To this end, he is to sue out or purchase by paying the stated fees an original or original writ from the Court of Chancery, which is the Officina Justitiae, the shop or mint of justice, wherein all the king's writs are framed. It is a mandatory letter from the king in parchment, sealed with his great seal, and directed to the sheriff of the county wherein the injury is committed or supposed so to be, requiring him to command the wrongdoer or party accused either to do justice to the complainant or else to appear in court and answer the accusation against him. Whatever the sheriff does in pursuance of this writ, he must return or certify to the court of common pleas together with the writ itself which is the foundation of the jurisdiction of that court, being the king's warrant for the judges to proceed to the determination of the cause. For it was a maxim introduced by the Normans that there should be no proceedings in common pleas before the king's justices without his original writ, because they held it unfit that those justices, being only the substitutes of the crown, should take cognizance of anything but what was thus expressly referred to their judgment. However, in small actions below the value of forty shillings which are brought in the court baron or county court, no royal writ is necessary. But the foundation of such suits continues to be, as in the times of the Saxons, not by original writ, but by plaint, 
that is, by a private memorial tendered in open court to the judge, wherein the party injured sets forth his cause of action, and the judge is bound of common right to administer justice therein without any special mandate from the king. Now, indeed, even the royal writs are held to be demandable of common right on paying the usual fee, for any delay in granting them or in setting an unusual or exorbitant price upon them would be a breach of Magna Carta C-29, Nulli vendimus, nulli negabimus, aut deferemus justitium vel rectum. Original writs are either optional or peremptory, or, in the language of our law, they are either a preecipi or a si te feceret securum. The preecipi is in the alternative commanding the defendant to do the thing required or show the reason wherefore he hath not done it. The use of this writ is where something certain is demanded by the plaintiff which is in the power of the defendant himself to perform, as to restore the possession of land, to pay a certain liquidated debt, to perform a specific covenant, to render an account, and the like. In all which cases the writ is drawn up in the form of a preachipi or command, to do thus or show cause to the contrary, giving the defendant his choice to redress the injury or stand the suit. The other species of original writ is called a si fecere te securum, from the words of the writ, which directs the sheriff to cause the defendant to appear in court without any option given him, provided the plaintiff gives the sheriff security effectually to prosecute his claim. The writ is in use where nothing is specifically demanded but only a satisfaction in general, to obtain which and minister complete redress the intervention of some judicature is necessary. Such are writs of trespass or on the case, wherein no debt or other specific thing is sued for in certain, but only damages to be assessed by a jury. For this end, the defendant is immediately called upon to appear in court, provided the plaintiff gives good security of prosecuting his claim. Both species of writs are test or witnessed in the king's own name, witness ourself at Westminster, or wherever the chancery may be held. The security here spoken of to be given by the plaintiff for prosecuting his claim is common to both writs though it gives denomination only to the latter. The whole of it is at present become a mere matter of form, and John Doe and Richard Rowe are always returned as the standing pledges for this purpose. The ancient use of them was to answer for the plaintiff, who in case he brought an action without cause or failed in the prosecution of it when brought, was liable to an immersement from the Crown for raising a false accusation and so the form of judgment still is. In like manner, as by the Gothic constitutions, no person was permitted to lay a complaint against another, nisi subscriptora aut specificationi trium testium, quod actionum velet persequi, and, as by the laws of Sancho I, king of Portugal, damages were given against the plaintiff who prosecuted a groundless action. The day on which the defendant is ordered to appear in court, and on which the sheriff is to bring in the writ and report how far he has obeyed it, is called the return of the writ, it being then returned by him to the king's justices at Westminster. And it is always made returnable at the distance of at least fifteen days from the date or testy, that the defendant may have time to come up to Westminster even from the most remote parts of the kingdom, and upon some day in one of the four terms in which the court sits for the dispatch of business. These terms are supposed by Mr. Selden to have been instituted by William the Conqueror. But Sir Henry Spellman hath clearly and learnedly shown that they were gradually formed from the canonical constitutions of the Church being indeed no other than those leisure seasons of the year which were not occupied by the great festivals or fasts or which, 
were not liable to the general avocations of rural business. Throughout all Christendom, in very early times, the whole year was one continual term for hearing and deciding causes. For the Christian magistrates to distinguish themselves from the heathens, who were extremely superstitious in the observation of their dies fasti et nefasti, went to a contrary extreme and administered justice upon all days alike, till at length the church interposed and exempted certain holy seasons from being profaned by the tumult of forensic litigations. As particularly, the time of Advent and Christmas, which gave rise to the winter vacation, the time of Lent and Easter, which created that in the spring, the time of Pentecost, which produced the third, and the long vacation between Midsummer and Michaelmas, which was allowed for the hay time and harvest, all Sundays also, and some peculiar festivals, as the days of the purification, ascension, and some others were included in the same prohibition, which was established by a canon of the church, A.D. 517, and was fortified by an imperial constitution of the younger Theodosius, comprised in the Theodician Code. Afterwards, when our own legal constitution came to be settled, the commencement and duration of all law terms were appointed with an eye towards those canonical prohibitions, and it was ordered by the laws of King Edward the Confessor that from Advent to the octave of the Epiphany, from Septuagesima to the octave of Easter, from the Ascension to the octave of Pentecost, and from three in the afternoon of all Saturdays till Monday morning, the peace of God and of the Holy Church shall be kept throughout all the kingdom. And so extravagant was afterwards the regard that was paid to these holy times, that though the author of the mirror mentions only one vacation of any considerable length, containing the months of August and September, yet Britain is express that in the reign of King Edward I, no secular plea could be held, nor any man sworn on the evangelists in the times of Advent, Lent, Pentecost, Harvest, and Vintage, the days of the great litanies and all the solemn festivals. But he adds that the bishops and prelates did nevertheless grant dispensations, of which many are preserved in Reimer's Feodora at the time of King Henry III, that assizes and juries might be taken in some of these holy seasons upon reasonable occasions. And soon afterwards a general dispensation was established in Parliament by Statute Westminster I, 3, Edward I, C. 51, which declares that for so much as it is a great charity to do right unto all men at all times when need shall be, by the assent of all the prelates it was provided that assizes of novel the season, Mort de Anchester, and Darren presentment should be taken in Advent, Septu Adjusima, and Lent, even as well as inquests may be taken, and that at the special request of the king to the bishops. The portions of time that were not included within these prohibited seasons fell naturally into a fourfold division, and from some festival or saint's day that immediately preceded their commencement were denominated with the terms of St. Hilary, of Easter, of the Holy Trinity, and of St. Michael, which terms have been since regulated and abbreviated by several acts of Parliament particularly Trinity term by Statute 32, Henry VIII, C2, and Michaelmas term by Statute 16, Charles I, C6, and again by Statute 24, George II, C48. There are in each of these terms stated days called days in bank, dias in banco, that is, days of appearance in the court of common pleas, called usually bancum, or commune bancum, to distinguish it from bancum regis, or the court of king's bench. They are generally at the distance of about a week from each other, and regulated by some festival of the church. 
on some one of these days in bank, all original writs must be made returnable, and therefore they are generally called the returns of that term, whereof every term has more or less said by the mirror to have been originally fixed by King Alfred, but certainly settled as early as the statute of 51 Henry III, St. 2. But though many of the return days are fixed upon Sundays, yet the court never sits to receive these returns till the Monday after, and therefore no proceedings can be had, or judgment can be given, or supposed to be given, on the Sunday. The first return in every term is, properly speaking, the first day in that term, as, for instance, the octave of St. Hilary, or the eighth day inclusive after the feasts of that saint, which falling on the 13th of January, the octave therefore, or first day of Hilary term, is the 20th of January. And thereon the court sits to take a soins, or excuses for such as do not appear according to the summons of the writ. Wherefore, this is usually called the assoin day of the term. But the person summoned has three days of grace beyond the return of the writ in which to make his appearance, and if he appears on the fourth day inclusive, the quarto de post, it is sufficient. For our sturdy ancestors held it beneath the condition of a freeman to be obliged to appear or to do any other act at the precise time appointed or required. The feudal law, therefore, always allowed three distinct days of citation before the defendant was adjudged contumacious for not appearing, preserving in this respect the German custom of which Tacitus thus speaks, Illud ex libertate vitium, quod non simul nec usi conveniunt, sed et alter et tertius dies concactioni coentem absumitur and a similar indulgence prevailed in the Gothic constitution. Illud enem nime libertatis indicium, concessa totis impunitas non perendi, nec enem trinis judici concessibus, eonum perdite causae contumax meruit. Therefore, at the beginning of each term, the court does not sit for dispatch of business till the fourth day, as in Hillary term on the 23rd of January, and in Trinity term by the statute 32 Henry VIII C21, not till the sixth day, which is therefore usually called and set down in the almanacs as the first day of the term. End of chapter 18of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Process, Part 1. The next step for carrying on the suit, after suing out the original, is called the process, being the means of compelling the defendant to appear in court. This is sometimes called original process, being founded upon the original writ, and also to distinguish it from mean or intermediate process, which issues pending the suit upon some collateral interlocutory matter, as to summon juries, witnesses, and the like. Mean process is also sometimes put in contradistinction to final process, or process of execution, and then it signifies all such process as intervenes between the beginning and end of a suit. But process, as we are now to consider it, is the method taken by the law to compel a compliance with an original writ, of which the primary step is by giving the party notice to obey it. The notice is given upon all real preachipes and also upon personal writs for injuries not against the peace by summons, which is a warning to appear in court at the return of the original writ given to the defendant by two of the sheriff's messengers called summoners, either in person or left at his house or land, in like manner as in the civil law 
The first process is by personal citation in jus vocando. This warning on the land is given in real actions by erecting a white stick or wand on the defendant's grounds. Which stick or wand among the northern nations is called oculus nunciatorius, and by statute 31 Elizabeth C3, it must also be proclaimed on some Sunday before the door of the parish church. If the defendant disobeys this verbal monition, the next process is by writ of attachment or pon, so called from the words of the writ, pon per varium et salvos plegios, put by gauge and safe pledges A and B, the defendant, etc. This is a writ, not issuing out of chancery, but out of the court of common pleas, being grounded on the non-appearance of the defendant at the return of the original writ, and thereby the sheriff is commanded to attach him by taking gauge, that is, certain of his goods, which he shall forfeit if he doth not appear, or by making him find safe pledges or sureties who shall be immersed in case of his non-appearance. This is also the first and immediate process without any previous summons upon actions of trespass v et armis or for other injuries which though not forcible are yet trespasses against the peace as deceit and conspiracy, where the violence of the wrong requires a more speedy remedy and therefore the original writ commands the defendant to be at once attached without any precedent warning. If after attachment, the defendant neglects to appear. He not only forfeits this security, but is moreover to be farther compelled by writ of distringas, or distress, infinite, which is a subsequent process issuing from the court of common pleas, commanding the sheriff to distrain the defendant from time to time, and continually afterwards, by taking his goods and the profits of his lands, which he forfeits to the king, if he doth not appear. In like manner, as by the civil law, if the defendant absconds, so that the citation is of no effect, metitor adversarias in possessionem bonorum ejus. And here by the common, as well as the civil law, the process ended in case of injuries without force. The defendant, if he had any substance, being gradually stripped of it by all repeated distresses, till he rendered obedience to the king's writ. And, if he had no substance, the law held him incapable of making satisfaction, and therefore looked upon all further process as nugatory. And besides, upon feudal principles, the person of a feudatory was not liable to be attached for injuries merely civil, lest thereby his lord should be deprived of his personal services. But in case of injury accompanied by force, the law, to punish the breach of the peace and prevent its disturbance for the future, provided also a process against the defendant's person, in case he neglected to appear upon the former process of attachment, or had no substance whereby to be attached, subjecting his body to imprisonment by the writ of copious ad respondendum. But this immunity of the defendant's person, in case of peaceable though fraudulent injuries, producing great contempt of the law in indigent wrongdoers, a copious was also allowed to arrest the person in actions of account, though no breach of the peace be suggested, by the statutes of Marlbridge, 52 Henry III, c. 23, and Westminster II, 13 Edward I, c. 11, in actions of debt and detinue, by statute 25 Edward III, c. 17, and in all actions on the case, by statute 19 Henry VII, c. 9, before which last statute a practice had been introduced of commencing the suit by bringing an original writ of trespass, quare clausum fregit, for breaking the plaintiff's close, v et armis, which by the old common law subjected the defendant's person to be arrested by writ of copius, and then afterwards, by connivance of the court, the plaintiff might proceed to prosecute for any other less forcible injury. 
This practice, though custom rather than necessity, and for saving some trouble and expense in suing out a special original adapted to the particular injury, still continues in almost all cases except in actions of debt, though now, by virtue of the statutes above cited and others, a copyist might be had upon almost every species of complaint. If, therefore, the defendant being summoned or attached makes the fault and neglects to appear, or if the sheriff returns a knee heel, or that the defendant hath nothing whereby he may be summoned, attached, or distrained, the copyist now usually issues, being a writ commanding the sheriff to take the body of the defendant if he be found in his bailiwick or county, and him safely to keep so that he may have him in court on the day of the return to answer to the plaintiff of a plea of debt, or trespass, etc., as the case may be. This writ, and all others subsequent to the original writ, not issuing out of chancery, but from the court into which the original was returnable, and being grounded on what has passed in that court in consequence of the sheriff's return, are called judicial, not original writs. They issue under the private seal of that court, and not under the great seal of England, and are test not in the king's name, but in that of the chief justice only. And these several writs, being grounded on the sheriff's return, must respectively bear date and the same day on which the writ immediately preceding was returnable. This is the regular and orderly method of process, but it is now usual in practice to sue out the copyist in the first instance upon a supposed return of the sheriff, especially if it be suspected that the defendant, upon notice of action, will abscond and afterwards a fictitious original is drawn up with a proper return thereupon in order to give the proceedings a color of regularity. When this copyist is delivered to the sheriff, he by his undersheriff grants a warrant to his inferior officers or bailiffs to execute it on the defendant. And if the sheriff of Oxfordshire, in which county the injury is supposed to be committed and the action is laid, cannot find the defendant in his jurisdiction, he returns that he is not found, non est inventus, in his bailiwick. Whereupon another writ issues, called a testatum copius, directed to the sheriff of the county where the defendant is supposed to reside, as of Berkshire, reciting the former writ, and that it is testified testatum est, that the defendant lurks or wanders in his bailiwick, Wherefore, he is commanded to take him as in the former copyist. But here also, when the action is brought in one county and the defendant lives in another, it is usual for saving trouble, time, and expense to make out a testatum copyist at the first, supposing not only an original, but also a former copyist to have been granted, which in fact never was. And this fiction, being beneficial to all parties, is readily acquiesced in and is now become the settled practice, being one among many instances to illustrate that maxim of law, that in fictione juris consistit aequitas. But where a defendant absconds, and the plaintiff would proceed to an outlawry against him, an original writ must then be sued out regularly, and after that a copyist. And if the sheriff cannot find the defendant upon the first writ of copyist, and returns a non este inventus, there issues out an alias writ, and after that a pluris, to the same effect as the former. Only after these words we command you, this clause is inserted, as we have formerly, or as we have often commanded you, secut alias, or secut pluris praecipimus, and if a non est inventus is returned upon all of them, then a writ of exigent, or exigi facias, may be sued out, 
which requires the sheriff to cause the defendant to be proclaimed, required, or exacted in five county courts successively to render himself, and if he does, then to take him as in a copious. But if he does not appear and is returned quinto exactus, he shall then be outlawed by the coroners of the county. Also by statute 6 Henry VIII C4 and 31 Elizabeth C3, whether the defendant dwells in the same county or another county than that wherein the exigent is sued out, a writ of proclamation shall issue out at the same time with the exigent, commanding the sheriff of the county wherein the defendant dwells to make three proclamations thereof in places the most notorious and most likely to come to his knowledge a month before the outlawry shall take place. Such outlawry is putting a man out of the protection of the law, so that he is incapable to bring any action for redress of injuries, and it is also attended with a forfeiture of all one's goods and chattels to the king. And therefore, till some time after the conquest, no man could be outlawed but for felony, but in Bracton's time, and somewhat earlier, process of outlawry was ordained to lie in all actions for trespasses v et armis. And since, by a variety of statutes, the same which allow the writ of copious before mentioned, process of outlawry doth lie in diverse actions that are merely civil, provided they be commenced by original and not by bill. If after outlawry the defendant appears publicly, he may be arrested by a writ of copious ut legatum, and committed till the outlawry be reversed, which reversal may be had by the defendant's appearing personally in court and in the king's bench without any personal appearance so that he appears by attorney according to statute 4 and 5 William and Mary C18, and any plausible cause, however slight, will in general be sufficient to reverse it, it being considered only as a process to compel an appearance. But then the defendant must pay full costs and put the plaintiff in the same condition as if he had appeared before the writ of exigi facius was awarded. Such is the first process in the Court of Common Pleas. In the King's Bench they may also, and frequently do, proceed in certain causes, particularly in actions of ejectment and trespass, by original writ, with attachment and copious thereon, returnable, not at Westminster, where the common pleas are now fixed in consequence of Magna Carta, but ubicumque fuerimus in Anglia. Wheresoever the king shall then be in England, the king's bench being removable to any part of England at the pleasure and discretion of the crown. But the more usual method of proceeding therein is without any original, but by a peculiar species of process entitled a Bill of Middlesex, and therefore so entitled because the court now sits in that county. For if it say in Kent, it would then be a Bill of Kent. For though, as the justices of this court have, by its fundamental constitution, power to determine all offenses and trespasses by the common law and custom of the realm, it needed no original writ from the crown to give it cognizance of any misdemeanor in the county wherein it resides. Yet, as by this court's coming into any county, it immediately superseded the ordinary administration of justice by the general commissions of Iyer and of Oyer and Terminer, a process of its own became necessary within the county where it sat to bring in such persons as were accused of committing any forcible injury. The Bill of Middlesex is the kind of copious directed to the sheriff of that county and commanding him to take the defendant and have him before our lord the king at Westminster on a day prefixed to answer to the plaintiff of a plea of trespass. For this accusation of trespass it is, that gives the court of King's Bench jurisdiction in other civil causes, as was formerly observed, since when once the defendant is taken into custody of the marshal or prison keeper of this court, for the supposed trespass, 
he, being then a prisoner of this court, may here be prosecuted for any other species of injury. Yet, in order to found this jurisdiction, it is not necessary that the defendant be actually the marshal's prisoner, for as soon as he appears or puts in bail to the process, he is deemed by so doing to be in such custody of the marshal as will give the court a jurisdiction to proceed. And upon these accounts, in the bill or process, a complaint of trespass is always suggested, whatever else may be the real cause of action. This bill of Middlesex must be served on the defendant by the sheriff if he finds him in that county. But if he returns, non est inventus, then there issues out a writ of latitat to the sheriff of another county, as Berks, which is similar to the testatum copius in the common pleas, and recites the bill of Middlesex and the proceedings thereon, and that it is testified that the defendant, latitat et discorit, lurks and wanders about in Berks, and therefore commands the sheriff to take him and have his body in court on the day of the return. But as in the common pleas, the testatum copius may be sued out upon only a supposed and not an actual preceding copius. So in King's Bench, a latitat is usually sued out upon only a supposed and not an actual bill of Middlesex. So that, in fact, a latitat may be called the first process in the court of King's Bench as the testatum copius is in the common pleas. Yet, as in the common pleas, if the defendant lives in the county wherein the action is laid, a common copyist suffices. So in the king's bench likewise, if he lives in Middlesex, the process must still be by bill of Middlesex only. In the exchequer, the first process is by writ of quo minus, in order to give the court a jurisdiction over pleas between party and party, in which writ, the plaintiff is alleged to be the king's farmer or debtor, and that the defendant have done him the injury complained of, quo minus sufficiens explicit, by which he is less able to pay the king his rent or debt, and upon this the defendant may be arrested upon a copyist from the common pleas. End of chapter 19, part 1. Chapter 19, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Process, Part 2. Thus differently do all three courts set out at first in the commencement of a suit, for which the reason is obvious, since by this means the two courts of King's Bench and Exchequer entitle themselves to hold plea in subjects' causes, which by the original constitution of Westminster Hall they were not empowered to do. Afterwards, when the cause is once drawn into the respective courts, the method of pursuing it is pretty much the same in all of them. If the sheriff has found the defendant upon any of the former writs, the copyist, latitat, etc., he was anciently obliged to take him into custody in order to produce him in court upon the return, however small and minute the cause of action might be. For not having obeyed the original summons, he had shown a contempt of the court and was no longer to be trusted at large. But when the summons fell into disuse, and the copyas became in fact the first process, it was thought hard to imprison a man for contempt which was only supposed, and therefore, in common cases by the gradual indulgence of the courts, at length authorized by Statute 12, George I, C. 29, which was amended by Statute 5, George II, C. 27, and made perpetual by Statute 21, George II, C. 3, 
The sheriff or his officer can now only personally serve the defendant with a copy of the writ or process, and with notice in writing to appear by his attorney in court to defend this action, which in effect reduces it to a mere summons. And if the defendant thinks proper to appear upon this notice, his appearance is recorded, and he puts in sureties for his future attendance and obedience, which sureties are called common bail, being the same two imaginary persons that were pledges for the plaintiff's prosecution, John Doe and Richard Rowe. Or, if the defendant does not appear upon the return of the writ, or within four, or in some cases eight, days after, the plaintiff may enter an appearance for him as if he had really appeared, and may file common bail in the defendant's name and proceed thereupon as if the defendant had done it himself. But if the plaintiff will make affidavit or assert upon oath that the cause of action amounts to ten pounds or upwards, then in order to arrest the defendant and make him put in substantial sureties for his appearance called special bail, it is required by statute 13 Charles II SD2 C2 that the true cause of action should be expressed in the body of the writ or process. This statute, without any such intention in the makers, had liked to have ousted the king's bench of all its jurisdictions over civil injuries without force, for as the Bill of Middlesex was framed only for actions of trespass, a defendant could not be arrested and held to bail thereupon for breaches of civil contracts. But to remedy this inconvenience, the officers of the King's Bench devised a method of adding what is called a clause of ac etium to the usual complaint of trespass, the Bill of Middlesex commanding the defendant to be brought in to answer the plaintiff of a plea of trespass and also to a bill of debt the complaint of trespass giving cognizance to the court, and that of debt authorizing the arrest. In return for which, Lord Chief Justice North, a few years afterwards, in order to save the suitors of his court the trouble and expense of suing out special originals, directed that in the common pleas, besides the usual complaint of breaking the plaintiff's close, a clause of ac etium might also be added to the writ of copius containing the true cause of action, as that the said Charles, the defendant, may answer to the plaintiff of a plea of trespass in breaking his close, and also ac etium may answer him according to the custom of the court in a certain plea of trespass upon the case upon promises to the value of twenty pounds, etc., the sum sworn to by the plaintiff is marked upon the back of the writ, and the sheriff or his officer, the bailiff, is then obliged to actually arrest or take into custody the body of the defendant, and, having so done, return the writ with a chepi corpus endorsed thereon. An arrest must be by corporal seizing or touching the defendant's body after which the bailiff may justify breaking open the house in which he is to take him. Otherwise, he has no such power, but must watch his opportunity to arrest him. For every man's house is looked upon by the law to be his castle of defense and asylum, wherein he should suffer no violence. Which principle is carried so far in the civil law, that for the most part, not so much as a common citation or summons, much less an arrest, can be executed upon a man within his own walls. Peers of the realm, members of parliament and corporations are privileged from arrests, and of course, from outlawries. And against them, the process to enforce an appearance must be by summons and distress infinite instead of a copious. Also, clerks, attorneys, and all other persons attending the courts of justice, for attorneys, being officers of the court, are always supposed to be there attending, are not liable to be arrested by the ordinary process of the court, but must be sued by bill, called usually a bill of privilege, as being personally present in court. 
clergymen performing divine service and not merely staying in the church with a fraudulent design are for the time privileged from arrests by statute 50 edward the third c5 and one richard the second c16 as likewise members of convocation actually attending thereon by statute 8 henry the sixth c1 suitors witnesses and other persons necessarily attending any courts of record upon business are not to be arrested during their actual attendance which includes their necessary coming and returning and no arrest can be made in the king's presence nor within the verge of his royal palace nor in any place where the king's justices are actually sitting the king hath moreover a special prerogative which indeed is very seldom exerted that he may by his writ of protection privilege a defendant from all personal and many real suits for one year at a time and no longer in respect of his being engaged in his service out of the realm and the king also by the common law might take his creditor into his protection so that no one might sue or arrest him till the king's debt were paid but by the statute twenty five edward the third s t five c nineteen notwithstanding such protection another creditor may proceed to judgment against them with a stay of execution till the king's debt be paid unless such creditor will undertake for the king's debt and then he shall have execution for both and lastly by statute twenty nine charles the second c seven no arrest can be made nor process served upon a sunday except for treason felony or breach of the peace when the defendant is regularly arrested he must either go to prison for safe custody or put in special bail to the sheriff for the intent of the arrest being only to compel an appearance in court at the return of the writ that purpose is equally answered whether the sheriff detains his person or takes sufficient security for his appearance called bail from the french word bailer to deliver because the defendant is bailed or delivered to his sureties upon their giving security for his appearance and is supposed to continue in their friendly custody instead of going to jail the method of putting bail to the sheriff is by entering into a bond or obligation with one or more sureties not fictitious persons as in the former case of common bail but real substantial responsible bondmen to ensure the defendant's appearance at the return of the writ which obligation is called the bail bond the sheriff if he pleases may let the defendant go without any sureties but that is at his own peril for after once taking him the sheriff is bound to keep him safely so as to be forthcoming in court otherwise an action lies against him for an escape but on the other hand he is obliged by statute twenty three henry the sixth c ten to take if it be tendered a sufficient bail bond and by statute twelve george the first c twenty nine the sheriff shall take bail for no other sum than such as is sworn to by the plaintiff and endorsed on the back of the writ upon the return of the writ or within four days after the defendant must appear according to the exigency of the writ this appearance is effected by putting in and justifying bail to the action which is commonly called putting in bail above if this be not done and the bail that were taken by the sheriff below are reasonable persons the plaintiff may take an assignment from the sheriff of the bail bond under the statute four and five and c sixteen and bring an action thereupon against the sheriff's bail but if the bail so accepted by the sheriff be insolvent persons the plaintiff may proceed against the sheriff himself by calling upon him first to return the writ if not already done and afterwards to bring in the body of the defendant and if the sheriff does not then cause sufficient bail to be put in above he will himself be responsible to the plaintiff 
The bail above or bail to the action must be put in either in open court or before one of the judges thereof or else in the country before a commissioner appointed for that purpose by virtue of the statute for William and Mary, C4, which must be transmitted to the court. These bail, who must be at least two in number, must enter into a recognizance in court or before the judge or commissioner, whereby they do jointly and severally undertake that if the defendant be condemned in the action, he shall pay the costs and condemnation or render himself a prisoner, or that they will pay it for him, which recognizance is transmitted to the court in a slip of parchment entitled a bail piece. And if required, the bail must justify themselves in court, or before the commissioner in the country, by swearing themselves housekeepers, and each of them to be worth double the sum for which they are bail, after payment of all their debts. This answers in some measure to the stipulatio or satisdatio of the Roman laws, which is mutually given by each litigant party to the other, by the plaintiff that he will prosecute his suit and pay the costs if he loses his cause, in like manner as our law still requires nominal pledges of prosecution from the plaintiff, by the defendant that he shall continue in court and abide by the sentence of the judge, much like our special bail, but with this difference, that the fideiusores were there absolutely bound, judicatum salveri, to see the costs and condemnations paid at all events, whereas our special bail may be discharged by surrendering the defendant into custody within the time allowed by law, for which purpose they are at all times entitled to a warrant to apprehend him. Special bail is required, as of course, only upon actions of debt, or actions on the case in trover or for money due, where the plaintiff can swear that the cause of action amounts to ten pounds, but in actions where the damages are precarious, being to be assessed ad libitum by a jury, as in actions for words, ejectment, or trespass, it is very seldom possible for a plaintiff to swear to the amount of his cause of action, and therefore no special bail is taken thereupon unless by a judge's order or the particular directions of the court in some particular species of injuries, as in cases of mayhem or atrocious battery, or upon such special circumstances as make it absolutely necessary that the defendant should be kept within the reach of justice. Also in actions against heirs, executors, and administrators for debts of the deceased, special bail is not demandable, for the action is not so properly against them in person as against the effects of the deceased in their possession. But special bail is required even of them in actions for a devastavit, or wasting the goods of the deceased, that wrong being of their own committing. Thus much for the process, which is only meant to bring the defendant into court in order to contest the suit and abide the determination of the law. When he appears, either in person as a prisoner or out upon bail, then follow the pleadings between the parties, which we shall consider at large in the next chapter. End of chapter 19, part 2Chapter 20, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Pleading, Part 1. Pleadings are the mutual altercations between the plaintiff and defendant, which at present are set down and delivered into the proper office in writing, though formerly they were usually put in by their counsel, or tenue, or viva voce, in court, and then minuted down by the chief clerks or prothonotaries. 
whence, in our old law French, the pleadings are frequently denominated the parole. The first of these is the declaration, narratio, or count, anciently called the tale, in which the plaintiff sets forth his cause of complaint at length, being indeed only an application or exposition of the original writ upon which his action is founded, with the additional circumstances of time and place when and where the injury was committed. But we may remember that in the king's bench, when the defendant is brought into court by Bill of Middlesex upon a supposed trespass, in order to give the court a jurisdiction, the plaintiff may declare whatever action or charge him with whatever injury he thinks proper, unless he has held him to bail by a special ac etium which the plaintiff is then bound to pursue. And so also, in order to have the benefit of a copyist to secure the defendant's person, it was the ancient practice and is therefore still warrantable in the common pleas to sue out a writ of trespass quare clausum fregit for breaking the plaintiff's close, and when the defendant is once brought in upon this writ, the plaintiff declares in whatever action the nature of his actual injury may require as an action of covenant or on the case for a breach of contract or other less forcible transgression unless by holding the defendant to bail on a special ac etium he has bound himself to declare accordingly in local actions where possession of land is to be recovered or damages for an actual trespass or for waste etc affecting land the plaintiff must lay his declaration or declare his injury to have happened in the very county and place that it really did happen but in transitory actions for injuries that might have happened anywhere as debt detinue slander and the like the plaintiff may declare in what county he pleases and then the trial must be in that county in which the declaration is laid though if the defendant will make affidavit that the cause of action if any arose not in that but in another county the court will direct a change of the venue or visne that is the vicinia or neighborhood in which the injury is declared to be done and will oblige the plaintiff to declare in the proper county for the statute six richard the second c two having ordered all writs to be laid in their proper counties this as the judges conceived empowered them to change the venue if required and not to insist rigidly on abating the writ which practice began in the reign of james the first and this power is discretionally exercised so as not to cause but prevent a defect of justice therefore the court will not change the venue to any of the four northern counties previous to the spring circuit because there the assizes are holden only once a year at the time of the summer circuit and it will sometimes remove the venue from the proper jurisdiction especially of the narrow and limited kind upon a suggestion duly supported that a fair and impartial trial cannot be had therein it is generally usual in actions upon the case to set forth several cases by different counts in the same declaration so that if the plaintiff fails in the proof of one he may succeed in another as in an action on the case upon an assumpsit for goods sold and delivered the plaintiff usually counts or declares first upon a settled and agreed price between him and the defendant as that they bargain for twenty pounds and lest he should fail in the proof of this he counts likewise upon a quantum balabant that the defendant bought other goods and agreed to pay him so much as they were reasonably worth and then avers that they were worth other twenty pounds and so on in three or four different shapes and at last concludes with declaring that the defendant had refused to fulfill any of these agreements whereby he is in damage to such a value and if he proves the case laid in any one of his counts though he fails in the rest he shall recover proportionable damages this declaration always concludes with these words and thereupon he brings suit etc 
in de producit sectum, etc., by which word suit or secta, a sequendo, were anciently understood the witnesses or followers of the plaintiff. For in former times the law would not put the defendant to the trouble of answering the charge till the plaintiff had made out at least a probable case. But the actual production of the suit, the secta, or followers, is now antiquated, and hath been totally disused at least ever since the reign of Edward the Third, though the form of it still continues. At the end of the declaration are added also the plaintiff's common pledges of prosecution, John Doe and Richard Rowe, which, as we before observed, are now mere names of form, though formerly they were of use to answer to the king for the immersement of the plaintiff in case he were non-suited, barred of his action, or had a verdict and judgment against him. For if the plaintiff neglects to deliver a declaration for two terms after the defendant appears, or is guilty of other delays or defaults against the rules of law in any subsequent stage of the action, he is adjudged not to follow or pursue his remedy as he ought to do, and thereupon a non-suit or non-prosequitur is entered, and he is said to be non-prosed. And for thus deserting his complaint, after making a false claim or complaint, pro falso clamore suo, he shall not only pay the costs to the defendant, but is liable to be immersed to the king. A retraxit differs from a non-suit in that the one is negative and the other positive. The non-suit is a default and neglect of the plaintiff, and therefore he is allowed to begin his suit again upon payment of costs. But a retraxit is an open and voluntary renunciation of his suit in court, and by this he forever loses his action. A discontinuance is somewhat similar to a non-suit, for when a plaintiff leaves a chasm in the proceedings of his cause, as by not continuing the process regularly from day to day and time to time as he ought to do, the suit is discontinued and the defendant is no longer bound to attend but the plaintiff must begin again by suing out a new original, usually paying costs to his antagonist. Anciently, by the demise of the king, all suits depending in his courts were at once discontinued, and the plaintiff was obliged to renew the process by suing out a fresh writ from the successor. The virtue of the former writ being totally gone, and the defendant no longer bound to attend in consequence thereof. But to prevent the expense as well as delay attending this rule of law, the statute 1 Edward the Sixth, C7 enacts that by the death of the king no action shall be discontinued, but all proceedings shall stand good as if the same king had been living. When the plaintiff hath stated his case in the declaration, it is incumbent on the defendant within a reasonable time to make his defense and to put in a plea, or else the plaintiff will at once recover judgment by default or nihil dicit of the defendant. Defense, in its true legal sense, signifies not a justification, protection, or guard, which is now its popular signification, but merely an opposing or denial from the French verb defender of the truth or validity of the complaint. It is the contestatio litis of the civilians, a general assertion that the plaintiff hath no ground of action, which assertion is afterwards extended and maintained in his plea. For it would be ridiculous to suppose that the defendant comes and defends, or in the vulgar acceptation justifies, the force and injury in one line, and pleads that he is not guilty of the trespass complained of in the next. And therefore, in actions of dower, where the demandant does not count of any injury done, but merely demands her endowment, and in assizes of land, where also there is no injury alleged, but merely a question of right stated for the determination of the recognitors or jury, 
the tenant makes no such defense. In writs of entry, where no injury is stated in the count, but merely the right of the demandant and defective title of the tenant, the tenant comes and defends or denies his right, jus suum, that is, as I understand it, though with a small grammatical inaccuracy, the right of the demandant, the only one expressly mentioned in the pleadings, or else denies his own right to be such, as is suggested by the count of the demandant. And in writs of right, the tenant always comes and defends the right of the demandant and his season, jus praedicti es et seasonum ipsus, or else the season of his ancestor upon which he counts as the case may be, and the demandant may reply that the tenant unjustly defends his, the demandant's right, and the season on which he counts. All which is extremely clear if we understand by defense an opposition or denial, but is otherwise inexplicably difficult. The courts were formerly very nice and curious with respect to the nature of the defense, so that if no defense was made, though a sufficient plea was pleaded, the plaintiff should recover judgment, and therefore the book entitled Nove Narrationes, or The New Talus, at the end of almost every count, narratio, or tale, subjoins such defense as is proper for the defendant to make. For a general defense or denial was not prudent in every situation, since thereby the propriety of the writ, the competency of the plaintiff, and the cognizance of the court were allowed. By defending the force and injury, the defendant waived all pleas of misnomer. By defending the damages, all exceptions to the person of the plaintiff. By defending either one or the other, when and where it should behoove him, he acknowledged the jurisdiction of the court. But of late years these niceties have been very deservedly discountenanced, though they still seem to be law, if insisted on. After defense made, the defendant must put in his plea. But before he pleads, he is entitled to demand one imparlance, or licentia loquendi, and may have more granted by consent of the plaintiff, to see if he can end the matter amicably without further suit by talking with the plaintiff, a practice which is supposed to have arisen from a principle of religion, in obedience to that precept of the gospel, agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. And it may be observed that this gospel precept has a plain reference to the Roman law of the Twelve Tables, which expressly directed the plaintiff and defendant to make up the matter while they were in the way, or going to the praetor. In via rem uti pacunt orato. There are also many other previous steps which may be taken by a defendant before he puts in his plea. He may, in real actions, demand a view of the thing in question in order to ascertain its identity and other circumstances. He may crave oyer of the writ, or of the bond, or other specialty upon which the action is brought, that is, to hear it read to him. The generality of the defendants in the times of ancient simplicity being supposed incapable to read it themselves, whereupon the whole is entered verbatim upon the record, and the defendant may take advantage of any condition or other part of it not stated in the plaintiff's declaration. In real actions also, the tenant may pray in aid or call for assistance of another to help him plead because of the feebleness and imbecility of his own estate. Thus, a tenant for life may pray in aid of him that hath the inheritance in remainder or reversion, and an incumbent may pray in aid of the patron and ordinary, that is, that they shall be joined in the action to help defend the title. Voucher also is the calling in of some person to answer the action that hath warranted the title to the tenant or defendant. This we still make use of in the form of common recoveries which are grounded on a writ of entry, a species of action that we may remember 
relies chiefly on the weakness of the tenant's title, who therefore vouches another person to warrant it. If the vouchee appears, he is made defendant instead of the vouchor, but if he afterwards makes default, recovery shall be had against the original defendant, and he shall recover over an equivalent in value against the deficient vouchee. In a seizes indeed, where the principal question is whether the demandant or his ancestors were or were not in possession till the ouster happened, and the title of the tenant is little, if at all, discussed, there no voucher is allowed. But the tenant may bring a writ of warentia chartai against the warrantor to compel him to assist him with a good plea or defense, or else to render damages and the value of the land if recovered against the tenant. In many real actions also, brought by or against an infant under the age of 21 years, and also in actions of debt brought against him as heir to any deceased ancestor, either party may suggest the nonage of the infant and pray that the proceedings may be deferred till his full age, or, in our legal phrase, that the infant may have his age, and that the parole may demure, that is, that the pleadings may be stayed, and then they shall not proceed till his full age, unless it be apparent that he cannot be prejudiced thereby. But by the statutes of Westminster 1, 3, Edward I, C. 46, and of Gloucester 6, Edward I, C. 2, in writs of entry, sir, the season, in some particular cases, and in actions ancestral brought by an infant, the parole shall not demure, otherwise he might be divorced of his whole property, and even want a maintenance, till he came of age. So likewise, in a writ of dower, the heir shall not have his age, for it is necessary that the widow's claim be immediately determined, else she may want a present subsistence nor shall an infant patron have it in aquare impedia, since the law holds it necessary and expedient that the church be immediately filled. It is in this stage also of the cause, if at all, that cognizance of the suit must be claimed or demanded, when any person or body corporate hath the franchise, not only of holding pleas within a particular limited jurisdiction, but also of the cognizance of pleas, and that either without any words exclusive of other courts, which entitles the lord of the franchise, whenever any suit that belongs to his jurisdiction is commenced in the courts of Westminster to demand the cognizance thereof, or with such exclusive words which also entitle the defendant to plead to the jurisdiction of the court. Upon this claim of cognizance, if allowed, all proceedings shall cease in the superior court, and the plaintiff is left at liberty to pursue his remedy in the special jurisdiction. As when a scholar or other privileged person of the universities of Oxford or Cambridge is impleaded in the courts at Westminster for any cause of action whatsoever, unless upon a question of freehold. In these cases, by the charter of those learned bodies, confirmed by Act of Parliament, the Chancellor or Vice-Chancellor may put in a claim of cognizance, which, if made in due time and with due proof of the facts alleged, is regularly allowed by the courts. It must be demanded before any imparlance, for that is a submission to the jurisdiction of the Superior Court and it will not be allowed if it occasions a failure of justice, or if an action be brought against the person himself who claims the franchise, unless he hath also a power in such case of making another judge. When these proceedings are over, the defendant must then put in his excuse or plea. Pleas are of two sorts, dilatory pleas and pleas to the action. Dilatory pleas are such as tend merely to delay or put off the suit by questioning the propriety of the remedy rather than denying the injury. Pleas to the action are such as dispute the very cause of the suit. The former cannot be pleaded after a general imparlance, which is an acknowledgment of the propriety of the action. 1. 
dilatory pleas are, one, to the jurisdiction of the court, alleging that it ought not to hold plea of this injury, it arising in Wales or beyond the sea, or because the land in question is of ancient demean and ought to be demanded in the Lord's court, etc. 2. To the disability of the plaintiff, by reason whereof he is incapable to commence or continue the suit, as that he is an alien enemy, outlawed, excommunicated, attainted of treason or felony under a primuneri, not in rerum natura, being only a fictitious person, an infant, a femme covert, or a monk professed. 3. In abatement, which abatement is either of the writ or the count or some defect in one of them, as by misnaming the defendant, which is called a misnomer, giving him a wrong addition, as esquire instead of knight, or other want of form in any material respect. Or it may be that the plaintiff is dead, for the death of either party is at once an abatement of the suit, and in actions merely personal arising ex delicto for wrongs actually done or committed by the defendant as trespass, battery, and slander, the rule is that actio personales moritor cum persona and it never shall be revived either by or against the executors or other representatives. For neither the executors of the plaintiff have received, nor those of the defendant have committed, in their own personal capacity, any manner of wrong or injury. But in actions arising ex contractu, by breach of promise and the like, where the right descends to the representatives of the plaintiff, and those of the defendant have assets to answer the demand. Though the suits shall abate by the death of the parties, yet they may be revived against or by the executors, being indeed rather actions against the property than the person in which the executors have now the same interest that their testator had before. These pleas to the jurisdiction, to the disability, or in abatement, were formerly very often used as mere dilatory pleas, without any foundation of truth, and calculated only for delay. But now, by statute 4 and 5 and C16, no dilatory plea is to be admitted without affidavit made of the truth thereof and some probable matter shown to the court to induce them to believe it true. And with respect to the pleas themselves, it is a rule that no exception shall be admitted against the declaration or writ unless the defendant will in the same plea give the plaintiff a better, that is, show him how it might be amended that there may not be two objections upon the same account. All pleas to the jurisdiction conclude to the cognizance of the court, praying, Judgment whether the court will have farther cognizance of the suit. Please to the disability conclude to the person by praying judgment if the said A, the plaintiff, ought to be answered, and please in abatement when the suit is by original, conclude to the writ or declaration by praying judgment of the writ or declaration and that the same may be quashed, cassetor, made void or abated. But if the action be by bill, the plea must pray judgment of the bill, and not of the declaration, the bill being here the original, and the declaration only a copy of the bill. When these dilatory pleas are allowed, the cause is either dismissed from that jurisdiction, or the plaintiff is stayed till his disability be removed, or he is obliged to sue out a new writ by leave obtained from the court, or to amend and new frame his declaration. But when, on the other hand, they are overruled as frivolous, the defendant has judgment of respondeat uster, or to answer over in some better manner. It is then incumbent on him to plead. End of chapter 20, part 1
by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Pleading, Part 2. 2. A plea to the action, that is, to answer the merits of the complaint. This is done by confessing or denying it. A confession of the whole complaint is not very usual, for then the defendant would probably end the matter sooner, or not plead at all, but suffer the judgment to go by default. Yet sometimes, after tender and refusal of a debt, if the creditor harasses his debtor with an action, it then becomes necessary for the defendant to acknowledge the debt and plead the tender, adding that he has always been ready, tout en priest, and is still ready, un corps priest, to discharge it. For a tender by the debtor and refusal by the creditor will in all cases discharge the costs, but not the debt itself, though in some particular cases the creditor will totally lose his money. But frequently, the defendant confesses one part of the complaint by a cognovit actionem in respect thereof, and traverses or denies the rest, in order to avoid the expense of carrying that part to a formal trial which he has no ground to litigate. A species of this sort of confession is the payment of money into court which is for the most part necessary upon pleading a tender and is itself a kind of tender to the plaintiff by paying into the hands of the proper officer of the court as much as the defendant acknowledges to be true together with the costs hitherto incurred in order to prevent the expense of any farther proceedings this may be done upon what is called a motion which is an occasional application to the court by the parties or their counsel in order to obtain some rule or order of court which becomes necessary in the progress of a cause, and it is usually grounded upon an affidavit, the past tense of the verb affido, being a voluntary oath before some judge or officer of the court to evince the truth of certain facts upon which the motion is grounded though no such affidavit is necessary for payment of money into court. If, after the money paid in, the plaintiff proceeds in his suit, it is at his own peril. For if he does not prove more due than is so paid into court, he shall be non-suited and pay the defendant costs, but he shall still have the money so paid in for that the defendant has acknowledged to be his due. In the French law, the rule of practice is grounded upon principles somewhat similar to this. For there, if a person be sued for more than he owes, yet he loses his cause if he does not tender so much as he really does owe. To this head may also be referred the practice of what is called a set-off, whereby the defendant acknowledges the justice of the plaintiff's demand on the one hand, but on the other sets up a demand of his own to counterbalance that of the plaintiff, either in the whole or in part, as, if the plaintiff sues for ten pounds due on a note of hand, the defendant may set off nine pounds due himself for merchandise sold to the plaintiff, and in case he pleads such a set-off, may pay the remaining balance into court. This answers very nearly to the compensatio, or stoppage, of the civil law and depends on the statutes 2 George II C-22 and 8 George II C-24, which enact that where there are mutual debts between the plaintiff and defendant, one debt may be set against the other, and either pleaded in bar or given in evidence upon the general issue at the trial, which shall operate as payment and extinguish so much of the plaintiff's demand. Pleas that totally deny the cause of complaint are either the general issue or a special plea in bar. The general issue or general plea is what traverses, thwarts, and denies at once the whole declaration without offering any special matter whereby to evade it. As in trespass, either v et armis or on the case, non culpabilis, not guilty. 
In debt upon contract, nihil debet, he owes nothing. In debt on bond, non est factum, it is not his deed. Or an assumpsit, non assumpsit, he made no such promise. Or in real actions, null tort, no wrong done. Null deceason, no deceason, an innerit of right that the tenant has more right to hold than the demandant has to demand. These pleas are called the general issue because by importing an absolute and general denial of what is alleged in the declaration, they amount at once to an issue, by which we mean a fact affirmed on one side and denied on the other. Formally, the general issue was seldom pleaded except when the party meant wholly to deny the charge alleged against him. But when he meant to distinguish away or palliate the charge, it was always usual to set forth the particular facts in what is called a special plea, which was originally intended to apprise the court and the adverse party of the nature and circumstances of the defense and to keep the law and the fact distinct. And it is an invariable rule that every defense which cannot be thus specially pleaded may be given in evidence upon general issue at the trial. But the science of special pleading, having been frequently perverted to the purposes of chicane and delay, the courts have of late in some instances, and in the legislature many more, permitted the general issue to be pleaded, which leaves everything open, the fact, the law, and the equity of the case, and have allowed special matter to be given in evidence at trial. And though it should seem as much confusion and uncertainty would follow from so great a relaxation of the strictness anciently observed, yet experience has shown it to be otherwise, especially with the aid of a new trial in case either party be unfairly surprised by the other. 2. Special pleas, in bar of the plaintiff's demand, are very various according to the circumstances of the defendant's case. As, in real actions, a general release or fine, both of which may destroy and bar the plaintiff's title, or, in personal actions, an accord, arbitration, conditions performed, knownage of the defendant, or some other fact which precludes the plaintiff from his action. A justification is likewise a special plea in bar, as in actions of assault and battery, son assault the mean, that it was the plaintiff's own original assault, in trespass, that the defender did the thing complained of in right of some office which warranted him so to do, or in action of slander, that the plaintiff really was as bad a man as the defendant said he was. Also, a man may plead the statutes of limitations in bar, or the time limited by certain acts of parliament beyond which no plaintiff can lay his cause of action. This, by the statute of 32 Henry VIII C2, in a writ of right is 60 years. In assizes, writs of entry, or other possessory actions real, of the season of one's ancestors and lands, and in either of their season, or one's own, in rents, suits, and services, fifty years, and in actions real for lands grounded upon one's own season or possession, such possession must have been within thirty years. By Statute 1, Marlborough, ST 2, C 5, this limitation does not extend to any suit for advowsons upon reasons given in a former chapter. But by the statute 21 James I, C2, a time of limitation was extended to the case of the king, so that possession for 60 years precedent to 19 February 1623 is a bar even against the prerogative in derogation of the ancient maxim nullum tempus occurrit regi. By another statute 21 James I, C16, Twenty years is the time of limitation in any writ of formidon, and by a consequence, twenty years is also the limitation in every action of ejectment, 
for no ejectment can be brought unless where the lessor of the plaintiff is entitled to enter on the lands, and by statute 21 James I, C16, no entry can be made by any man unless within twenty years after his right shall accrue. As to all personal actions, they are limited by the statute last mentioned to six years after the cause of action commenced, except actions of assault, battery, mayhem, and imprisonment, which must be brought within four years, and actions for words, which must be brought within two years after the injury committed. And by the statute 31 Elizabeth C5, all suits, indictments, and informations upon any penal statutes where any forfeiture is to the crown shall be sued within two years, and where the forfeiture is to a subject within one year after the offense committed, unless where any other time is specially limited by the statute. Lastly, by statute 10, William III, C14, no writ of error or sciere facius shall be brought to reverse any judgment, fine, or recovery for error unless it be prosecuted within 20 years. The use of these statutes of limitation is to preserve the peace of the kingdom and to prevent those innumerable perjuries which might ensue if a man were allowed to bring an action for any injury committed at any distance of time. Upon both these accounts, the law therefore holds that in teres republicae ut sit finis litium, and upon the same principle, the Athenian laws in general prohibited all actions where the injury was committed five years before the complaint was made. If, therefore, in any suit, the injury or cause of action happened earlier than the period expressly limited by law, the defendant may plead the statutes of limitations in bar, as, upon an assumpsit, or promise to pay money to the plaintiff, the defendant may plead, non assumpsit infra sex annos, he made no such promise within six years, which is an effectual bar to the complaint. An estoppel is likewise a special plea in bar, which happens where a man hath done some act or executed some deed which estops or precludes him from averring anything to the contrary, as if tenant for years, who hath no freehold, levies a fine to another person. Though this is void as to strangers, yet it shall work as an estoppel to the cognizer. For if he afterwards brings in action to recover these lands, and his fine is pleaded against him, he shall thereby be stopped from saying that he had no freehold at the time, and therefore was incapable of levying it. The conditions and qualities of a plea, which as well as the doctrine of estoppels will also hold equally mutatis mutandis with regard to other parts of pleading, are 1. That it be single and containing only one matter, for duplicity begets confusion. But by statute 4 and 5 and C16, a man with leave of the court may plead two or more distinct matters or single pleas, as in an action of assault and battery, these three not guilty, son assault de mean, and the statute of limitations. 2. That it be direct and positive and not argumentative. 3. That it have convenient certainty of time, place, and persons. 4. That it answer the plaintiff's allegations in every material point. 5. That it be so pleaded as to be capable of trial. Special pleas are usually in the affirmative, sometimes in the negative, but they always advance some new fact not mentioned in the declaration, and then they must be averred to be true in the common form, and this he is ready to verify. This is not necessary in pleas of the general issue, those always containing a total denial of the facts before advanced by the other party, and therefore putting him upon the proof of them. It is a rule in pleading that no man be allowed to plead specially such a plea as amounts only to the general issue or a total denial of the charge, but in such case 
he shall be driven to plead the general issue in terms whereby the whole question is referred to a jury. But if the defendant, in an assize or action of trespass, be desirous to refer the validity of his title to the court rather than the jury, he may state his title specifically and at the same time give color to the plaintiff or suppose him to have an appearance or color of title bad indeed in point of law, but of which the jury are not competent judges. As if his own true title be that he claims by fiefment with livery from A, by force of which he entered on the lands in question, he cannot plead this by itself as it amounts to no more than the general issue, null tort, null decision, in a seize, or not guilty in an action of trespass. But he may allege this specially, provided he goes farther and says that the plaintiff, claiming by color of a prior deed of fiefment, without livery entered upon whom he entered, and may then refer himself to the judgment of the court which of these two titles is best in point of law. When the plea of defendant is thus put in, if it does not amount to an issue or total contradiction of the declaration but only evades it, the plaintiff may plead again and reply to the defendant's plea, either traversing it, that is, totally denying it, as if on an action of debt upon bond the defendant pleads solvit ad diem, that he paid the money when due, here the plaintiff, in his replication, may totally traverse this plea by denying that the defendant paid it, or he may allege new matter in contradiction to the defendant's plea, as when the defendant pleads no award made, the plaintiff may reply and set forth an actual award and assign a breach, or the replication may confess and avoid the plea by some new matter or distinction consistent with the plaintiff's former declaration, as in an action for trespassing upon land whereof the plaintiff is seized, if the defendant shows a title to the land by descent, and that therefore he had a right to enter, and gives color to the plaintiff, the plaintiff may either traverse and totally deny the fact of descent, or he may confess and avoid it, by replying that true it is that such dissent happened, but since that dissent, the defendant himself demised the lands to the plaintiff for term of life. To the replication, the defendant may rejoin, or put in an answer called a rejoinder. The plaintiff may answer the rejoinder with a sir rejoinder, upon which the defendant may rebut, and the plaintiff answer him by a sir rebutter which pleas, replications, rejoinders, sir rejoinders, rebutters, and sir rebutters answer to the exceptia, replicatia, duplicatio, triplicatio, and quadruplicatio of the Roman laws. The whole of this process is denominated the pleading, in the several stages of which it must be carefully observed not to depart or vary from the title or defense which the party has once insisted on. For this, which is called a departure in pleading, might occasion endless altercation. Therefore, the replication must support the declaration and the rejoinder must support the plea without departing out of it. As in the case of pleading no award made in consequence of a bond of arbitration, to which the plaintiff replies, setting forth an actual award. Now the defendant cannot rejoin that he hath performed this award, for such rejoinder would be an entire departure from his original plea, which alleged that no such award was made. Therefore, he has now no other choice but to traverse the fact of the replication, or else demure upon the law of it. Yet in many actions the plaintiff, who has alleged in his declaration a general wrong, may in his replication, after an evasive plea by the defendant, reduce that general wrong to a more particular certainty by assigning the injury afresh with all its specific circumstances in such manner as clearly to ascertain and identify it consistently with his general complaint, which is called a new or novel assignment. 
as if the plaintiff in trespass declares on a breach of his close in D, and the defendant pleads that the place where the injury is said to have happened is a certain close of pasture in D, which descended to him from B, his father, and so is his own freehold, the plaintiff may reply and assign another close in D, specifying the abuttals and boundaries as the real place of injury. It hath previously been observed that duplicity in pleading must be avoided. Every plea must be simple, entire, connected, and confined to one single point, and it must never be entangled with a variety of distinct independent answers to the same matter, which must require as many different replies and introduce a multitude of issues upon one and the same dispute. For this would often embarrass the jury and sometimes the court itself, and at all events, would greatly enhance the expense of the parties. Yet it is frequently expedient to plead in such a manner as to avoid any implied admission of fact which cannot with propriety or safety be positively affirmed or denied. And this may be done by what is called a protestation, whereby the party interposes an oblique allegation or denial of some fact protesting by the gerund protestando that such a matter does or does not exist and at the same time avoiding a direct affirmation or denial. Sir Edward Coke hath defined a protestation in the pithy dialect of that age to be an exclusion of a conclusion. For the use of it is to save the party from being concluded with respect to some fact or circumstance which cannot be directly affirmed or denied without falling into duplicity of pleading, and which yet, if he did not thus enter his protest, he might be deemed to have tacitly waived or admitted. Thus, while tenure and villainage subsisted, if a villain had brought an action against his lord, and the Lord was inclined to try the merits of the demand, and at the same time to prevent any conclusion against himself that he had waived his seniory, he could not, in this case, both plead affirmatively that the plaintiff was his villain, and also take issue upon the demand. For then his plea would have been double, as the former alone would have been a good bar to the action, but he might have alleged the villainage of the plaintiff by way of protestation, and then have denied the demand. By this means, the future villainage of the plaintiff was saved to the defendant in case the issue was found in his, the defendant's, favor, for the protestation prevented that conclusion which would have otherwise resulted from the rest of his defense that he had enfranchised the plaintiff since no villain could maintain a civil action against his lord. So also, if a defendant, by way of inducement to the point of his defense, alleges, among other matters, a particular mode of season or tenure, which the plaintiff is unwilling to admit, and yet desires to take issue on the principal point of the defense, he must deny the season or tenure by way of protestation, and then traverse the defensive matter. So lastly, if an award be set forth by the plaintiff, he can assign a breach in one part of it, viz. the non-payment of a sum of money, and yet is afraid to admit the performance of the rest of the award, or to aver in general a non-performance of any part of it, lest something should appear to have been performed, he may save to himself any advantage he might hereafter make of the general non-performance by alleging that by protestation, and plead only the non-payment of the money. In any stage of the pleadings, when either side advances or affirms any new matter, he usually, as was said, avers it to be true, and this he is ready to verify. On the other hand, when either side traverses or denies the facts pleaded by his antagonist, he usually tenders an issue, as it is called, the language of which is different according to the party by whom the issue is tendered. For if the traverse or denial comes from the defendant, the issue is tendered in this manner, and of this he puts himself upon the country, thereby submitting himself to the judgment of his peers. 
but if the traverse lies upon the plaintiff, he tenders the issue or prays the judgment of the peers against the defendant in another form. Thus, and this he prays, may be inquired of by the country. But if either side, as for instance the defendant, pleads a special negative plea, not traversing or denying anything that was before alleged, but disclosing some new negative manner, as where the suit is on a bond conditioned to perform an award, and the defendant pleads negatively that no award was made, he tenders no issue upon this plea. Because it does not yet appear whether the fact will be disputed, the plaintiff not having yet asserted the existence of any award. But when the plaintiff replies and sets forth an actual specific award, if then the defendant traverses the replication, and denies the making of any such award, he then, and not before, tenders an issue to the plaintiff. For when in the course of pleading they come to a point which is affirmed on one side and denied on the other, they are then said to be at issue, all their debates being at last contracted into a single point which must now be determined either in favor of the plaintiff or of the defendant. End of chapter 20 Part 2. Chapter 21 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Issue and demurrer. Issue, exodus, being the end of all pleadings, is the fourth part or stage of an action, and is either upon matter of law or matter of fact. An issue upon matter of law is called a demurrer, and it confesses the facts to be true as stated by the opposite party, but denies that, by the law arising upon those facts, any injury is done to the plaintiff, or that the defendant has made out a legitimate excuse according to the party which first demurs, demorator, rests or abides upon the point in question. As if the matter of the plaintiff's complaint or declaration be insufficient in law, as by not assigning any sufficient trespass, then the defendant demurs to the declaration. If, on the other hand, the defendant's excuse or plea be invalid, as if he pleads that he committed the trespass by authority from a stranger, without setting out the stranger's right, either the plaintiff may demur in law to the plea, and so on in every other part of the proceedings where either side perceives any material objection in point of law upon which he may rest his case. The form of such demurrer is by averring the declaration or plea, the replication or rejoinder, to be insufficient in law to maintain the action or defense, and therefore praying judgment for want of sufficient matter alleged. Sometimes demurrers are merely for want of sufficient form in the writ or declaration. But in case of exceptions to the form or matter of pleading, the party demurring must by statute 27 Elizabeth C5 and 4 and 5 and C16 set forth the causes of his demurrer or wherein he apprehends the deficiency to consist. And upon either a general or such a special demurrer, the opposite party avers it to be sufficient, which is called a joinder in demurrer, and then the parties are at issue in point of law which issue in law or demurrer the judges of the court before which the action is brought must determine. An issue of fact is where the fact only and not the law is disputed. And when he that denies or traverses the fact pleaded by his antagonist has tendered the issue thus, and this he prays may be inquired of by the country, or, and of this he puts himself upon the country, and it may immediately be subjoined by the other party, and the said A, B, doth the like. Which done, the issue is said to be joined, 
both parties having agreed to rest the state of the cause upon the truth of the fact in question. And this issue of fact must, generally speaking, be determined not by the judges of the court, but by some other method, the principle of which methods is that by the country, per pius, in Latin, per patrium, that is, by jury which establishment of different tribunals for determining these different issues is in some measure agreeable to the course of justice in the Roman Republic, where the judices ordinari determined only the questions of fact, but questions of law were referred to the decisions of the centum viri. But here it will be proper to observe that during the whole of these proceedings, from the time of the defendant's appearance in obedience to the king's writ, it is necessary that both the parties be kept or continued in court from day to day till the final determination of the suit. For the court can determine nothing unless in the presence of both the parties, in person or by their attorneys, or upon default of one of them, after his original appearance, and a time prefixed for his appearance in court again. Therefore, in the course of pleading, if either party neglects to put in his declaration, plea, replication, rejoinder, and the like, within the times allotted by the standing rules of the court, the plaintiff, if the omission be his, is said to be non-suit, or not to follow and pursue his complaint, and shall lose the benefit of his writ. Or, if the negligence be on the side of the defendant, judgment may be had against him for such his default. And, after the issue or demur joined, as well as in some of the previous stages of proceeding, a day is continually given and entered upon the record for the parties to appear on from time to time, as the exigence of the case may require. The giving of this day is called the continuance, because thereby the proceedings are continued without interruption from one adjournment to another. If these continuances are omitted, the cause is thereby discontinued, and the defendant is discharged sine die without a day for his turn. For by his appearance in court, he has obeyed the command of the king's writ, and unless he be adjourned over to a day certain, he is no longer bound to attend upon that summons, but he must be warned afresh, and the whole must begin de novo. Now it may sometimes happen that after the defendant has pleaded, nay, even after issue or demur joined, there may have arisen some new matter which it is proper for the defendant to plead as that the plaintiff, being a femme soul, is since married, or that she has given the defendant a release, and the like. Here, if the defendant takes advantage of this new matter, as early as he possibly can, viz., at the day given for his next appearance, he is permitted to plead it in what is called a plea puisterine continuance, or since the last adjournment for it would be unjust to exclude him from the benefit of this new defense which it was not in his power to make when he pleaded the former. But it is dangerous to rely on such a plea without due consideration, for it confesses the matter which was before in dispute between the parties, and it is not allowed to be put in if any continuance has intervened between the arising of this fresh matter and the pleading of it for then the defendant is guilty of neglect, or latches, and is supposed to rely on the merits of his former plea. Also, it is not allowed after a demur is determined or verdict given, because then relief may be had in another way, namely, by writ of audita querela, of which hereafter. And these pleas, puis darren continuance, when brought to a demur in law or issue of fact, shall be determined in like manner as other pleas. We have said that demurrers, or questions concerning the sufficiency of the matters alleged in the pleadings, are to be determined by the judges of the court upon solemn argument by counsel on both sides, and to that end a demur book is made up containing all the proceedings at length which are afterwards entered on record, 
and copies thereof, called paper books, are delivered to the judges to peruse. The record is a history of the most material proceedings in the cause, entered on a parchment roll and continued down to the present time, in which must be stated the original writ and summons, all the pleadings, the declaration, view or oyer prayed, the imparlances, plea, replication, rejoinder, continuances, and whatever farther proceedings have been had, and all entered verbatim on the roll, and also the issue or demurrer and joinder therein. These were formerly all written, as indeed all public proceedings were, in the Norman or Law French, and even the arguments of the council and decisions of the court were in the same barbarous dialect. An evident and shameful badge, it must be owned, of tyranny and foreign servitude, being introduced under the auspices of William the Norman and his sons, whereby the observation of the Roman satirist was once more verified that Gallia causudicus docut facunda Britannus. This continued till the reign of Edward the Third, who, having employed his arm successfully in subduing the crown of France, thought it unbeseeming the dignity of the victors to use any longer the language of a vanquished country. By a statute, therefore, passed in the thirty-sixth year of his reign, it was enacted that for the future all pleas should be pleaded, shown, defended, answered, debated, and judged in the English tongue, but be entered and enrolled in Latin. In like manner as Don Alonso X, King of Castile, the great-grandfather of our Edward III, obliged his subjects to use the Castilian tongue in all legal proceedings, and as, in 1286, the German language was established in the courts of the empire. And perhaps, if our legislature had then directed that the writs themselves, which are mandates from the king to his subjects to perform certain acts or to appear at certain places, should have been framed in the English language according to the rule of our ancient law, it had not been very improper. But the record or enrollment of those writs and proceedings thereon, which was calculated for the benefit of posterity, was more serviceable, because more durable, in a dead and immutable language than in any flux or living one. The practicers, however, being used to the Norman language, and therefore imagining they could express their thoughts more aptly and more concisely in that than in any other, still continued to take their notes in law French, and of course, when those notes came to be published under the denomination of reports, they were printed in that barbarous dialect, which, joined to the additional terrors of a Gothic black letter, has occasioned many a student to throw away his Plowden and Littleton without venturing to attack a page of them. And yet, in reality, upon a nearer acquaintance, they would have found nothing very formidable in the language which differs in its grammar and orthography as much from the modern French as the diction of Chaucer and Gower does from that of Addison and Pope. Besides, as the English and Norman languages were concurrently used by our ancestors for several centuries together, the two idioms have naturally assimilated and mutually borrowed from each other, for which reason the grammatical construction of each is so very much the same that I apprehend an Englishman with a week's preparation who would understand the laws of Normandy collected in their grand costumière as well, if not better, than a Frenchman bred within the walls of Paris. The Latin, which succeeded the French for entry and enrollment of pleas, and which continued in use for four centuries, answers so nearly to the English, oftentimes word for word, that it is not at all surprising it should generally be imagined to be totally fabricated at home with little more art or trouble than by adding Roman terminations to English words. Whereas in reality it is a very universal dialect spread throughout all Europe at the eruption of the northern nations 
and particularly accommodated and molded to answer all the purposes of the lawyers with a peculiar exactness and precision. This is principally owing to the simplicity or, if the reader pleases, the poverty and baldness of its texture calculated to express the ideas of mankind just as they arise in the human mind, without any rhetorical flourishes or perplexed ornaments of style. For it may be observed that those laws and ordinances of public as well as private communities are generally the most easily understood where strength and perspicuity, nor harmony or elegance of expression, have been principally consulted in compiling them. These northern nations, or rather their legislators, though they resolved to make use of the Latin tongue in promulging their laws as being more durable and more generally known to their conquered subjects than their own Teutonic dialects, yet, either through choice or necessity, have frequently intermixed therein some words of a Gothic original, which is more or less the case in every country in Europe, and therefore not to be imputed as any particular blemish in our English legal Latinity. The truth is, what is generally denominated Law Latin is in reality a mere technical language, calculated for eternal duration and easy to be apprehended both in present and future times, and on those accounts best suited to preserve those memorials which are intended for perpetual rules of action. The rude pyramids of Egypt have endured from the earliest ages, while the more modern and more elegant structures of Attica, Rome, and Palmyra have sunk beneath the stroke of time. As to the objection of locking up the law in a strange and unknown tongue, this is of little weight with regard to records which few have occasion to read, but such as do, or ought to, understand the rudiments of Latin. And besides, it may be observed of law Latin, as the very ingenious Sir John Davies observes of the law French, that it is so very easy to be learned, that the meanest wit that ever came to the study of law doth come to understand it almost perfectly in ten days without a reader. It is true indeed that the many terms of art with which the law abounds are sufficiently harsh when Latinized, yet not more so than those of other sciences, and may, as Mr. Selden observes, give offence to some grammarians of squeamish stomachs who would rather choose to live in ignorance of things the most useful and important than to have their delegate ears wounded by the use of a word unknown to Cicero, Sallust, or the other writers of the Augustan age. Yet this is no more than must unavoidably happen when things of modern use, of which the Romans had no idea, and consequently no phrases to express them, came to be delivered in the Latin tongue. It would puzzle the most classical scholar to find an appellation in his pure Latinity for a constable, a record, or a deed of fiefment. It is therefore to be imputed as much to necessity as ignorance, that they were styled in our forensic dialect constabularius recordum and fiefmentum. Thus again, another uncouth word of our ancient laws, for I defend not the ridiculous barbarism sometimes introduced by the ignorance of modern practicers, the substantive merdrum, or the verb merdrari, however harsh and unclassical it may seem, was necessarily framed to express a particular offense, since no other word in being, occidere, interfacire, necare, or the like, was sufficient to express the intention of the criminal, or quo animo, the act was perpetrated, and therefore by no means came up to the notion of murder at present entertained by our law, viz., a killing with malice aforethought. A similar necessity to this produced a similar effect at Byzantium, when the Roman laws were turned into Greek for the use of the Oriental Empire. For, without any regard to Attic elegance, the lawyers of the imperial courts made no scruple to translate Fide commissarios, cubiculum, filum familias, repudium, compromissum, 
reverentia et obsequium, and the like. They studied the more exact and precise import of the words than the neatness and delicacy of their cadence. And my academical readers will excuse me for suggesting that the terms of the law are not more numerous, more uncouth, or more difficult to be explained by a teacher than those of logic, physics, and the whole circle of Aristotle's philosophy, nay, even of the politer arts of architecture and its kindred studies, or the science of rhetoric itself. Sir Thomas More's famous legal question contains in it nothing more difficult than the definition which in his time the philosophers currently gave their materia prima, the groundwork of all natural knowledge, that is, neque quid, neque quantum, neque qualum, neque a liquid quorum quibus enis determinator, or its subsequent explanation by Adrian Herbord, who assures us that materia prima non est de corpus, neque performum corprietatis, neque per simplicium essentium, est taminens, et quidum substantia, licet incompleta, abetque actum ex se entitativum, et simul est de potentia subjectiva. The law, therefore, with regard to its technical phrases, stands upon the same footing with other studies and requests only the same indulgence. This technical Latin continued in use from the time of its first introduction till the subversion of our ancient constitution under Cromwell, when, among many other innovations in the law, some for the better and some for the worse, the language of our records was altered and turned into English. But at the restoration of King Charles, this novelty was no longer countenanced, the practicers finding it very difficult to express themselves so concisely or significantly in any other language but the Latin. And thus it continued without any sensible inconvenience till about the year 1730, when it was again thought proper that the proceedings at law should be done into English, and it was accordingly so ordered by Statute 4, George II, C. 26. This was done in order that the common people might have knowledge and understanding of what was alleged or done for and against them in the process and pleadings, the judgment and entries in a cause, which purpose I know not how well it has answered, but I am apt to suspect that the people are now, after many years' experience, altogether as ignorant in matters of law as before. On the other hand, these inconveniences have already arisen from the alteration, that now many clerks and attorneys are hardly able to read, much less to understand, a record of even so modern a date as the reign of George I, and it has much enhanced the expense of all legal proceedings, for since the practicers are confined, for the sake of the stamp duties which are thereby considerably increased, to write only a stated number of words in a sheet, and as the English language, through the multitude of its particles, is much more verbose than the Latin, it follows that the number of sheets must be very much augmented by the change. The translation also of technical phrases and the names of writs and other process were found to be so very ridiculous, a writ of nisi prius, quare impedit, fieri facius, habeas corpus, and the rest, not being capable of an English dress with any degree of seriousness, that in two years' time a new act was obliged to be made, 6 George II C. 14, which allows all technical words to continue in the usual language, and has thereby almost defeated every beneficial purpose of the former statute. What is said of the alteration of language by the statute for George II C. 26 will hold equally strong with respect to the prohibition of using the ancient immutable court hand in writing the records or other legal proceedings, whereby the reading of any record that is forty years old is now become the object of science and calls for the help of an antiquarian. But that branch of it, which forbids the use of abbreviations, 
seems to be of more solid advantage in delivering such proceedings from obscurity according to the precept of Justinian. Ne perscripterem aliqua fiat in posterem dubitatio. Jubemus non per seglorem captiones et compendiosa aegnemara e justem codis textum conscribi, sed per literarum consequentium explanare concedimus. But to return to our demurrer. When the substance of the record is completed and copies are delivered to the judge, the matter of law upon which the demurrer is grounded is upon solemn argument determined by the court and not by any trial by jury, and judgment is therefore accordingly given. As, in an action of trespass, if the defendant in his plea confesses the fact, but justifies it, causa venationis, for that he was hunting, and to this the plaintiff demurs, that is, he admits the truth of the plea, but denies the justification to be legal. Now, on arguing this demurrer, if the court be of opinion that a man may not justify trespass in hunting, they will give judgment for the plaintiff. If they think that he may, then judgment is given for the defendant. Thus is an issue in law, or demurrer, disposed of. An issue of fact takes up more form and preparation to settle it, for here the truth of the matters alleged must be solemnly examined in the channel prescribed by law, to which examination of facts the name of trial is usually confined, which will be treated of at large in the two succeeding chapters. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two Part one of the Commentaries on the Laws of England Book three by William Blackstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes Of the Several Species of Trial Part one the uncertainty of legal proceedings is a notion so generally adopted and has so long been the standing theme of wit and good humor that he who should attempt to refute it would be looked upon as a man who was either incapable of discernment himself or else meant to impose upon others. Yet it may not be amiss before we enter upon the several modes whereby certainty is meant to be obtained in our courts of justice to inquire a little wherein this uncertainty so frequently complained of consists, and to what causes it owes its original. It hath sometimes been said to owe its original to the number of our municipal constitutions and the multitude of our judicial decisions, which occasion, it is alleged, abundance of rules that militate and thwart with each other as the sentiments or caprice of successive legislatures and judges have happened to vary. The fact of multiplicity is allowed, and that thereby the researches of the student are rendered more difficult and laborious, but that, with proper industry, the result of those inquiries will be doubt and indecision is a consequence that cannot be admitted. People are apt to be angry at the want of simplicity in our laws. They mistake variety for confusion and complicated cases for contradictory. They bring us the examples of arbitrary governments of Denmark, Muscovy, and Prussia, of wild and uncultivated nations, the savages of Africa and America, or of narrow domestic republics in ancient Greece and modern Switzerland, and unreasonably require the same paucity of laws, the same conciseness of practice, in a nation of freemen, a polite and commercial people, and a populous extent of territory. In an arbitrary despotic government, where the lands are at the disposal of the prince, the rules of succession, or the mode of enjoyment, must depend upon his will and pleasure. Hence, there can be but few legal determinations relating to the property, the descent, or the conveyance of real estates, and the same holds in a stronger degree with regard to goods and chattels, and the contracts relating thereto. 
Under a tyrannical sway, trade must be continually in jeopardy, and of consequence can never be extensive. This, therefore, puts an end to the necessity of an infinite number of rules which the English merchant daily recurs to for adjusting commercial differences. Marriages are there usually contracted with slaves, or at least women are treated as such. No laws can be therefore expected to regulate the rights of dower, jointures, and marriage settlements. Few also are the persons who can claim the privileges of any laws. The bulk of those nations, viz. the commonality, boors, or peasants, being merely villains and bondsmen. Those are therefore left to the private coercion of their lords, are esteemed, in the contemplation of these boasted legislators, incapable of either right or injury, and of consequence are entitled to no redress. We may see, in these arbitrary states, how large a field of legal contests is already rooted up and destroyed. Again, were we a poor and naked people, as the savages of America are, strangers to science, to commerce, and the arts as well as of convenience of luxury, we might perhaps be content, as some of them are said to be, to refer all disputes to the next man we meet upon the road, and so put a short end to every controversy. For in a state of nature there is no room for municipal laws, and the nearer any nation approaches to that state, the fewer they will have occasion for. When the people of Rome were little better than sturdy shepherds or herdsmen, all their laws were contained in ten or twelve tables. But as luxury, politeness, and dominion increased, the civil law increased in the same proportion, and swelled to that amazing bulk which it now occupies, though successively pruned and retrenched by the emperors Theodosius and Justinian. In like manner we may lastly observe that in petty states and narrow territories much fewer laws will suffice than in large ones because there are fewer objects upon which the laws can operate. The regulations of a private family are short and well known. Those of a prince's household are necessarily more various and diffuse. The causes, therefore, of the multiplicity of the English laws are the extent of the country which they govern the commerce and refinement of its inhabitants, but, above all, the liberty and property of the subject. These will naturally produce an infinite fund of disputes which must be terminated in a judicial way, and it is essential to a free people that these determinations be published and adhered to, that their property may be as certain and fixed as the very constitution of their state. For though, in many other countries, everything is left in the breast of the judge to determine, yet with us he is only to declare and pronounce, not to make or new model the law. Hence, a multitude of decisions or cases adjudged will arise, for seldom will it happen that any one rule will exactly suit with many cases, and in proportion as the decisions of courts of judicature are multiplied, the law will be loaded with decrees that may sometimes, though rarely, interfere with each other, either because succeeding judges may not be apprised of the prior adjudication, or because they may think differently from their predecessors, or because the same arguments did not occur formally as at present, or, in fine, because of the natural imbecility and imperfection that attends all human proceedings. But wherever this happens to be the case in any material point, the legislature is ready, and from time to time both may, and frequently does, intervene to remove the doubt, and upon due deliberation had, determines by a declaratory statute how the law shall be held for the future. Whatever instances, therefore, of contradiction or uncertainty may have been gleaned from our records or reports, must be imputed to the defects of human laws in general, and are not owing to any particular ill construction of the English system. Indeed, the reverse is most strictly true.
the English law is less embarrassed with inconsistent resolutions and doubtful questions than any other known system of the same extent and the same duration. I may instance in the civil law, the text whereof, as collected by Justinian and his agents, is extremely voluminous and diffuse. But the idle comments, obscure glosses, and jarring interpretations grafted thereupon by the learned jurists are literally without number. And these glosses, which are mere private opinions of scholastic doctors, and not, like our law books of reports, judicial determinations of the court, are all of authority sufficient to be vouched and relied on, which must needs breed great distraction and confusion in their tribunals. The same may be said of the canon law, though the text thereof is not half the antiquity with the common law of England, and though the more ancient any system of laws is, the more it is liable to be perplexed with the multitude of judicial decrees. When, therefore, a body of laws of so high antiquity as the English is in general so clear and perspicuous, it argues deep wisdom and foresight in such as laid the foundations, and great care and circumspection in such as have built the superstructure. But is not, it will be asked, the multitude of lawsuits which we daily see in experience, an argument against the clearness and certainty of the law itself? By no means, for among the various disputes and controversies which are daily to be met with in the course of legal proceedings, it is obvious to observe how very few arise from obscurity in the rules or maxims of law. An action shall seldom be heard of to determine a question of inheritance unless the fact of the descent be controverted. But the dubious points which are usually agitated in our courts arise chiefly from the difficulty there is of ascertaining the intentions of individuals in their solemn dispositions of property, in their contracts, conveyances, and testaments. It is an object indeed of the utmost importance in this free and commercial country to lay as few restraints as possible upon the transfer of possessions from hand to hand, or their various designations marked out by the prudence, convenience, or necessities, or even by the caprice of their owners. Yet to investigate the intention of the owner is frequently a matter of difficulty among heaps of entangled conveyances or wills of a various obscurity. The law rarely hesitates in declaring its own meaning, but the judges are frequently puzzled to find out the meaning of others. Thus the powers, interests, the privileges, and properties of the tenant for life and a tenant entail are clearly distinguished and precisely settled by law. But what words in a will shall constitute this or that estate has occasionally been disputed for more than two centuries past, and will continue to be disputed as long as the carelessness, the ignorance, or singularity of testators shall continue to clothe their intentions in dark or new-fangled expressions. But notwithstanding so vast an accession of legal controversies arising from so fertile a fund as the ignorance and willfulness of individuals, these will bear no comparison in point of number to those which are founded upon the dishonesty and disingenuity of the parties, by either their suggesting complaints that are false in fact, and thereupon bringing groundless actions, or by denying such facts as are true in setting up unwarrantable defenses. Ex facto auditor jus. If, therefore, the fact be perverted or misrepresented, the law which arises from thence will be unavoidably unjust or partial. And, in order to prevent this, it is necessary to set right the fact and establish the truth contended for by appealing to some mode of probation or trial which the law of the country has ordained for a criterion of truth and falsehood. These modes of probation or trial form in every civilized country the great object of judicial decisions, and experience will abundantly show that above a hundred of our lawsuits arise from disputed facts for one where the law is doubted of. 
about 20 days in the year are sufficient in Westminster Hall to settle, upon solemn argument, every demurrer or other special point of law that arises throughout the nation. But two months are annually spent in deciding the truth of facts before six distinct tribunals in the several circuits of England, exclusive of Middlesex and London, which afford a supply of causes much more than equivalent to any two of the largest circuits. Trial, then, is the examination of the matter of fact in issue, of which there are many different species according to the difference of the subject or thing to be tried, of all which we will take a cursory view in this and the subsequent chapter. For the law of England so industriously endeavors to investigate truth at any rate, that it will not confine itself to one or to a few manners of trial, but varies its examination of facts according to the nature of the facts themselves, this being the one invariable principle pursued, that as well as the best method of trial, as the best evidence upon that trial, which the nature of the case affords, and no other shall be admitted in the English courts of justice. The species of trials in civil cases are seven, by record, by inspection or examination, by certificate, by witness, by wager of battle, by wager of law, and by jury. 1. First, then, of trial by record. This is only used in one particular instance, and that is where a matter of record is pleaded in any action as a fine, a judgment, or the like and the opposite party pleads null teal record that there is no such matter of record existing. Upon this, issue is tendered and joined in the following form, and this he prays may be inquired of by the record, and the other doth the like, and hereupon the party pleading the record has a day given him to bring it in, and proclamation is made in court for him to bring forth his record, or he shall be condemned, and upon his failure his antagonist shall have judgment to recover. The trial, therefore, of this issue is merely by the record, for, as Sir Edward Coke observes, a record or enrollment is a monument of so high a nature, and importeth in itself such absolute verity, that if it be pleaded that there is no such record, it shall not receive any trial by witness, jury, or otherwise, but only by itself. Thus titles of nobility, as whether earl or no earl, baron or no baron, shall be tried by the king's writ or patent only, which is matter of record. Also, in cases of an alien, whether an alien friend or enemy, shall be tried by the league or treaty between his sovereign and ours, for every league or treaty is of record. And also, whether a manor be held in ancient demean or not, shall be tried by the record of Domesday in the King's Exchequer. 2. Trial by inspection or examination is when for the greater expedition of a cause in some point or issue being either the principal question or arising collaterally out of it, but being evidently the object of sense, the judges of the court, upon the testimony of their own senses, shall decide the point in dispute. For where the affirmative or negative of a question is a matter of such obvious determination, it is not thought necessary to summon a jury to decide it, who are properly called in to inform the conscience of the court in respect of dubious facts. And therefore, when the fact from its nature must be evident to the court, either from ocular demonstration or other irrefragable proof, there the law departs from its usual resort, the verdict of twelve men, and relies on the judgment of the court alone. As in the case of a suit to reverse a fine for non-age of the cognizer, or to set aside a statute of recognizance entered into by an infant, here and in other cases of the like sort, a writ shall issue to the sheriff, commanding him that he constrain the said party to appear, that it may be ascertained by the view of his body by the king's justices whether he be of full age or not. Ut per aspectum corpora sui constere poterit justiciaris nostris.
si praedictus e sit plene aetatis, necne. If, however, the court has, upon inspection, any doubt of the age of the party, as may frequently be the case, it may proceed to take proofs of the fact, and particularly he may examine the infant himself upon an oath of voir dire veritatum dicere, that is, to make true answer to such questions as the court shall demand of him, or the court may examine his mother, his godfather, or the like. In like manner, if a defendant pleads in abatement of the suit that the plaintiff is dead, and one appears and calls himself the plaintiff, which the defendant denies, in this case the judges shall determine by inspection and examination whether he be the plaintiff or not. Also, if a man be found by a jury an idiot a navitate, he may come in person into the chancery before the chancellor, or be brought there by his friends to be inspected and examined whether idiot or not. And if, upon such view and inquiry, it appears he is not so, the verdict of the jury and all the proceedings thereon are utterly void and instantly of no effect. Another instance in which the trial by inspection may be used is when, upon an appeal of mayhem, the issue joined is whether it be mayhem or no mayhem, this shall be decided by the court upon inspection for which purpose they may call in the assistance of surgeons. And by analogy to this, in an action of trespass for mayhem, the court, upon view of such mayhem as the plaintiff has laid in his declaration, or which is certified by the judges who tried the cause to be the same as was given in evidence to the jury, may increase the damages at their own discretion as may also be the case upon view of an atrocious battery. But then the battery must likewise be alleged so certainly in the declaration that it may appear to be the same with the battery inspected. Also, to ascertain any circumstances relative to a particular day past, it hath been tried by an inspection of the almanac by the court. Thus, upon a writ of error from an inferior court, that of Lynn, the error assigned was that the judgment was given on a Sunday, it appearing to be on 26 February, 26 Elizabeth, and that upon inspection of the almanac of that year, it was found that the 26th of February in that year actually fell upon a Sunday. This was held to be a sufficient trial, and that a trial by a jury was not necessary, although it was an error in fact, and so the judgment was reversed. But in all these cases, the judges, if they conceive a doubt, may order it to be tried by jury. End of chapter 22, part 1. Chapter 22, part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Several Species of Trial, Part 2. 3. The trial by certificate is allowed in such cases where the evidence of the person certifying is the only proper criterion of the point in dispute. For when the fact in question lies out of the cognizance of the court, the judges must rely on the solemn averment or information of persons in such a station as affords them the most clear and competent knowledge of the truth. As therefore such evidence, if given to a jury, must have been conclusive, the law, to save trouble and circuity, permits the fact to be determined upon such certificate merely. Thus, 1. If the issue be whether A was absent with the king in his army out of the realm in time of war, this shall be tried by the certificate of the marshal of the king's host in writing under his seal, which shall be sent to the justices. 2. If, in order to avoid outlawry or the like, it was alleged that the defendant was in prison, ultramare, at Bordeaux, or in service of the mayor of Bordeaux, this should have been tried by the certificate of the mayor, 
and the like of the captain of Calais. But when this was law, those towns were under the dominion of the crown of England, and therefore, by a parity of reason, it should now hold that in similar cases arising at Jamaica or Menorca, the trial should be by certificate from the governor of those islands. We also find that the certificate of the Queen's messenger sent to summon home a peeress of the realm was formerly held a sufficient trial of the contempt in refusing to obey such summons. 3. For matters within the realm, the customs of the City of London shall be tried by the certificate of the mayor and aldermen, certified by the mouth of their recorder, upon a surmise from the party alleging it, that the custom ought to be thus tried, else it must be tried by the country. As the custom of distributing the effects of freemen deceased, of enrolling apprentices, or that he who is free of one trade may use another, if any of these or other similar points come in issue. But this rule admits of an exception where the Corporation of London is a party or interested in the suit, as in an action brought for a penalty inflicted by the custom, for there the reason of law will not endure so partial a trial but this custom shall be determined by a jury and not by the mayor and aldermen, certifying by the mouth of their recorder. 4. In some cases the Sheriff of London's certificate shall be the final trial, as if the issue be whether the defendant is a citizen of London or a foreigner, in case of privilege pleaded to be sued only in the city courts of a nature somewhat similar to which is the trial of the privilege of the university when the chancellor claims cognizance of the cause because one of the parties is a privileged person. In this case, the charters, confirmed by act of parliament, direct the trial of the question whether a privileged person or no to be determined by the certificate and notification of the chancellor under seal to which it hath also been usual to add an affidavit of the fact. But if the parties be at issue between themselves, whether A is a member of the university or no, on a plea of privilege, the trial shall be then by jury, and not by the chancellor's certificate. Because the charters direct only that the privilege be allowed on the chancellor's certificate when the claim of cognizance is made by him, and not where the defendant himself pleads his privilege, so that this must be left to the ordinary course of determination. 5. In matters of ecclesiastical jurisdiction, as marriage, and of course general bastardy, and also excommunication, and orders, these and other like matters shall be tried by the bishop's certificate, as if it be pleaded in abatement that the plaintiff is excommunicated and issue is joined thereon, or if a man claims an estate by descent and the tenant alleges the demandant to be a bastard, or if on a writ of dower the heir pleads no marriage, or if the issue in a quare impedit be whether or no the church be full by institution. All these being matters of mere ecclesiastical cognizance shall be tried by certificate from the ordinary. But in an action on the case for calling a man bastard, the defendant having pleaded in justification that the plaintiff was really so, this was directed to be tried by a jury, because whether the plaintiff be found either a general or special bastard, the justification will be good, and no question of special bastardy shall be tried by the bishop's certificate, but by a jury. For a special bastard is one born before marriage of parents who afterwards intermarry, which is bastardy by our law, but not by the ecclesiastical. It would therefore be improper to refer the trial of that question to the bishop who, whether the child be born before or after the marriage, will be sure to return or certify him legitimate. Ability of a clerk presented, admission, institution, and deprivation of a clerk, shall also be tried by certificate from the ordinary or metropolitan, because of these he is the most competent judge. But induction shall be tried by a jury, because it is a matter of public notoriety, and is likewise the corporal investiture of the temporal profits.
Resignation of a benefice may be tried in either way, but it seems most properly to fall within the bishop's cognizance. 6. The trial of all customs and practice of the courts shall be by certificate from the proper officers of those courts respectively, and what return was made on a writ by the sheriff or under-sheriff shall be only tried by his own certificate. And thus much for those special issues or matters of fact which are proper to be tried by certificate. 4. A fourth species of trial is that by witnesses, per testes, without the intervention of a jury. This is the only method of trial known to the civil law in which the judge is left to form in his own breast his sentence upon the credit of the witnesses examined. But it is very rarely used in our law which prefers the trial by jury before it in almost every instance. Save only that when a widow brings a writ of dower and the tenant pleads that the husband is not dead, this, being looked upon as a dilatory plea, is, in favor of the widow and for a greater expedition, allowed to be tried by witnesses examined before the judges, and so, saith Finch, shall no other case in our law. But Sir Edward Coke mentions some others, as, to try whether the tenant in a real action was duly summoned, or the validity of a challenge to a juror, so that Finch's observation must be confined to the trial of direct and not collateral issues, and in every case Sir Edward Coke lays it down that the affirmative must be proved by two witnesses at the least. 5. The next species of trial is of great antiquity, but much disused, though still in force if the parties choose to abide by it. I mean the trial by wager of battle. This seems to have owed its original to the military spirit of our ancestors, joined to a superstitious frame of mind, it being in the nature of an appeal to providence, under an apprehension and hope, however presumptuous and unwarrantable, that heaven would give the victory to him who had the right. The decision of suits by this appeal to the god of battles is by some said to have been invented by the Burgundy, one of the northern or German clans that planted themselves in Gaul. And it is true that the first written injunction of judiciary combats that we meet with is in the laws of Gundebald, A.D. 501, which are preserved in the Burgundian Code. Yet it does not seem to have been merely a local custom of this or that particular tribe, but to have been the common usage of all those warlike people from the earliest times. And it may also seem from a passage in Velius Paterculus that the Germans, when first they became known to the Romans, were wont to decide all contests by right of the sword. For when Quintilius Varus endeavored to introduce among them the Roman laws and method of trial, it was looked upon, says the historian, as a novitas incognite disciplinea, ut solita armis de cerni, iuri terminurentur. And among the ancient Goths in Sweden, we find the practice of judiciary duels established upon much the same footing as they formerly were in our own country. This trial was introduced into England among other Norman customs by William the Conqueror, but was only used in three cases, one military, one criminal, and the third civil. The first in the court-martial, or court of chivalry and honor. The second in appeals of felony, of which we shall speak in the next book. And third, upon issue joined in a writ of right, the last and most solemn decision of real property. For in writs of right, the jus proprietatis, which is frequently a matter of difficulty, is in question. But other real actions being merely questions of jus possessionis, which are usually more plain and obvious, our ancestors did not in them appeal to the decision of providence. Another pretext for allowing it, upon these final writs of right, was also for the sake of such claimants as might have the true right, but yet by the death of witnesses or other defect of evidence, be unable to prove it to a jury. But the most curious reason of all is given in the mirror, 
that it is allowable upon warrant of the combat between David for the people of Israel of the one party and Goliath for the Philistines of the other party, a reason which Pope Nicholas I very seriously decides to be inconclusive. Of battle, therefore, on a writ of right we are now to speak, and although the writ of right itself, and of course this trial thereof, be at present disused, yet, as it is the law at this day, it may be a matter of curiosity at least to inquire into the forms of this proceeding as we may gather them from the ancient authors. The last trial by battle that was joined in a civil suit though there was afterwards one in the court of chivalry in the reign of Charles I, and another tendered but not joined in a writ of right upon the northern circuit in 1638, was in the thirteenth year of Queen Elizabeth, as reported by Sir James Dyer, and held in the Tothill Fields, Westminster, non signe magna juris consultorum perturbationi, saith Sir Henry Spellman, who was himself a witness of the ceremony. The form, as appears from the authors before cited, is as follows. When the tenant in a writ of right pleads the general issue, viz., that he hath more right to hold than the demandant hath to recover, and offers to prove it by the body of his champion, which tender is accepted by the demandant, the tenant in the first place must produce his champion, who, by throwing down his glove as a gage or pledge, thus wages or stipulates battle with the champion of the demandant, who, by taking up the gage or glove, stipulates on his part to accept the challenge. The reason why it is waged by champions and not the parties themselves in civil actions is because, if any party to the suit dies, the suit must abate and be at an end for the present, and therefore no judgment could be given for the lands in question if either of the parties were slain in battle, and also that no person might claim an exemption from this trial as was allowed in criminal cases where the battle was waged in person. A piece of ground is then in due time set out of sixty feet square enclosed with lifts and on one side a court erected for the judges of the court of common pleas who attend there in their scarlet robes and also a bar is prepared for the learned sergeants at law when the court sits which ought to be by sunrising proclamation is made for the parties and their champions who are introduced by two knights and are dressed in a suit of armor with red sandals bare-legged from the knee downwards, bare-headed, and with bare arms to the elbows. The weapons allowed them are only batons, or staves, of an L long and a four-cornered leather target, so that death very seldom ensued the civil combat. In the court of military, indeed, they fought with sword and lance, according to Spellman and Rushworth, as likewise in France, only villains fought with the buckler and baton, gentlemen armed at all points. And upon this and other circumstances, the President Montesquieu hath with great ingenuity not only deduced the impious custom of private duels upon imaginary points of honor, but hath also traced the historic madness of knight errantry from the same original of judicial combats. But to proceed... When the champions thus armed with batons arrive within the lifts or place of combat, the champion of the tenant then takes his adversary by the hand and makes an oath that the tenements in dispute are not the right of the demandant, and the champion of the demandant, then taking the other by the hand, swears in the same manner that they are, so that each champion is, or ought to be, thoroughly persuaded of the truth of the cause he fights for. Next, an oath against sorcery and enchantment is to be taken by both the champions in this or a similar form. Hear this, ye justices, that I have this day neither ate, drank, nor have upon me neither bone, stone, nor grass, nor any enchantment, sorcery, or witchcraft whereby the law of God may be abated or the law of the devil exalted. So help me God and his saints. 
The battle is thus begun, and the combatants are bound to fight till the stars appear in the evening, and if the champion of the tenant can defend himself till the stars appear, the tenant shall prevail in his cause, for it is sufficient for him to maintain his ground and make it a drawn battle, he being already in possession. But if victory declares itself for either party, for him is judgment finally given. This victory may arise from the death of either of the champions, which indeed hath rarely happened, the whole ceremony, to say the truth, bearing a near resemblance to certain rural athletic diversions which are probably derived from this original. Or victory is obtained if either champion proves recreant, that is, yields and pronounces the horrible word of craven, a word of disgrace and obloquy, rather than any determinate meaning. But a horrible word it indeed is to the vanquished champion, since, as a punishment to him for forfeiting the land of his principal by pronouncing that shameful word, he is condemned as a requiant, amatire liberum legem, that is, to become infamous and not accounted liber et legalis homo, being supposed by the event to be proved forsworn, and therefore never to be put upon a jury or admitted as a witness in any cause. This is the form of a trial by battle, a trial which the tenant or defendant in a writ of right has it in his election at this day to demand, and which was the only decision of such writ of right after the conquest till Henry II, by consent of Parliament, introduced the Grand Assize, a particular species of trial by jury, in concurrence therewith, giving the tenant his choice of either one or the other. Which example of discountenancing these judicial combats was imitated about a century afterwards in France by an edict of Louis the Pious, A.D. 1260, and soon after by the rest of Europe? The establishment of this alternative, Glanville, Chief Justice to Henry II, and probably his adviser herein, considers as a most noble improvement, as in fact it was, of the law. End of chapter 22, part 2of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Several Species of Trial, Part 3. 6. A sixth species of trial is by wager of law vadiatio legis, as the foregoing is called wager of battle, vadiatio dueli, because, as in the former case, the defendant gave a pledge, gauge, or vadium to try the case by battle, so here he was to put in sureties, or vadios, that such a day he will make his law, that is, take the benefit which the law has allowed him. For our ancestors considered that there were many cases where an innocent man of good credit might be overborne by a multitude of false witnesses, and therefore established this species of trial by the oath of the defendant himself. For if he will absolutely swear himself not chargeable, and appears to be a person of reputation, he shall go free and forever acquitted of the debt or other cause of action. This method of trial is not only to be found in the codes of almost all the northern nations that broke in upon the Roman Empire and established petty kingdoms upon its ruins, but its original may also be traced as far back as the Mosaical Law. If a man deliver unto his neighbor an ass, or an ox, or a sheep, or any beast to keep, and it die, or be hurt, or driven away, no man seeing it, then shall an oath of the Lord between them both, that he hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. 
we shall likewise be able to discern a manifest resemblance between this species of trial and the canonical purgation of the popish clergy when accused of any capital crime. The defendant or person accused was in both cases to make oath of his own innocence and to produce a certain number of compurgators who swore they believed his oath. Somewhat similar also to this is the sacramentum decisionis, or voluntary and decisive oath of the civil law, where one of the parties to the suit, not being able to prove his charge, offers to refer the decision of the cause to the oath of his adversary, which the adversary was bound to accept or tender the same proposal back again, otherwise the whole was taken as confessed by him. But though a custom somewhat similar to this prevailed formerly in the city of London, yet in general the English law does not thus, like the civil, reduce the defendant, in case he is in the wrong, to the dilemmas of either confession or perjury, but it is indeed so tender of permitting the oath to be taken, even upon the defendant's own request, that it allows only in a very few cases, and in those it has also devised other collateral remedies for the party injured, in which the defendant is excluded from his wager of law. The manner of waging and making law is this. He that has waged or given security to make his law brings with him into court eleven of his neighbors, a custom which we find particularly described so early as in the league between Alfred and Guthrin the Dane, for by the old Saxon constitution every man's credit in courts of law depended upon the opinion which his neighbors had of his veracity. The defendant then, standing at the end of the bar, is admonished by the judges of the nature and danger of a false oath, and if he still persists, he is to repeat this or the like oath. Hear this, ye justices, that I do not owe unto Richard Jones the sum of ten pounds, nor any penny thereof, in manner and form, as the said Richard hath declared against me, so help me God. And thereupon his eleven neighbors or compurgators shall avow upon their oaths that they believe in their consciences that he saith the truth, so that himself must be sworn de fidelitate and the eleven de credulitate. It is held indeed by later authorities that fewer than eleven compurgators will do, but Sir Edward Coke is positive that there must be this number and his opinion not only seems founded on better authority, but also upon better reason. For as wager of law is equivalent to a verdict in the defendant's favor, it ought to be established by the same or equal testimony, namely by the oath of twelve men. And so indeed Glanville expresses it, Jurabit duodecima manu, and in 9 Henry the Third. When a defendant in an action of debt waged his law, it was adjudged by the court, quod defendat se duodecima manu. Thus, too, in an author of the age of Edward I, we read, Adjudicatibor reos ad legem suum duodecima manu. And the ancient treaties, entitled Diversite des Courts, expressly confirm Sir Edward Coke's opinion. It must be, however, observed that so long as the custom continued of producing the secta, the suit, or witnesses to give probability to the plaintiff's demand, of which we spoke in a former chapter, the defendant was not put to wage his law unless the secta was first produced and their testimony was found consistent. To this purpose speaks Magna Carta, C. 28. Nullus palibus de caetero punat aliquum ad legem manifestum, that is, wager of battle, nec ad jurimentum, that is, wager of law, simplici loque la sua, that is, merely by his count or declaration, sine testibus fidelibus ad hoc inductus, which Fleta thus explains, si petent sectem prodixerit, et concords inveniantor, tunc reus poterit vadiare legem suam contra petentum et contra sectum suam prolatum, sed si secta variabilis inveniantor, 
extunct non tenebitor legem variare contra sectum ilium. It is true indeed that Fleta expressly limits the number of compurgators to be only double that of the secta produced. Ut si duas vel tres testis prodexerit ad probandum, oportet quod defensio fiat per quator vel per sex. Ita quod pro quo liba teste duas producat juratores, usque ad duo decim. So that according to this doctrine, the eleven compurgators were only to be produced, but not all of them sworn, unless the secta consisted of six. But, though this might possibly be the rule, till the production of the secta was generally disused, since that time, the dua decima manus seems to have been generally required. In the old Swedish or Gothic constitution, wager of law was not only permitted, as it still is in criminal cases, unless the fact be extremely clear against the prisoner, but was also absolutely required in many civil cases, which an author of their own very justly charges as being the source of frequent perjury. This, he tells us, was owing to the popish ecclesiastics who introduced this method of purgation from their canon law, and, having sown a plentiful crop of oaths in all judicial proceedings, reaped afterwards an ample harvest of perjuries, for perjuries were punished in part by pecuniary fines payable to the coffers of the church. But with us in England, wager of law is never required, and is then only admitted where an action is brought upon such matters as may be supposed to be privately transacted between the parties, and wherein the defendant may be presumed to have made satisfaction without being able to prove it. Therefore, it is only in actions of debt upon simple contract, or for an immersement in actions of debt new and of account, where the debt may have been paid, the goods restored, or the account balanced, without any evidence of either. It is only in these actions, I say, that the defendant is admitted to wage his law, so that the wager of law lieth not where there is any specialty as a bond or deed to charge the defendant, for that would be cancelled if satisfied, but when the debt groweth by word only. Nor doth it lie in an action of debt for arrears of an account settled by auditors in a former action. And by such wager of law, when admitted, the plaintiff is perpetually barred, for the law in the simplicity of the ancient times presumed that no one would forswear himself for any worldly thing. Wager of law, however, lieth in a real action where the tenant alleges he was not legally summoned to appear, as well as in mere personal contracts. A man outlawed, attainted for false verdict, or for conspiracy or perjury, or otherwise become infamous, as by pronouncing the horrible word in a trial by battle, shall not be permitted to wage his law. Neither shall an infant under the age of twenty-one, for he cannot be admitted to his oath, and therefore, on the other hand, the course of justice shall flow equally, and the defendant, where an infant is plaintiff, shall not wage his law. But a femme covert, when joined with her husband, may be admitted to wage her law, and an alien shall do it in his own language. It is moreover a rule, that where a man is compellable by law to do anything whereby he becomes creditor to another, the defendant in that case shall not be admitted to wage his law. For then it would be in the power of any bad man to run in debt first against the inclinations of his creditor, and afterwards to swear it away. But where the plaintiff hath given voluntary credit to the defendant, there he may wage his law. For by giving him such credit, the plaintiff has himself borne testimony that he is one whose character may be trusted. Upon this principle it is, that in an action of debt against a prisoner by a jailer for his victuals, the defendant shall not wage his law. For the jailer cannot refuse the prisoner, and ought not to suffer him to perish for want of sustenance. But otherwise it is for the board or diet of a man at liberty. In an action of debt brought by an attorney for his fees, the defendant cannot wage his law, 
because the plaintiff is compellable to be his attorney. And so, if a servant be retained according to the statute of laborers, 5 Elizabeth C. 4, which obliges all single persons of a certain age and not having other visible means of livelihood to go out to service in an action of debt for the wages of such a servant, the master shall not wage his law, because the plaintiff was compellable to serve. But it had been otherwise, had the hiring been by special contract and not according to the statute. In no case where contempt, trespass, deceit, or any injury with force is alleged against the defendant is he permitted to wage his law. For it is impossible to presume he has satisfied the plaintiff his demand in such cases where damages are uncertain and left to be assessed by a jury. Nor will the law trust the defendant with an oath to discharge himself where the private injury is coupled, as it were, with a public crime, that of force and violence, which would be equivalent to the purgation oath of the civil law, which ours has so justly rejected. Executors and administrators, when charged for the debt of the deceased, shall not be admitted to wage their law, for no man can, with a safe conscience, wage law of another man's contract, that is, swear that he never entered into it, or at least that he privately discharged it. The king also has his prerogative, for, as all wager of law imports a reflection on the plaintiff for dishonesty, therefore there shall be no such wager on actions brought by him. And this prerogative extends and is communicated to his debtor and accomptant. For on a writ of quo minus in the exchequer for a debt on simple contract, the defendant is not allowed to wage his law. Thus, the wager of law was never permitted, but where the defendant bore a fair and unreproachable character, and it also was confined to such cases where a debt might be supposed to be discharged or satisfaction made in private without any witnesses to attest it, and many other prudential restrictions accompanied this indulgence. But at length it was considered that, even under all its restrictions, it threw too great a temptation in the way of indigent or profligate men, and therefore, by degrees, new remedies were devised and new forms of action were introduced wherein no defendant is at liberty to wage his law. So that now no plaintiff need at all apprehend any danger from the hardiness of his debtor's conscience unless he voluntarily chooses to rely on his adversary's veracity by bringing an obsolete instead of a modern action. Therefore, one shall hardly hear at present of an action of debt brought upon a simple contract, that being supplied by an action of trespass on the case for the breach of a promise or a sumsit wherein the specific debt cannot be recovered, yet damages may, equivalent to the specific debt. And, this being an action of trespass, no law can be waged therein. So instead of an action of detinue to recover the very thing detained, an action of trespass on the case in trover and conversion is usually brought, wherein, though the horse or other specific chattel cannot be had, yet the defendant shall pay damages for the conversion equal to the value of the chattel, and for this trespass also no wager of law is allowed. In the room of actions of account a bill in equity is usually filed, wherein, though the defendant answers upon his oath, yet such oath is not conclusive to the plaintiff, but he may prove every article by other evidence in contradiction to what the defendant has sworn. So that wager of law is quite out of use, being avoided by the mode of bringing the action, but still it is not out of force. And therefore, when a new statute inflicts a penalty and gives an action of debt for recovering it, it is usual to add, in which no wager of law shall be allowed, otherwise an hardy delinquent might escape any penalty of the law by swearing he had never incurred or else had discharged it. These six species of trials that we have considered in the present chapter are only had in certain special and eccentrical cases, where the trial by the country, per pious, or by jury, 
would not be so proper or effectual. In the next chapter, we shall consider at large the nature of that principal criterion of truth in the law of England. End of chapter 22, part 3. Chapter 23, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of The Trial by Jury, Part 1. The subject of our next inquiries will be the nature and method of the trial by jury, called also the trial per pious or by the country, a trial that hath been used time out of mind in this nation, and seems to have been co avowed with the first civil government thereof. Some authors have endeavored to trace the original of juries up as high as the Britons themselves, the first inhabitants of our island but certain it is that they were in use among the earliest Saxon colonies, their institution being ascribed by Bishop Nicholson to Wooden himself, their great legislator and captain. Hence it is that we may find traces of juries in the laws of all those nations which adopted the feudal system, as in Germany, France, and Italy, who had all of them a tribunal composed of twelve good men and true, boni homines, usually the vassals or tenants of the Lord being the equals or peers of the party's litigant. And, as the Lord's vassals judged each other in the Lord's courts, so the king's vassals, or the Lord's themselves, judged each other in the king's court. In England, we find the actual mention of them so early as the laws of King Ethelred, and that not as a new invention. Steinhook ascribes the invention of the jury, which in the Teutonic languages is denominated Nemda, to Regner, king of Sweden and Denmark, who was co-temporary with our king Egbert. Just as we are apt to impute the invention of this and some other pieces of juridical polity to the superior genius of Alfred the Great, to whom, on account of his having done so much, it is usual to attribute everything. And as the tradition of ancient Greece placed to the account of their one Hercules whatever achievement was performed superior to the ordinary prowess of mankind. Whereas the truth seems to be that this tribunal was universally established among all the northern nations, and so interwoven in their very constitution that the earliest accounts of the one give us also some traces of the other. Its establishment, however, and use in this island, of what date soever it be, though for a time greatly impaired and shaken by the introduction of the Norman trial by battle, was always so highly esteemed and valued by the people that no conquest, no change of government, could ever prevail to abolish it. In Magna Carta it is more than once insisted on as the principal bulwark of our liberties, but especially by chapter 29, that no freeman shall be hurt in either his person or property, nisi per legale judicium parium suarum vel per legem terre, a privilege which is couched in almost the same words with that of the Emperor Conrad two hundred years before. Nemo beneficium suum perdat, nisi secundum consuetudinem antecessorum nostrorum et per judicium parium suorum. And it was ever esteemed in all countries a privilege of the highest and most beneficial nature. But I will not misspend the reader's time in fruitless encomiums on this method of trial, but shall proceed to the dissection and examination of it in all its parts from whence indeed its highest encomium will arise, since the more it is searched into and understood, the more it is sure to be valued. And this is a species of knowledge most absolutely necessary for every gentleman in the kingdom, as well because he may be frequently called upon to determine in this capacity the rights of others, his fellow subjects, as because his own property, 
his liberty, and his life depend upon maintaining in its legal force the constitutional trial by jury. Trials by jury in civil causes are of two kinds, extraordinary and ordinary. The extraordinary I shall only briefly hint at, and confine the main of my observations to that which is more usual and ordinary. The first species of extraordinary trial by jury is that of grand assize, which was instituted by King Henry II in Parliament, as was mentioned in the preceding chapter, by way of alternative offered to the choice of the tenant or defendant in a writ of right, instead of the barbarous and unchristian custom of dueling. For this purpose, a writ de magna assisa elegenda is directed to the sheriff to return four knights who are to elect and choose twelve others to be joined with them in the manner mentioned by Glanville, who, having probably advised the measure itself, is more than usually copious in describing it, and these, all together, form the grand assize or great jury, which is to try the matter of right and must consist of sixteen jurors. Another species of extraordinary juries is the jury to try and attaint, which is a process commenced against the former jury for bringing in a false verdict, of which we shall speak more largely in a subsequent chapter. At present, I shall only observe that this jury is to consist of twenty-four of the best men in the county, who are called the grand jury in the attaint, to distinguish them from their first or petite jury, and these are to hear and try the goodness of the former verdict. With regard to the ordinary trial by jury in civil cases, I shall pursue the same method in considering it that I set out with in explaining the nature of prosecuting actions in general, viz., by following the order and course of the proceedings themselves as the most clear and perspicuous way of treating it. When, therefore, an issue is joined by these words, and this the said A praise may be inquired of by the country, or, and of this he puts himself upon the country, and the said B does the like, the court awards a writ of venere facius upon the roll or record, commanding the sheriff that he caused to come here on such a day twelve free and lawful men, liberos et legales homines, of the body of his county, by whom the truth of the matter may be better known, and who are neither of kin to the aforesaid A, nor the aforesaid B, to recognize the truth of the issue between the said parties, and such writ is accordingly issued to the sheriff. Thus the cause stands ready for a trial at the bar of the court itself. For all trials were there anciently had in actions which were there first commenced, which never happened but in matters of weight and consequence, all trifling suits being ended in the court baron, hundred, or county courts, and all causes of great importance or difficulty are still usually retained upon motion to be tried at the bar in the superior courts. But when the usage began to bring actions of any trifling value in the courts of Westminster Hall, it was found to be an intolerable burthen to compel the parties, witnesses, and jurors to come from Westmoreland, perhaps, or Cornwell, to try an action of assault at Westminster. Therefore, the legislature took into consideration that the king's justices came usually twice in the year into the several counties ad capiendas assisas to take or try writs of assize of morte and chester, novel decision, nuisance, and the like. The form of which writs we may remember was stated to be that they commanded the sheriff to summon an assize or jury, and to go view the land in question, and then to have said jury ready at the next coming of the justices of assize, together with the parties, to recognize and determine the decision or the other injury complained of. As, therefore, these judges were ready in the country to administer justice in real actions of assize, the legislature thought proper to refer other matters in issue to be also determined before them, whether of a mixed or personal kind. And, therefore, it was enacted by Statute Westminster 2, 
13 Edward I, C30, that a clause of Nisi Prius should be inserted in all the aforesaid writs of Venere Facius, that is, that the sheriff should cause the jurors to come to Westminster, or wherever the king's courts should be held, on such a day in Easter and Michaelmas terms, Nisi Prius, unless before that day the judges assigned to take the assizes shall come into his said county, by virtue of which the sheriff returned his jurors to the court of the justices of assize, which was sure to be held in the vacation before Easter and Michaelmas terms, and there the trial was had. An inconvenience attended this remedy, principally because, as the sheriff made no return of the jury to the court at Westminster, the parties were ignorant who they were till they came upon the trial, and therefore were not ready with their challenges or exceptions. For this reason, by the statute 42 Edward III C. 11, the method of trials by Nisi Prius was altered, and it was enacted that no inquests, except of a seize and jail delivery, should be taken by writ of Nisi Prius till after the sheriff had returned the names of the jurors to the court above, so that now the clause of Nisi Prius is left out of the writ of Venere Facius, which is the sheriff's warrant to warn the jury, and is inserted in another part of the proceedings, as we shall see presently. For now the course is to make the sheriff's venere returnable on the last return of the same term wherein issue is joined, viz. Hillary or Trinity terms, which from making up of the issues therein are usually called issuable terms. And he returns the names of the jurors in a panel, a little pane or oblong piece of parchment annexed to the writ. This jury is not summoned, and therefore if not appearing at the day, must unavoidably make default. For which reason, a compulsive process is now awarded against the jurors, called in the common pleas a writ of habeas corpora juratorum, and in the king's bench a distringus, commanding the sheriff to have their bodies, or to distrain them by their lands and goods, that they may appear upon the day appointed. The entry, therefore, on the roll or record is that the jury is respited through defect of the jurors till the first day of the next term, then to appear at Westminster, unless before that time, viz., on Wednesday the 4th of March, the justices of our Lord the King, appointed to take assizes in that county, shall have come to Oxford, that is, to the place assigned for holding assizes. Therefore, the sheriff is commanded to have their bodies at Westminster on the said first day of next term, or before the said justices of assize, if before that time they come to Oxford, viz. on the 4th of March aforesaid. And as the judges are sure to come and open the circuit commissions on the day mentioned in the writ, the sheriff returns and summons this jury to appear at the assizes, and there the trial is had before the justices of Assize and Nisi Prius, among whom, as hath been said, are usually two of the judges of the courts at Westminster, the whole kingdom being divided into six circuits for this purpose. And thus we may observe that the trial of common issues at Nisi Prius was in its original only a collateral, incident to the original business of the justices of Assize, though now, by the various revolutions of practice, it has become their principal employment, hardly anything remaining in use of the real Assizes but the name. If the sheriff be not an indifferent person, as, if he be a party in the suit, or be related by either blood or affinity to either of the parties, he is not then trusted to return the jury, but the venire shall be directed to the coroners, who, in this, as in many other instances, are the substitutes of the sheriff to execute process when he is deemed an improper person. If any exception lies to the coroners, the venire shall be directed to two clerks of the court, or two persons of the county named by the court, and sworn. These two, who are called elizers or electors, 
shall indifferently name the jury, and their return is final. Let us now pause a while and observe, with Sir Matthew Hale, in these first preparatory stages of the trial, how admirably this Constitution is adapted and framed for the investigation of truth beyond any other method of trial in the world. For first, the person returning the jurors is a man of some fortune and consequence, that so he may not only be the less tempted to commit willful errors, but likewise be responsible for the faults of either himself or his officers, and he is also bound by the obligation of an oath faithfully to execute his duty. Next, as to the time of their return, the panel is returned to the court upon the original venire, and the jurors are to be summoned and brought in many weeks afterwards to the trial, whereby the parties may have notice of the jurors and of their sufficiency or insufficiency, characters, connections, and relations, so that they may be challenged upon just cause, while at the same time, by means of the compulsory process of distringus or habeas corpora, the cause is not like to be retarded through defect of jurors. Thirdly, as to the place of their appearance, which in causes of weight and consequence is at the bar of the court, but in ordinary cases at the assizes held in the county where the cause of action arises and the witnesses and jurors live, a provision most excellently calculated for the saving of expense to the parties. For though the preparation of the causes in point of pleading is transacted at Westminster, whereby the order and uniformity of proceeding is preserved throughout the kingdom and multiplicity of forms is presented, yet this is of no great charge or trouble, one attorney being able to transact the business of forty clients. But the troublesome and most expensive attendance is that of jurors and witnesses at the trial, which therefore is brought home to them in the country where most of them inhabit. Fourthly, the persons before whom they are to appear, and before whom the trial is to be held, are the judges of the superior court, if it be a trial at bar, or the judges of assize, delegated from the courts at Westminster by the king, if the trial be held in the country, persons whose learning and dignity secure their jurisdiction from contempt, and the novelty and very parade of whose appearance have no small influence upon the multitude. The very point of their being strangers in the county is of infinite service in preventing those factions and parties which would intrude in every cause of moment were it tried only before persons resident on the spot as justices of the peace and the like. And, the better to remove all suspicion of partiality, it was widely provided by the statutes 4 Edward III C2, 8 Richard II C2, and 33 Henry VIII C. 24, that no judge of assize should hold pleas in any county wherein he was born or inhabits. And, as this constitution prevents party and faction from intermingling in the trial of right, so it keeps both the rule and the administration of laws uniform. These justices, though thus varied and shifted at every assizes, are all sworn to the same laws, have had the same education, have pursued the same studies, converse and consult together, communicate their decisions and resolutions, and preside in those courts which are mutually connected and their judgments blended together, as they are interchangeably courts of appeal or advice to each other and hence their administration of justice and conduct of trials are consonant and uniform, whereby that confusion and contrariety are avoided which would naturally arise from a variety of uncommunicating judges or from any provincial establishment. But let us now return to the Assizes. When the general day of trials is fixed, the plaintiff or his attorney must bring down the record to the assizes and enter it with the proper officer in order to its being called on in course. If it not be so entered, it cannot be tried. Therefore, it is in the plaintiff's breast to delay any trial by not carrying down the record. 
unless the defendant, being fearful of such neglect in the plaintiff, and willing to discharge himself from the action, will himself undertake to bring on the trial, giving proper notice to the plaintiff. Which proceeding is called the trial by proviso, by reason of the clause then inserted in the sheriff's venere, viz. proviso, provided that if two writs come to your hands, that is, one from the plaintiff and another from the defendant, you shall execute only one of them. But this practice begins to be disused since the statute 14 George II C. 17, which enacts that if, after issue joined, the cause is not carried down to be tried according to the course of the court, the plaintiff shall be esteemed to be non-suited, and judgment shall be given for the defendant as in case of a non-suit. In case the plaintiff intends to try the cause, he is bound to give the defendant, if he lives within forty miles of London, eight days' notice of trial, and if he lives at a greater distance than fourteen days' notice, in order to prevent surprise. And if the plaintiff then changes his mind and does not countermand the notice six days before the trial, he shall be liable to pay costs to the defendant for not proceeding to trial by the same last-mentioned statute. The defendant, however, or plaintiff, may, upon good cause shown to the court above, as upon absence or sickness of a material witness, obtain leave upon motion to defer the trial of the cause till the next assizes. But we will now suppose all previous steps to be regularly settled and the cause to be called on in court. The record is then handed to the judge to peruse and observe the pleadings and what issues the parties are to maintain and prove while the jury is called and sworn. To this end, the sheriff returns his compulsive process, the writ of habeas corpora or distringus, with the panel of jurors annexed to the judge's officer in court. The jurors contained in the panel are either special or common jurors. Special juries were originally introduced in trials at bar when the causes were of too great nicety for the discussion of ordinary freeholders, or where the sheriff was suspected of partiality, though not upon such apparent cause as to warrant an exception to him. He is in such cases, upon motion in court and a rule granted thereupon, to attend the prothontory or other proper officers with his freeholder's book and the officer is to take indifferently forty-eight of the principal freeholders in the presence of the attorneys on both sides, who are each of them to strike off twelve, and the remaining twenty-four are returned upon the panel. By the statute three, George the second, C. twenty-five, either party is entitled upon motion to have a special jury struck upon the trial of any issue, as well as at the assizes at bar, he paying the extraordinary expense unless the judge will certify, in pursuance of the statute 24 George II C. 18, that the cause required such special jury. End of chapter 23, part 1.